Nero Claudius Caesar. I, two celebrated families, the Calvini and Eno Barbi, sprung from the race of the Domitii. The Eno Barbi derive both their extraction and their cognomen from one Lucius Domitius, of whom we have this tradition, as he was returning out of the country to Rome, he was met by two young men of a most august appearance. Who desired him to announce to the Senate and people a victory, of which no certain intelligence had yet reached the city. To prove that they were more than mortals, they stroked his cheeks, and thus changed his hair, which was black, to a bright color, resembling that of brass, which mark of distinction descended to his posterity, for they had generally red beards. This family had the honor of seven consulships 547, one triumph 548, and two censorships 549, and being admitted into the patrician order, they continued the use of the same cognomen, with no other prenomena 550 than those of Gnaeus and Lucius. These, however, they assumed with singular irregularity, three persons in succession sometimes adhering to one of them, and then they were changed alternately. For the first, second, and third of the Enobarbi had the prenomen of Lucius, and again the three following, successively, that of Gnaeus, while those who came after were called, by turns, one, Lucius, and the other, Gnaeus. It appears to me proper to give a short account of several of the family, to show that Nero so far degenerated from the noble qualities of his ancestors, that he retained only their vices. As if those alone had been transmitted to him by his descent. 2. To begin, therefore, at a remote period, his great-grandfather's grandfather, Gnaeus Domitius, when he was tribune of the people, being offended with the high priests for electing another than himself in the room of his father. Obtained the transfer of the right of election from the colleges of the priests to the people. In his consulship 551, having conquered the Allobroges and the Arverni 552, he made a progress through the province, mounted upon an elephant, with a body of soldiers attending him, in a sort of triumphal pomp. Of this person the orator Licinius Crassus said, it was no wonder he had a brazen beard, who had a face of iron, and a heart of lead. His son, during his praetorship 553, proposed that Gnaeus Caesar, upon the expiration of his consulship, should be called to account before the Senate for his administration of that office. Which was supposed to be contrary both to the omens and the laws. Afterwards, when he was consul himself 554, he tried to deprive Gnaeus of the command of the army, and having been, by intrigue and cabal, appointed his successor, he was made prisoner at Corsinium, in the beginning of the civil war. Being set at liberty, he went to Marseilles, which was then besieged, where having, by his presence, animated the people to hold out, he suddenly deserted them, and at last was slain in the battle of Pharsalia. He was a man of little constancy, and of a sullen temper. In despair of his fortunes, he had recourse to poison, but was so terrified at the thoughts of death, that, immediately repenting, he took a vomit to throw it up again, and gave freedom to his physician for having, with great prudence and wisdom, given him only a gentle dose of the poison. When Gnaeus Pompey was consulting with his friends in what manner he should conduct himself towards those who were neuter and took no part in the contest, he was the only one who proposed that they should be treated as enemies. 3. He left a son, who was, without doubt, the best of the family. By the Pedian law, he was condemned, although innocent, amongst others who were concerned in the death of Caesar 555. Upon this, he went over to Brutus and Cassius, his near relations. And, after their death, not only kept together the fleet, the command of which had been given him some time before, but even increased it. At last, when the party had everywhere been defeated, he voluntarily surrendered it to Mark Antony. Considering it as a piece of service for which the latter owed him no small obligations. Of all those who were condemned by the law above mentioned, he was the only man who was restored to his country, and filled the highest offices. When the civil war again broke out, he was appointed lieutenant under the same Antony, and offered the chief command by those who were ashamed of Cleopatra. But not daring, on account of a sudden indisposition with which he was seized, either to accept or refuse it, he went over to Augustus 556, and died a few days after, not without an aspersion cast upon his memory. For Antony gave out, that he was induced to change sides by his impatience to be with his mistress, 
Servilia Nias.557. 4. This Nias had a son, named Domitius, who was afterwards well known as the nominal purchaser of the family property left by Augustus's will 558. And no less famous in his youth for his dexterity in chariot driving, than he was afterwards for the triumphal ornaments which he obtained in the German war. But he was a man of great arrogance, prodigality, and cruelty. When he was aedile, he obliged Lucius Plancus, the censor, to give him the way, and in his praetorship, and consulship, he made Roman knights and married women act on the stage. He gave hunts of wild beasts, both in the circus and in all the wards of the city, as also a show of gladiators, but with such barbarity, that Augustus, after privately reprimanding him, to no purpose, was obliged to restrain him by a public edict. V. By the elder Antonia he had Nero's father, a man of execrable character in every part of his life. During his attendance upon Caius Caesar in the east, he killed a freedman of his own, for refusing to drink as much as he ordered him. Being dismissed for this from Caesar's society, he did not mend his habits, for, in a village upon the Appian Road, he suddenly whipped his horses, and drove his chariot, on purpose, over a poor boy, crushing him to pieces. At Rome, he struck out the eye of a Roman knight in the Forum, only for some free language in a dispute between them. He was likewise so fraudulent, that he not only cheated some silversmiths 559 of the price of goods he had bought of them, but, during his praetorship, defrauded the owners of chariots in the Circentian games of the prizes due to them for their victory. His sister, jeering him for the complaints made by the leaders of the several parties, he agreed to sanction a law, that, for the future, the prizes should be immediately paid. A little before the death of Tiberius, he was prosecuted for treason, adulteries, and incest with his sister Lepida, but escaped in a timely change of affairs, and died of a dropsy, at Pergi 560. Leaving behind him his son, Nero, whom he had by Agrippina, the daughter of Germanicus. 6. Nero was born at Antium, nine months after the death of Tiberius 561, upon the 18th of the Calends of January, December 15th, just as the sun rose, so that its beams touched him before they could well reach the earth. While many fearful conjectures, in respect to his future fortune, were formed by different persons, from the circumstances of his nativity, a saying of his father, Domitius, was regarded as an ill presage. Who told his friends who were congratulating him upon the occasion, that nothing but what was detestable, and pernicious to the public, could ever be produced of him and Agrippina. Another manifest prognostic of his future infelicity occurred upon his lustration day 562. For Caius Caesar being requested by his sister to give the child what name he thought proper, looking at his uncle, Claudius, who afterwards, when emperor, adopted Nero, he gave his, and this not seriously, but only in jest. Agrippina treating it with contempt, because Claudius at that time was a mere laughingstock at the palace. He lost his father when he was three years old, being left heir to a third part of his estate. Of which he never got possession, the whole being seized by his co-heir, Caius. His mother being soon after banished, he lived with his aunt Lepida, in a very necessitous condition, under the care of two tutors, a dancing master and a barber. After Claudius came to the empire, he not only recovered his father's estate, but was enriched with the additional inheritance of that of his stepfather, Crispus Pacinus. Upon his mother's recall from banishment, he was advanced to such favor, through Nero's powerful interest with the emperor, that it was reported, assassins were employed by Messalina, Claudius's wife, to strangle him, as Britannicus's rival. Whilst he was taking his noonday repose. In addition to the story, it was said that they were frightened by a serpent, which crept from under his cushion, and ran away. The tale was occasioned by finding on his couch, near the pillow, the skin of a snake, which, by his mother's order, he wore for some time upon his right arm, enclosed in a bracelet of gold. This amulet, at last, he laid aside, from aversion to her memory, but he sought for it again, in vain, in the time of his extremity. 7. When he was yet a mere boy, before he arrived at the age of puberty, during the celebration of the Circentian Games 563, he performed his part in the Trojan play with a degree of firmness which gained him great applause. 
In the eleventh year of his age, he was adopted by Claudius, and placed under the tuition of Aeneas Seneca 564, who had been made a senator. It is said, that Seneca dreamt the night after, that he was giving a lesson to Caius Caesar 565. Nero soon verified his dream, betraying the cruelty of his disposition in every way he could. For he attempted to persuade his father that his brother, Britannicus, was nothing but a changeling, because the latter had saluted him, notwithstanding his adoption, by the name of Eno Barbus, as usual. When his aunt, Lepida, was brought to trial, he appeared in court as a witness against her, to gratify his mother, who persecuted the accused. On his introduction into the forum, at the age of manhood, he gave a largest to the people and a donative to the soldiers, for the praetorian cohorts, he appointed a solemn procession under arms. And marched at the head of them with a shield in his hand. After which he went to return thanks to his father in the senate. Before Claudius, likewise, at the time he was consul, he made a speech for the Bolognese, in Latin, and for the Rhodians and people of Ilium, in Greek. He had the jurisdiction of prefect of the city, for the first time, during the Latin festival. During which the most celebrated advocates brought before him, not short and trifling causes, as is usual in that case, but trials of importance, notwithstanding they had instructions from Claudius himself to the contrary. Soon afterwards, he married Octavia, and exhibited the Circentian games, and hunting of wild beasts, in honor of Claudius. 8. He was seventeen years of age at the death of that prince 566, and as soon as that event was made public, he went out to the cohort on guard between the hours of six and seven. For the omens were so disastrous, that no earlier time of the day was judged proper. On the steps before the palace gate, he was unanimously saluted by the soldiers as their emperor, and then carried in a litter to the camp. Thence, after making a short speech to the troops, into the senate house, where he continued until the evening. Of all the immense honours which were heaped upon him, refusing none but the title of father of his country, on account of his youth. 9. He began his reign with an ostentation of dutiful regard to the memory of Claudius, whom he buried with the utmost pomp and magnificence, pronouncing the funeral oration himself, and then had him enrolled amongst the gods. He paid likewise the highest honours to the memory of his father Domitius. He left the management of affairs, both public and private, to his mother. The word which he gave the first day of his reign to the tribune on guard, was, the best of mothers, and afterwards he frequently appeared with her in the streets of Rome in her litter. He settled a colony at Antium, in which he placed the veteran soldiers belonging to the guards, and obliged several of the richest centurions of the first rank to transfer their residence to that place. Where he likewise made a noble harbour at a prodigious expense. 567 x. To establish still further his character, he declared, that he designed to govern according to the model of Augustus. And omitted no opportunity of showing his generosity, clemency, and complaisance. The more burthensome taxes he either entirely took off, or diminished. The rewards appointed for informers by the Papian law, he reduced to a fourth part, and distributed to the people four hundred sesters as a man. To the noblest of the senators who were much reduced in their circumstances, he granted annual allowances, in some cases as much as five hundred thousand sesterces, and to the praetorian cohorts a monthly allowance of corn gratis. When called upon to subscribe the sentence, according to custom, of a criminal condemned to die, I wish, said he, I had never learnt to read and write. He continually saluted people of the several orders by name, without a prompter. When the Senate returned him their thanks for his good government, he replied to them, It will be time enough to do so when I shall have deserved it. He admitted the common people to see him perform his exercises in the campus martius. He frequently declaimed in public and recited verses of his own composing, not only at home, but in the theatre, so much to the joy of all the people, that public prayers were appointed to be put up to the gods upon that account. And the verses which had been publicly read, were, after being written in gold letters, consecrated to Jupiter Capitolinus. 11. He presented the people with a great number and variety of spectacles, as the juvenile and circentian games, stage plays, and an exhibition of gladiators. 
In the juvenile, he even admitted senators and aged matrons to perform parts. In the Circentian Games, he assigned the equestrian order seats apart from the rest of the people, and had races performed by chariots drawn each by four camels. In the games which he instituted for the eternal duration of the empire, and therefore ordered to be called Maximi, many of the senatorian and equestrian order, of both sexes, performed. A distinguished Roman knight descended on the stage by a rope, mounted on an elephant. A Roman play, likewise, composed by Afranius, was brought upon the stage. It was entitled, The Fire. And in it the performers were allowed to carry off, and to keep to themselves, the furniture of the house, which, as the plot of the play required, was burnt down in the theatre. Every day during the solemnity, many thousand articles of all descriptions were thrown amongst the people to scramble for. Such as fowls of different kinds, tickets for corn, clothes, gold, silver, gems, pearls, pictures, slaves, beasts of burden, wild beasts that had been tamed, at last, ships, lots of houses, and lands, were offered as prizes in a lottery. 12. These games he beheld from the front of the proscenium. In the show of gladiators, which he exhibited in a wooden amphitheatre, built within a year in the district of the Campus Martius 568, he ordered that none should be slain, not even the condemned criminals employed in the combats. He secured four hundred senators, and six hundred Roman knights, amongst whom were some of unbroken fortunes and unblemished reputation, to act as gladiators. From the same orders, he engaged persons to encounter wild beasts, and for various other services in the theatre. He presented the public with the representation of a naval fight, upon sea water, with huge fishes swimming in it. As also with the Pyrrhic dance, performed by certain youths, to each of whom, after the performance was over, he granted the freedom of Rome. During this diversion, a bull-covered Pacifi, concealed within a wooden statue of a cow, as many of the spectators believed. Icarus, upon his first attempt to fly, fell on the stage close to the emperor's pavilion, and bespattered him with blood. For he very seldom presided in the games, but used to view them reclining on a couch, at first through some narrow apertures, but afterwards with the podium 569 quite open. He was the first who instituted 570, in imitation of the Greeks, a trial of skill in the three several exercises of music, wrestling, and horse racing, to be performed at Rome every five years, and which he called Neronia. Upon the dedication of his bath 571 and gymnasium, he furnished the senate and the equestrian order with oil. He appointed as judges of the trial men of consular rank, chosen by Lot, who sat with the praetors. At this time he went down into the orchestra amongst the senators, and received the crown for the best performance in Latin prose and verse, for which several persons of the greatest merit contended, but they unanimously yielded to him. The crown for the best performer on the harp, being likewise awarded to him by the judges, he devoutly saluted it, and ordered it to be carried to the statue of Augustus. In the gymnastic exercises, which he presented in the septa, while they were preparing the great sacrifice of an ox, he shaved his beard for the first time 572, and putting it up in a casket of gold studded with pearls of great price. Consecrated it to Jupiter Capitolinus. He invited the Vestal Virgins to see the wrestlers perform, because, at Olympia, the priestesses of Ceres are allowed the privilege of witnessing that exhibition. 13. Amongst the spectacles presented by him, the solemn entrance of Tiridates 573 into the city deserves to be mentioned. This personage, who was king of Armenia, he invited to Rome by very liberal promises. But being prevented by unfavorable weather from showing him to the people upon the day fixed by proclamation, he took the first opportunity which occurred. Several cohorts being drawn up under arms, about the temples in the forum, while he was seated on a curule chair on the rostra, in a triumphal dress, amidst the military standards and ensigns. Upon Tiridates advancing towards him, on a stage made shelving for the purpose, he permitted him to throw himself at his feet, but quickly raised him with his right hand, and kissed him. The emperor then, at the king's request, took the turban from his head, and replaced it by a crown, whilst a person of praetorian rank proclaimed in Latin the words in which the prince addressed the emperor as a suppliant. 
After this ceremony, the king was conducted to the theater, where, after renewing his obeisance, Nero seated him on his right hand. Being then greeted by universal acclamation with the title of emperor, and sending his laurel crown to the capital, Nero shut the temple of the two-faced Janus, as though there now existed no war throughout the Roman Empire. 14. He filled the consulship four times 574, the first for two months, the second and last for six, and the third for four, the two intermediate ones he held successively, but the others after an interval of some years between them. 15. In the administration of justice, he scarcely ever gave his decision on the pleadings before the next day, and then in writing. His manner of hearing causes was not to allow any adjournment, but to dispatch them in order as they stood. When he withdrew to consult his assessors, he did not debate the matter openly with them. But silently and privately reading over their opinions, which they gave separately in writing, he pronounced sentence from the tribunal according to his own view of the case, as if it was the opinion of the majority. For a long time he would not admit the sons of freedmen into the Senate, and those who had been admitted by former princes, he excluded from all public offices. To supernumerary candidates he gave command in the legions, to comfort them under the delay of their hopes. The consulship he commonly conferred for six months. And one of the two consuls dying a little before the 1st of January, he substituted no one in his place, disliking what had been formerly done for Caninius Rebellus on such an occasion, who was consul for one day only. He allowed the triumphal honours only to those who were of quaestorian rank, and to some of the equestrian order, and bestowed them without regard to military service. And instead of the quaestors, whose office it properly was, he frequently ordered that the addresses, which he sent to the Senate on certain occasions, should be read by the consuls. 16. He devised a new style of building in the city, ordering piazzas to be erected before all houses, both in the streets and detached, to give facilities from their terraces, in case of fire, for preventing it from spreading. And these he built at his own expense. He likewise designed to extend the city walls as far as Ostia, and bring the sea from thence by a canal into the old city. Many severe regulations and new orders were made in his time. A sumptuary law was enacted. Public suppers were limited to the sportually 575, and victualling houses restrained from selling any dressed victuals, except pulse and herbs, whereas before they sold all kinds of meat. He likewise inflicted punishments on the Christians, a sort of people who held a new and impious 576 superstition. He forbade the revels of the charioteers, who had long assumed the license to stroll about, and established for themselves a kind of prescriptive right to cheat and thieve, making a jest of it. The partisans of the rival theatrical performers were banished, as well as the actors themselves. 17. To prevent forgery, a method was then first invented, of having writings bored, run through three times with a thread, and then sealed. It was likewise provided that in wills, the two first pages, with only the testator's name upon them, should be presented blank to those who were to sign them as witnesses. And that no one who wrote a will for another, should insert any legacy for himself. It was likewise ordained that clients should pay their advocates a certain reasonable fee, but nothing for the court, which was to be gratuitous, the charges for it being paid out of the public treasury. That causes, the cognizance of which before belonged to the judges of the exchequer, should be transferred to the forum, and the ordinary tribunals, and that all appeals from the judges should be made to the senate. 18. He never entertained the least ambition or hope of augmenting and extending the frontiers of the empire. On the contrary, he had thoughts of withdrawing the troops from Britain, and was only restrained from so doing by the fear of appearing to detract from the glory of his father 577. All that he did was to reduce the kingdom of Pontus, which was ceded to him by Pulmon, and also the Alps 578, upon the death of Cadius, into the form of a province. 19. Twice only he undertook any foreign expeditions, one to Alexandria, and the other to Achaia, but he abandoned the prosecution of the former on the very day fixed for his departure, by being deterred both by ill omens, and the hazard of the voyage. For while he was making the circuit of the temples, having seated himself in that of Vesta, when he attempted to rise, 
the skirt of his robe stuck fast. And he was instantly seized with such a dimness in his eyes, that he could not see a yard before him. In Achaia, he attempted to make a cut through the Isthmus 579. And, having made a speech encouraging his praetorians to set about the work, on a signal given by sound of trumpet, he first broke ground with a spade, and carried off a basket full of earth upon his shoulders. He made preparations for an expedition to the pass of the Caspian Mountains 580, forming a new legion out of his late levies in Italy, of men all six feet high, which he called the Phalanx of Alexander the Great. These transactions, in part unexceptionable, and in part highly commendable, I have brought into one view, in order to separate them from the scandalous and criminal part of his conduct, of which I shall now give an account. XX. Among the other liberal arts which he was taught in his youth, he was instructed in music. And immediately after his advancement to the empire, he sent for Terpness, a performer upon the harp 581, who flourished at that time with the highest reputation. Sitting with him for several days following, as he sang and played after supper, until late at night, he began by degrees to practice upon the instrument himself. Nor did he omit any of those expedients which artists in music adopt, for the preservation and improvement of their voices. He would lie upon his back with a sheet of lead upon his breast, clear his stomach and bowels by vomits and clisters, and forbear the eating of fruits, or food prejudicial to the voice. Encouraged by his proficiency, though his voice was naturally neither loud nor clear, he was desirous of appearing upon the stage. Frequently repeating amongst his friends a Greek proverb to this effect, that no one had any regard for music which they never heard. Accordingly, he made his first public appearance at Naples, and although the theatre quivered with the sudden shock of an earthquake, he did not desist, until he had finished the piece of music he had begun. He played and sung in the same place several times, and for several days together, taking only now and then a little respite to refresh his voice. Impatient of retirement, it was his custom to go from the bath to the theatre. And after dining in the orchestra, amidst a crowded assembly of the people, he promised them in Greek 582, that after he had drank a little, he would give them a tune which would make their ears tingle. Being highly pleased with the songs that were sung in his praise by some Alexandrians belonging to the fleet just arrived at Naples 583, he sent for more of the like singers from Alexandria. At the same time, he chose young men of the equestrian order, and above five thousand robust young fellows from the common people, on purpose to learn various kinds of applause, called Bombay, Embraces, and Teste 584. Which they were to practice in his favor, whenever he performed. They were divided into several parties, and were remarkable for their fine heads of hair, and were extremely well dressed, with rings upon their left hands. The leaders of these bands had salaries of 40,000 sesterces allowed them. 21. At Rome also, being extremely proud of his singing, he ordered the games called Neronia to be celebrated before the time fixed for their return. All now becoming importunate to hear his heavenly voice, he informed them, that he would gratify those who desired it at the gardens. But the soldiers then on guard seconding the voice of the people, he promised to comply with their request immediately, and with all his heart. He instantly ordered his name to be entered upon the list of musicians who proposed to contend, and having thrown his lot into the urn among the rest, took his turn, and entered, attended by the prefects of the praetorian cohorts bearing his harp. And followed by the military tribunes, and several of his intimate friends. After he had taken his station, and made the usual prelude, he commanded Cluvius Rufus, a man of consular rank, to proclaim in the theatre, that he intended to sing the story of Niobe. This he accordingly did, and continued it until nearly ten o'clock, but deferred the disposal of the crown, and the remaining part of the solemnity, until the next year, that he might have more frequent opportunities of performing. But that being too long, he could not refrain from often appearing as a public performer during the interval. He made no scruple of exhibiting on the stage, even in the spectacles presented to the people by private persons, and was offered by one of the praetors, no less than a million of sesterces for his services. He likewise sang tragedies in a mask. The visors of the heroes and gods, as also of the heroines and goddesses, being formed into a resemblance of his own face, and that of any woman he was in love with. 
Amongst the rest, he sung, Canes in Labor, 585 Orestes the Murderer of His Mother, Oedipus Blinded, and Hercules Mad. In the last tragedy, it is said that a young sentinel, posted at the entrance of the stage, seeing him in a prison dress and bound with fetters, as the fable of the play required, ran to his assistance. 22. He had from his childhood an extravagant passion for horses, and his constant talk was of the Circentian races, notwithstanding it was prohibited him. Lamenting once, among his fellow pupils, the case of a charioteer of the Green Party, who was dragged round the circus at the tail of his chariot, and being reprimanded by his tutor for it, he pretended that he was talking of Hector. In the beginning of his reign, he used to amuse himself daily with chariots drawn by four horses, made of ivory, upon a table. He attended at all the lesser exhibitions in the circus, at first privately, but at last openly. So that nobody ever doubted of his presence on any particular day. Nor did he conceal his desire to have the number of the prizes doubled, so that the races being increased accordingly, the diversion continued until a late hour. The leaders of parties refusing now to bring out their companies for any time less than the whole day. Upon this, he took a fancy for driving the chariot himself, and that even publicly. Having made his first experiment in the gardens, amidst crowds of slaves and other rabble, he at length performed in the view of all the people, in the Circus Maximus. Whilst one of his freedmen dropped the napkin in the place where the magistrates used to give the signal. Not satisfied with exhibiting various specimens of his skill in those arts at Rome, he went over to Achaia, as has been already said, principally for this purpose. The several cities, in which solemn trials of musical skill used to be publicly held, had resolved to send him the crowns belonging to those who bore away the prize. These he accepted so graciously, that he not only gave the deputies who brought them an immediate audience, but even invited them to his table. Being requested by some of them to sing at supper, and prodigiously applauded, he said, the Greeks were the only people who has an ear for music, and were the only good judges of him and his attainments. Without delay he commenced his journey, and on his arrival at Cassiope 586, exhibited his first musical performance before the altar of Jupiter Cassius. 23. He afterwards appeared at the celebration of all public games in Greece, for such as fell in different years, he brought within the compass of one, and some he ordered to be celebrated a second time in the same year. At Olympia, likewise, contrary to custom, he appointed a public performance in music, and that he might meet with no interruption in this employment, when he was informed by his freedman Helios, that affairs at Rome required his presence. He wrote to him in these words, Though now all your hopes and wishes are for my speedy return, yet you ought rather to advise and hope that I may come back with a character worthy of Nero. During the time of his musical performance, nobody was allowed to stir out of the theatre upon any account, however necessary, insomuch, that it is said some women with child were delivered there. Many of the spectators being quite wearied with hearing and applauding him, because the town gates were shut, slipped privately over the walls, or counterfeiting themselves dead, were carried out for their funeral. With what extreme anxiety he engaged in these contests, with what keen desire to bear away the prize, and with how much awe of the judges, is scarcely to be believed. As if his adversaries had been on a level with himself, he would watch them narrowly, defame them privately, and sometimes, upon meeting them, rail at them in very scurrilous language, or bribe them, if they were better performers than himself. He always addressed the judges with the most profound reverence before he began, telling them, he had done all things that were necessary, by way of preparation, but that the issue of the approaching trial was in the hand of fortune. And that they, as wise and skillful men, ought to exclude from their judgment things merely accidental. Upon their encouraging him to have a good heart, he went off with more assurance, but not entirely free from anxiety. Interpreting the silence and modesty of some of them into sourness and ill-nature, and saying that he was suspicious of them. 24. In these contests, he adhered so strictly to the rules, that he never durst spit, nor wipe the sweat from his forehead in any other way than with his sleeve. Having, in the performance of a tragedy, dropped his scepter, and not quickly recovering it, he was in a great fright, lest he should be set aside for the miscarriage, and could not regain his assurance. 
until an actor who stood by swore he was certain it had not been observed in the midst of the acclamations and exultations of the people. When the prize was adjudged to him, he always proclaimed it himself, and even entered the lists with the heralds. That no memory or the least monument might remain of any other victor in the sacred Grecian games, he ordered all their statues and pictures to be pulled down, dragged away with hooks, and thrown into the common sewers. He drove the chariot with various numbers of horses, and at the Olympic Games with no fewer than ten, though, in a poem of his, he had reflected upon Mithridates for that innovation. Being thrown out of his chariot, he was again replaced, but could not retain his seat, and was obliged to give up, before he reached the goal, but was crowned notwithstanding. On his departure, he declared the whole province a free country, and conferred upon the judges in the several games the freedom of Rome, with large sums of money. All these favours he proclaimed himself with his own voice, from the middle of the stadium, during the solemnity of the Isthmian Games. 25. On his return from Greece, arriving at Naples, because he had commenced his career as a public performer in that city, he made his entrance in a chariot drawn by white horses through a breach in the city wall. According to the practice of those who were victorious in the sacred Grecian games. In the same manner he entered Antium, Alba, and Rome. He made his entry into the city riding in the same chariot in which Augustus had triumphed, in a purple tunic, and a cloak embroidered with golden stars, having on his head the crown won at Olympia. And in his right hand that which was given him at the Parthian Games, the rest being carried in a procession before him, with inscriptions denoting the places where they had been won, from whom, and in what plays or musical performances. Whilst a train followed him with loud acclamations, crying out, that, they were the emperor's attendants, and the soldiers of his triumph. Having then caused an arch of the Circus Maximus 587 to be taken down, he passed through the breach, as also through the Velabrum 588 and the Forum, to the Palatine Hill and the Temple of Apollo. Everywhere as he marched along, victims were slain, whilst the streets were strewed with saffron, and birds, chaplets, and sweetmeats scattered abroad. He suspended the sacred crowns in his chamber, about his beds, and caused statues of himself to be erected in the attire of a harper, and had his likeness stamped upon the coin in the same dress. After this period, he was so far from abating anything of his application to music, that, for the preservation of his voice, he never addressed the soldiers but by messages, or with some person to deliver his speeches for him. When he thought fit to make his appearance amongst them. Nor did he ever do anything either in jest or earnest, without a voice master standing by him to caution him against overstraining his vocal organs, and to apply a handkerchief to his mouth when he did. He offered his friendship, or avowed open enmity to many, according as they were lavish or sparing in giving him their applause. 26. Petulancy, lewdness, luxury, avarice, and cruelty, he practiced at first with reserve and in private, as if prompted to them only by the folly of youth. But, even then, the world was of opinion that they were the faults of his nature, and not of his age. After it was dark, he used to enter the taverns disguised in a cap or a wig, and ramble about the streets in sport, which was not void of mischief. He used to beat those he met coming home from supper, and, if they made any resistance, would wound them, and throw them into the common sewer. He broke open and robbed shops, establishing an auction at home for selling his booty. In the scuffles which took place on those occasions, he often ran the hazard of losing his eyes, and even his life, being beaten almost to death by a senator, for handling his wife indecently. After this adventure, he never again ventured abroad at that time of night, without some tribunes following him at a little distance. In the daytime he would be carried to the theatre incognito in a litter, placing himself upon the upper part of the proscenium, where he not only witnessed the quarrels which arose on account of the performances, but also encouraged them. When they came to blows, and stones and pieces of broken benches began to fly about, he threw them plentifully amongst the people, and once even broke a praetor's head. 27. His vices gaining strength by degrees, he laid aside his jocular amusements, and all disguise, breaking out into enormous crimes, without the least attempt to conceal them. His revels were prolonged from midday to midnight, while he was frequently refreshed by warm baths, and, in the summer time, 
by such as were cooled with snow. He often supped in public, in the Namakia, with the sluices shut, or in the Campus Martius, or the Circus Maximus, being waited upon at table by common prostitutes of the town, and Syrian strumpets and glee girls. As often as he went down the Tiber to Ostia, or coasted through the Gulf of Bai, booths furnished as brothels and eating houses, were erected along the shore and river banks. Before which stood matrons, who, like bawds and hostesses, allured him to land. It was also his custom to invite himself to supper with his friends. At one of which was expended no less than four millions of sesterces in chaplets, and at another something more in roses. 28. Besides the abuse of freeborn lads, and the debauch of married women, he committed a rape upon Rubria, a vestal virgin. He was upon the point of marrying Act 589, his freed woman, having suborned some men of consular rank to swear that she was of royal descent. He gelded the boy Sporus, and endeavoured to transform him into a woman. He even went so far as to marry him, with all the usual formalities of a marriage settlement, the rose-coloured nuptial veil, and a numerous company at the wedding. When the ceremony was over, he had him conducted like a bride to his own house, and treated him as his wife 590. It was jocularly observed by some person, that it would have been well for mankind, had such a wife fallen to the lot of his father Domitius. This Sporus he carried about with him in a litter round the solemn assemblies and fairs of Greece, and afterwards at Rome through the Sigillaria 591, dressed in the rich attire of an empress, kissing him from time to time as they rode together. That he entertained an incestuous passion for his mother 592, but was deterred by her enemies, for fear that this haughty and overbearing woman should, by her compliance, get him entirely into her power, and govern in everything. Was universally believed. Especially after he had introduced amongst his concubines a strumpet, who was reported to have a strong resemblance to Agrippina 593. 29. He prostituted his own chastity to such a degree, that after he had defiled every part of his person with some unnatural pollution, he at last invented an extraordinary kind of diversion. Which was, to be let out of a den in the arena, covered with the skin of a wild beast, and then assail with violence the private parts both of men and women, while they were bound to stakes. After he had vented his furious passion upon them, he finished the play in the embraces of his freedman Doriphorus 594, to whom he was married in the same way that Sporus had been married to himself. Imitating the cries and shrieks of young virgins, when they are ravished. I have been informed from numerous sources, that he firmly believed, no man in the world to be chaste, or any part of his person undefiled. But that most men concealed that vice, and were cunning enough to keep it secret. To those, therefore, who frankly owned their unnatural lewdness, he forgave all other crimes. Triple X. He thought there was no other use of riches and money than to squander them away profusely, regarding all those as sordid wretches who kept their expenses within due bounds. And extolling those as truly noble and generous souls, who lavished away and wasted all they possessed. He praised and admired his uncle Caius 595, upon no account more, than for squandering in a short time the vast treasure left him by Tiberius. Accordingly, he was himself extravagant and profuse, beyond all bounds. He spent upon Tiridates eight hundred thousand sesters as a day, a sum almost incredible, and at his departure, presented him with upwards of a million five ninety-six. He likewise bestowed upon Menecrates the harper, and Spicillus a gladiator, the estates and houses of men who had received the honour of a triumph. He enriched the usurer Circopithecus Panerodes with estates both in town and country. And gave him a funeral, in pomp and magnificence little inferior to that of princes. He never wore the same garment twice. He has been known to stake four hundred thousand sesterces on a throw of the dice. It was his custom to fish with a golden net, drawn by silken cords of purple and scarlet. It is said, that he never travelled with less than a thousand baggage carts. The mules being all shod with silver, and the drivers dressed in scarlet jackets of the finest Canusian cloth 597, with a numerous train of footmen, and troops of Mazikans 598, with bracelets on their arms. And mounted upon horses in splendid trappings. 
XXXI, in nothing was he more prodigal than in his buildings. He completed his palace by continuing it from the Palatine to the Esquiline Hill, calling the building at first only, the Passage, but, after it was burnt down and rebuilt, the Golden House. 599 of its dimensions and furniture, it may be sufficient to say thus much, the porch was so high that there stood in it a colossal statue of himself a hundred and twenty feet in height. And the space included in it was so ample, that it had triple porticos a mile in length, and a lake like a sea, surrounded with buildings which had the appearance of a city. Within its area were corn fields, vineyards, pastures, and woods, containing a vast number of animals of various kinds, both wild and tame. In other parts it was entirely overlaid with gold, and adorned with jewels and mother of pearl. The supper rooms were vaulted, and compartments of the ceilings, inlaid with ivory, were made to revolve, and scatter flowers, while they contained pipes which shed unguents upon the guests. The chief banqueting room was circular, and revolved perpetually, night and day, in imitation of the motion of the celestial bodies. The baths were supplied with water from the sea and the albula. Upon the dedication of this magnificent house after it was finished, all he said in approval of it was, that he had now a dwelling fit for a man. He commenced making a pond for the reception of all the hot streams from Bai, which he designed to have continued from Mizinum to the Avernian Lake, in a conduit, enclosed in galleries. And also a canal from Avernum to Ostia, that ships might pass from one to the other, without a sea voyage. The length of the proposed canal was 160 miles. And it was intended to be of breadth sufficient to permit ships with five banks of oars to pass each other. For the execution of these designs, he ordered all prisoners, in every part of the empire, to be brought to Italy. And that even those who were convicted of the most heinous crimes, in lieu of any other sentence, should be condemned to work at them. He was encouraged to all this wild and enormous profusion, not only by the great revenue of the empire, but by the sudden hopes given him of an immense hidden treasure, which Queen Dido, upon her flight from Tyre, had brought with her to Africa. This, a Roman knight pretended to assure him, upon good grounds, was still hid there in some deep caverns, and might with a little labor be recovered. 32. But being disappointed in his expectations of this resource, and reduced to such difficulties, for want of money, that he was obliged to defer paying his troops, and the rewards due to the veterans. He resolved upon supplying his necessities by means of false accusations and plunder. In the first place, he ordered, that if any freedman, without sufficient reason, bore the name of the family to which he belonged. The half, instead of three-fourths, of his estate should be brought into the exchequer at his decease, also that the estates of all such persons as had not in their wills been mindful of their prince, should be confiscated. And that the lawyers who had drawn or dictated such wills, should be liable to a fine. He ordained likewise, that all words and actions, upon which any informer could ground a prosecution, should be deemed treason. He demanded an equivalent for the crowns which the cities of Greece had at any time offered him in the solemn games. Having forbade any one to use the colors of amethyst and Tyrian purple, he privately sent a person to sell a few ounces of them upon the day of the Nundani, and then shut up all the merchants' shops, on the pretext that his edict had been violated. It is said, that, as he was playing and singing in the theatre, observing a married lady dressed in the purple which he had prohibited, he pointed her out to his procurators. Upon which she was immediately dragged out of her seat, and not only stripped of her clothes, but her property. He never nominated a person to any office without saying to him, You know what I want. And let us take care that nobody has anything he can call his own. At last he rifled many temples of the rich offerings with which they were stored, and melted down all the gold and silver statues, and amongst them those of the Panades six hundred, which Galba afterwards restored. 33. He began the practice of parricide and murder with Claudius himself, for although he was not the contriver of his death, he was privy to the plot. Nor did he make any secret of it. But used afterwards to commend, in a Greek proverb, mushrooms as food fit for the gods, because Claudius had been poisoned with them. He traduced his memory both by word and deed in the grossest manner. One while charging him with folly, another while with cruelty. 
for he used to say by way of jest, that he had ceased Morari 601 amongst men, pronouncing the first syllable long. And treated as null many of his decrees and ordinances, as made by a doting old blockhead. He enclosed the place where his body was burnt with only a low wall of rough masonry. He attempted to poison Britannicus, as much out of envy because he had a sweeter voice, as from apprehension of what might ensue from the respect which the people entertained for his father's memory. He employed for this purpose a woman named Locusta, who had been a witness against some persons guilty of like practices. But the poison she gave him, working more slowly than he expected, and only causing a purge, he sent for the woman, and beat her with his own hand, charging her with administering an antidote instead of poison. And upon her alleging an excuse, that she had given Britannicus but a gentle mixture in order to prevent suspicion, think you, said he, that I am afraid of the Julian law. And obliged her to prepare, in his own chamber and before his eyes, as quick and strong a dose as possible. This he tried upon a kid, but the animal lingering for five hours before it expired, he ordered her to go to work again. And when she had done, he gave the poison to a pig, which dying immediately, he commanded the potion to be brought into the eating room and given to Britannicus, while he was at supper with him. The prince had no sooner tasted it than he sunk on the floor, Nero meanwhile, pretending to the guests, that it was only a fit of the falling sickness, to which, he said, he was subject. He buried him the following day, in a mean and hurried way, during violent storms of rain. He gave Locusta a pardon, and rewarded her with a great estate in land, placing some disciples with her, to be instructed in her trade. 34. His mother being used to make strict inquiry into what he said or did, and to reprimand him with the freedom of a parent, he was so much offended, that he endeavoured to expose her to public resentment. By frequently pretending a resolution to quit the government, and retire to Rhodes. Soon afterwards, he deprived her of all honour and power, took from her the guard of Roman and German soldiers, banished her from the palace and from his society, and persecuted her in every way he could contrive. Employing persons to harass her when at Rome with lawsuits, and to disturb her in her retirement from town with the most scurrilous and abusive language, following her about by land and sea. But being terrified with her menaces and violent spirit, he resolved upon her destruction, and thrice attempted it by poison. Finding, however, that she had previously secured herself by antidotes, he contrived machinery, by which the floor over her bedchamber might be made to fall upon her while she was asleep in the night. This design miscarrying likewise, through the little caution used by those who were in the secret, his next stratagem was to construct a ship which could be easily shivered, in hopes of destroying her either by drowning or by the deck above her cabin crushing her in its fall. Accordingly, under color of a pretended reconciliation, he wrote her an extremely affectionate letter, inviting her to Bai, to celebrate with him the festival of Minerva. He had given private orders to the captains of the galleys which were to attend her, to shatter to pieces the ship in which she had come, by falling foul of it, but in such manner that it might appear to be done accidentally. He prolonged the entertainment, for the more convenient opportunity of executing the plot in the night. And at her return for Bali 602, instead of the old ship which had conveyed her to Bai, he offered that which he had contrived for her destruction. He attended her to the vessel in a very cheerful mood, and, at parting with her, kissed her breasts. After which he sat up very late in the night, waiting with great anxiety to learn the issue of his project. But receiving information that everything had fallen out contrary to his wish, and that she had saved herself by swimming, not knowing what course to take, upon her freedman, Lucius Agerinus bringing word, with great joy. That she was safe and well, he privately dropped a poniard by him. He then commanded the freedman to be seized and put in chains, under pretense of his having been employed by his mother to assassinate him. At the same time ordering her to be put to death, and giving out, that, to avoid punishment for her intended crime, she had laid violent hands upon herself. Other circumstances, still more horrible, are related on good authority. As that he went to view her corpse, and handling her limbs, pointed out some blemishes, and commended other points, and that, growing thirsty during the survey, he called for drink. 
Yet he was never afterwards able to bear the stings of his own conscience for this atrocious act, although encouraged by the congratulatory addresses of the army, the senate, and people. He frequently affirmed that he was haunted by his mother's ghost, and persecuted with the whips and burning torches of the Furies. Nay, he attempted by magical rites to bring up her ghost from below, and soften her rage against him. When he was in Greece, he durst not attend the celebration of the Eleusinian Mysteries, at the initiation of which, impious and wicked persons are warned by the voice of the herald from approaching the rite 603. Besides the murder of his mother, he had been guilty of that of his aunt. For, being obliged to keep her bed in consequence of a complaint in her bowels, he paid her a visit, and she, being then advanced in years, stroking his downy chin, in the tenderness of affection, said to him, May I but live to see the day when this is shaved for the first time 604, and I shall then die contented. He turned, however, to those about him, made a jest of it, saying, that he would have his beard immediately taken off, and ordered the physicians to give her more violent purgatives. He seized upon her estate before she had expired. Suppressing her will, that he might enjoy the whole himself. 35. He had, besides Octavia, two other wives, Papia Sabina, whose father had borne the office of Quester, and who had been married before to a Roman knight, and, after her, Statilia Messalina, great-granddaughter of Taurus 605 who was twice consul, and received the honor of a triumph. To obtain possession of her, he put to death her husband, Atticus Vestinus, who was then consul. He soon became disgusted with Octavia, and ceased from having any intercourse with her. And being censured by his friends for it, he replied, she ought to be satisfied with having the rank and appendages of his wife. Soon afterwards, he made several attempts, but in vain, to strangle her, and then divorced her for barrenness. But the people, disapproving of the divorce, and making severe comments upon it, he also banished her 606. At last he put her to death, upon a charge of adultery, so impudent and false, that, when all those who were put to the torture positively denied their knowledge of it, he suborned his pedagogue, and Isidus, to affirm that he had secretly intrigued with and debauched her. He married Papia twelve days after the divorce of Octavia 607, and entertained a great affection for her. But, nevertheless, killed her with a kick which he gave her when she was big with child, and in bad health, only because she found fault with him for returning late from driving his chariot. He had by her a daughter, Claudia Augusta, who died an infant. There was no person at all connected with him who escaped his deadly and unjust cruelty. Under pretense of her being engaged in a plot against him, he put to death Antonia, Claudius's daughter, who refused to marry him after the death of Papia. In the same way, he destroyed all who were allied to him either by blood or marriage. Amongst whom was young Aulus Plotinus. He first compelled him to submit to his unnatural lust, and then ordered him to be executed, crying out, let my mother bestow her kisses on my successor thus defiled. Pretending that he had been his mother's paramour, and by her encouraged to aspire to the empire. His stepson, Rufinus Crispinus, Papia's son, though a minor, he ordered to be drowned in the sea, while he was fishing, by his own slaves, because he was reported to act frequently amongst his playfellows the part of a general or an emperor. He banished Tuscus, his nurse's son, for presuming, when he was procurator of Egypt, to wash in the baths which had been constructed in expectation of his own coming. Seneca, his preceptor, he forced to kill himself 608, though, upon his desiring leave to retire, and offering to surrender his estate, he solemnly swore, that there was no foundation for his suspicions. And that he would perish himself sooner than hurt him. Having promised Burhus, the praetorian prefect, a remedy for a swelling in his throat, he sent him poison. Some old rich freedmen of Claudius, who had formerly not only promoted his adoption, but were also instrumental to his advancement to the empire, and had been his governors, he took off by poison given them in their meat or drink. 36. Nor did he proceed with less cruelty against those who were not of his family. A blazing star, which is vulgarly supposed to portend destruction to kings and princes, appeared above the horizon several nights successively 609. 
He felt great anxiety on account of this phenomenon, and being informed by one Babylus, an astrologer, that princes were used to expiate such omens by the sacrifice of illustrious persons, and so avert the danger foreboded to their own persons. By bringing it on the heads of their chief men, he resolved on the destruction of the principal nobility in Rome. He was the more encouraged to this, because he had some plausible pretense for carrying it into execution, from the discovery of two conspiracies against him, the former and more dangerous of which was that formed by Piso 610, and discovered at Rome. The other was that of Venetius 611, at Beneventum. The conspirators were brought to their trials loaded with triple fetters. Some ingenuously confessed the charge. Others avowed that they thought the design against his life an act of favor for which he was obliged to them, as it was impossible in any other way than by death to relieve a person rendered infamous by crimes of the greatest enormity. The children of those who had been condemned, were banished the city, and afterwards either poisoned or starved to death. It is asserted that some of them, with their tutors, and the slaves who carried their satchels, were all poisoned together at one dinner, and others are not suffered to seek their daily bread. 37. From this period he butchered, without distinction or quarter, all whom his caprice suggested as objects for his cruelty, and upon the most frivolous pretenses. To mention only a few, Salvadianus Orphidus was accused of letting out three taverns attached to his house in the Forum to some cities for the use of their deputies at Rome. The charge against Cassius Longinus, a lawyer who had lost his sight, was, that he kept amongst the busts of his ancestors that of Caius Cassius, who was concerned in the death of Julius Caesar. The only charge objected against Paetus Thracia was, that he had a melancholy cast of features, and looked like a schoolmaster. He allowed but one hour to those whom he obliged to kill themselves. And, to prevent delay, he sent them physicians, to cure them immediately, if they lingered beyond that time, for so he called bleeding them to death. There was at that time an Egyptian of a most voracious appetite, who would digest raw flesh, or anything else that was given him. It was credibly reported, that the emperor was extremely desirous of furnishing him with living men to tear and devour. Being elated with his great success in the perpetration of crimes, he declared, that no prince before himself ever knew the extent of his power. He threw out strong intimations that he would not even spare the senators who survived, but would entirely extirpate that order, and put the provinces and armies into the hands of the Roman knights and his own freedmen. It is certain that he never gave or vouchsafed to allow any one the customary kiss, either on entering or departing, or even returned a salute. And at the inauguration of a work, the cut through the Isthmus 612, he, with a loud voice, amidst the assembled multitude, uttered a prayer, that, the undertaking might prove fortunate for himself and the Roman people. Without taking the smallest notice of the Senate. XXXVI, he spared, moreover, neither the people of Rome, nor the capital of his country. Somebody in conversation saying. Emu Thenantos Gaia Mictito Pyri. When I am dead let fire devour the world. Nay, said he, let it be while I am living, Emu Zantos. And he acted accordingly, for, pretending to be disgusted with the old buildings, and the narrow and winding streets, he set the city on fire so openly, that many of consular rank caught his own household servants on their property with tow. And torches in their hands, but durst not meddle with them. There being near his golden house some granaries, the sight of which he exceedingly coveted, they were battered as if with machines of war, and set on fire, the walls being built of stone. During six days and seven nights this terrible devastation continued, the people being obliged to fly to the tombs and monuments for lodging and shelter. Meanwhile, a vast number of stately buildings, the houses of generals celebrated in former times, and even then still decorated with the spoils of war, were laid in ashes. As well as the temples of the gods, which had been vowed and dedicated by the kings of Rome, and afterwards in the Punic and Gallic Wars, in short, everything that was remarkable and worthy to be seen which time had spared 613. This fire he beheld from a tower in the house of Machinus, and, being greatly delighted, as he said, with the beautiful effects of the conflagration, he sung a poem on the ruin of Troy, in the tragic dress he used on the stage. 
To turn this calamity to his own advantage by plunder and rapine, he promised to remove the bodies of those who had perished in the fire, and clear the rubbish at his own expense, suffering no one to meddle with the remains of their property. But he not only received, but exacted contributions on account of the loss, until he had exhausted the means both of the provinces and private persons. 39. To these terrible and shameful calamities brought upon the people by their prince, were added some proceeding from misfortune. Such were a pestilence, by which, within the space of one autumn, there died no less than thirty thousand persons, as appeared from the registers in the Temple of Libertina. A great disaster in Britain 614, where two of the principal towns belonging to the Romans were plundered, and a dreadful havoc made both amongst our troops and allies, a shameful discomfiture of the army of the East. Where, in Armenia, the legions were obliged to pass under the yoke, and it was with great difficulty that Syria was retained. Amidst all these disasters, it was strange, and, indeed, particularly remarkable, that he bore nothing more patiently than the scurrilous language and railing abuse which was in every one's mouth. Treating no class of persons with more gentleness, than those who assailed him with invective and lampoons. Many things of that kind were posted up about the city, or otherwise published, both in Greek and Latin, such as these. Neron, Orestes, Alcmaean, Myotroctoni. Neoninfon 615 Neron, Idian Mater Apictinon. Orestes and Alcyon, Nero II. The lustful Nero, worst of all the crew. Fresh from his bridal, their own mother slew. Kaznijadini magna de sterpi neronem. Sustulit hic matrem, sustulit 616 al patrem. Sprung from Aeneas, pious, wise and great. Who says that Nero is degenerate? Safe through the flames, one bore his sire, the other. To save himself, took off his loving mother. Dum tendit citheram noster, dum cornu aparthas. Noster erit pian, alicatabilities. His lyre to harmony are Nero strings. His arrows o'er the plain the Parthian wings. Ours call the tuneful pian, famed in war. The other Phoebus name, the god who shoots afar. Point six seventeen. Roma domus fiat, vijos migrate, carites. Si non e di vijos occupat ista domus. All Rome will be one house, to vi fly. Should it not stretch to vi, by and by. 618. But he neither made any inquiry after the authors, nor when information was laid before the Senate against some of them, would he allow a severe sentence to be passed. Isidorus, the cynic philosopher, said to him aloud, as he was passing along the streets, You sing the misfortunes of Nauplius well, but behave badly yourself. And Datus, a comic actor, when repeating these words in the piece, Farewell, father. Farewell mother, mimic the gestures of persons drinking and swimming, significantly alluding to the deaths of Claudius and Agrippina, and on uttering the last clause. Orcus vobis ducit pedes. You stand this moment on the brink of Orcus. He plainly intimated his application of it to the precarious position of the Senate. Yet Nero only banished the player and philosopher from the city and Italy either because he was insensible to shame, or from apprehension that if he discovered his vexation, still keener things might be said of him. XL. The world, after tolerating such an emperor for little less than fourteen years, at length forsook him, the Gauls, headed by Julius Vindex, who at that time governed the province as propraetor, being the first to revolt. Nero had been formerly told by astrologers, that it would be his fortune to be at last deserted by all the world, and this occasion that celebrated saying of his, an artist can live in any country. By which he meant to offer as an excuse for his practice of music, that it was not only his amusement as a prince, but might be his support when reduced to a private station. Yet some of the astrologers promised him, in his forlorn state, the rule of the East, and some in express words the kingdom of Jerusalem. But the greater part of them flattered him with assurances of his being restored to his former fortune. And being most inclined to believe the latter prediction, upon losing Britain and Armenia, he imagined he had run through all the misfortunes which the fates had decreed him. 
But when, upon consulting the oracle of Apollo at Delphi, he was advised to beware of the seventy-third year, as if he were not to die till then, never thinking of Galba's age, he conceived such hopes, not only of living to advanced years, but of constant and singular good fortune, that having lost some things of great value by shipwreck, he scrupled not to say amongst his friends, that, the fishes would bring them back to him. At Naples he heard of the insurrection in Gaul, on the anniversary of the day on which he killed his mother, and bore it with so much unconcern, as to excite a suspicion that he was really glad of it. Since he had now a fair opportunity of plundering those wealthy provinces by the right of war. Immediately going to the gymnasium, he witnessed the exercise of the wrestlers with the greatest delight. Being interrupted at supper with letters which brought yet worse news, he expressed no greater resentment, than only to threaten the rebels. For eight days together, he never attempted to answer any letters, nor give any orders, but buried the whole affair in profound silence. XLI. Being roused at last by numerous proclamations of Vindex, treating him with reproaches and contempt, he in a letter to the Senate exhorted them to avenge his wrongs and those of the Republic. Desiring them to excuse his not appearing in the Senate House, because he had got cold. But nothing so much galled him, as to find himself railed at as a pitiful harper, and, instead of Nero, styled Enobarbus, which being his family name, since he was upbraided with it, he declared that he would resume it. And lay aside the name he had taken by adoption. Passing by the other accusations as wholly groundless, he earnestly refuted that of his want of skill in an art upon which he had bestowed so much pains, and in which he had arrived at such perfection. Asking frequently those about him, if they knew any one who was a more accomplished musician. But being alarmed by messengers after messengers of ill news from Gaul, he returned in great consternation to Rome. On the road, his mind was somewhat relieved, by observing the frivolous omen of a Gaulish soldier defeated and dragged by the hair by a Roman knight, which was sculptured on a monument, so that he leaped for joy, and adored the heavens. Even then he made no appeal either to the senate or people, but calling together some of the leading men at his own house, he held a hasty consultation upon the present state of affairs, and then, during the remainder of the day, carried them about with him to view some musical instruments, of a new invention, which were played by Water 619 exhibiting all the parts, and discoursing upon the principles and difficulties of the contrivance. Which, he told them, he intended to produce in the theatre, if Vindex would give him leave. XLI and soon afterwards, he received intelligence that Galba and the Spaniards had declared against him. Upon which, he fainted, and losing his reason, lay a long time speechless, apparently dead. As soon as recovered from this state stupefaction he tore his clothes, and beat his head, crying out, It is all over with me. His nurse endeavouring to comfort him, and telling him that the like things had happened to other princes before him, he replied, I am beyond all example wretched, for I have lost an empire whilst I am still living. He, nevertheless, abetted nothing of his luxury and inattention to business. Nay, on the arrival of good news from the provinces, he, at a sumptuous entertainment, sung with an air of merriment, some jovial verses upon the leaders of the revolt, which were made public, and accompanied them with suitable gestures. Being carried privately to the theatre, he sent word to an actor who was applauded by the spectators, that he had it all his own way, now that he himself did not appear on the stage. 43. At the first breaking out of these troubles, it is believed that he had formed many designs of a monstrous nature, although conformable enough to his natural disposition. These were to send new governors and commanders to the provinces and the armies, and employ assassins to butcher all the former governors and commanders, as men unanimously engaged in a conspiracy against him. To massacre the exiles in every quarter, and all the Gaulish population in Rome, the former lest they should join the insurrection, the latter as privy to the designs of their countrymen, and ready to support them. To abandon Gaul itself, to be wasted and plundered by his armies, to poison the whole senate at a feast, to fire the city, and then let loose the wild beasts upon the people, in order to impede their stopping the progress of the flames. But being deterred from the execution of these designs not so much by remorse of conscience, as by despair of being able to effect them, and judging an expedition into Gaul necessary, he removed the consuls from their office. 
before the time of its expiration was arrived. And in their room assumed the consulship himself without a colleague, as if the fates had decreed that Gaul should not be conquered, but by a consul. Upon assuming the fasces, after an entertainment at the palace, as he walked out of the room leaning on the arms of some of his friends, he declared, that as soon as he arrived in the province, he would make his appearance amongst the troops. Unarmed, and do nothing but weep, and that, after he had brought the mutineers to repentance, he would, the next day, in the public rejoicings, sing songs of triumph, which he must now, without loss of time, apply himself to compose. XLIV, in preparing for this expedition, his first care was to provide carriages for his musical instruments and machinery to be used upon the stage, to have the hair of the concubines he carried with him dressed in the fashion of men, and to supply them with battle axes and Amazonian bucklers. He summoned the city tribes to enlist. But no qualified persons appearing, he ordered all masters to send a certain number of slaves, the best they had, not excepting their stewards and secretaries. He commanded the several orders of the people to bring in a fixed proportion of their estates, as they stood in the censor's books, all tenants of houses and mansions to pay one year's rent forthwith into the exchequer. And, with unheard of strictness, would receive only new coin of the purest silver and the finest gold, insomuch that most people refused to pay, crying out unanimously that he ought to squeeze the informers, and oblige them to surrender their gains. XLV, the general odium in which he was held received an increase by the great scarcity of corn, and an occurrence connected with it. For, as it happened just at that time, there arrived from Alexandria a ship, which was said to be freighted with dust for the wrestlers belonging to the Emperor 620. This so much inflamed the public rage, that he was treated with the utmost abuse and scurrility. Upon the top of one of his statues was placed the figure of a chariot with a Greek inscription, that, now indeed he had a race to run, let him be gone. A little bag was tied about another, with a ticket containing these words, What could I do? Truly thou hast merited the sack. 621 Some person likewise wrote on the pillars in the forum, that he had even woke the cock 622 with his singing. And many, in the night time, pretending to find fault with their servants, frequently called for a vindex.623. XLVI he was also terrified with manifest warnings, both old and new, arising from dreams, auspices, and omens. He had never been used to dream before the murder of his mother. After that event, he fancied in his sleep that he was steering a ship, and that the rudder was forced from him, that he was dragged by his wife Octavia into a prodigiously dark place. And was at one time covered over with a vast swarm of winged ants, and at another, surrounded by the national images which were set up near Pompey's theatre, and hindered from advancing farther. That a Spanish genet he was fond of, had his hinder parts so changed, as to resemble those of an ape, and having his head only left unaltered, neighed very harmoniously. The doors of the mausoleum of Augustus flying open of themselves, there issued from it a voice, calling on him by name. The Laras being adorned with fresh garlands on the Calends, the first, of January, fell down during the preparations for sacrificing to them. While he was taking the omens, Sporus presented him with a ring, the stone of which had carved upon it the rape of Proserpine. When a great multitude of the several orders was assembled, to attend at the solemnity of making vows to the gods, it was a long time before the keys of the capital could be found. And when, in a speech of his to the Senate against Vindex, these words were read, that the miscreants should be punished and soon make the end they merited, they all cried out, You will do it, Augustus. It was likewise remarked, that the last tragic piece which he sung, was Oedipus in exile, and that he fell as he was repeating this verse. Thanian M. Anoji Singamos, Mater, Patar. Wife, mother, father, force me to my end. 47. Meanwhile, on the arrival of the news, that the rest of the armies had declared against him, he tore to pieces the letters which were delivered to him at dinner, overthrew the table, and dashed with violence against the ground two favorite cups, which he called Homer's, because some of that poet's verses were cut upon them. Then taking from Locusta a dose of poison, which he put up in a golden box, he went into the Servilian gardens, and thence dispatching a trusty freedman to Ostia, with orders to make ready a fleet. 
he endeavoured to prevail with some tribunes and centurions of the Praetorian guards to attend him in his flight. But part of them showing no great inclination to comply, others absolutely refusing, and one of them crying out aloud. Usqui ade one mori miserum est. Say, is it then so sad a thing to die? 624. He was in great perplexity whether he should submit himself to Galba, or apply to the Parthians for protection, or else appear before the people dressed in mourning, and, upon the rostra, in the most piteous manner. Beg pardon for his past misdemeanors, and, if he could not prevail, request of them to grant him at least the government of Egypt. A speech to this purpose was afterwards found in his writing case. But it is conjectured that he durst not venture upon this project, for fear of being torn to pieces, before he could get to the forum. Deferring, therefore, his resolution until the next day, he awoke about midnight, and finding the guards withdrawn, he leaped out of bed, and sent round for his friends. But none of them vouchsafing any message in reply, he went with a few attendants to their houses. The doors being everywhere shut, and no one giving him any answer, he returned to his bedchamber. Whence those who had the charge of it had all now eloped, some having gone one way, and some another, carrying off with them his bedding and box of poison. He then endeavoured to find Spicillus, the gladiator, or some one to kill him. But not being able to procure any one, what, said he, have I then neither friend nor foe, and immediately ran out, as if he would throw himself into the Tiber. 48. But this furious impulse subsiding, he wished for some place of privacy, where he might collect his thoughts. And his freedman Phaon offering him his country house, between the Salarian 625 and Nomentan 626 roads, about four miles from the city, he mounted a horse, barefoot as he was, and in his tunic, only slipping over it an old soiled cloak. With his head muffled up, and an handkerchief before his face, and four persons only to attend him, of whom Sporus was one. He was suddenly struck with horror by an earthquake, and by a flash of lightning which darted full in his face, and heard from the neighbouring camp 627 the shouts of the soldiers, wishing his destruction, and prosperity to Galba. He also heard a traveller they met on the road, say, they are in pursuit of Nero, and another ask, is there any news in the city about Nero? Uncovering his face when his horse was started by the scent of a carcass which lay in the road, he was recognized and saluted by an old soldier who had been discharged from the guards. When they came to the lane which turned up to the house, they quitted their horses, and with much difficulty he wound among bushes, and briars, and along a track through a bed of rushes, over which they spread their cloaks for him to walk on. Having reached a wall at the back of the villa, Phaon advised him to hide himself a while in a sandpit, when he replied, I will not go underground alive. Staying there some little time, while preparations were made for bringing him privately into the villa, he took up some water out of a neighboring tank in his hand, to drink, saying, This is Nero's distilled water. 628 Then his cloak having been torn by the brambles, he pulled out the thorns which stuck in it. At last, being admitted, creeping upon his hands and knees, through a hole made for him in the wall, he lay down in the first closet he came to, upon a miserable pallet, with an old coverlet thrown over it. And being both hungry and thirsty, though he refused some coarse bread that was brought him, he drank a little warm water. 49. All who surrounded him now pressing him to save himself from the indignities which were ready to befall him, he ordered a pit to be sunk before his eyes, of the size of his body, and the bottom to be covered with pieces of marble put together. If any could be found about the house. And water and wood 629, to be got ready for immediate use about his corpse, weeping at everything that was done, and frequently saying, what an artist is now about to perish. Meanwhile, letters being brought in by a servant belonging to Phaon, he snatched them out of his hand, and there read, that he had been declared an enemy by the Senate, and that search was making for him. That he might be punished according to the ancient custom of the Romans. He then inquired what kind of punishment that was. And being told, that the practice was to strip the criminal naked, and scourge him to death, while his neck was fastened within a forked stake, he was so terrified that he took up two daggers which he had brought with him. And after feeling the points of both, put them up again, saying, 
the fatal hour is not yet come. One while, he begged of Sporus to begin to wail and lament, another while, he entreated that one of them would set him an example by killing himself. And then again, he condemned his own want of resolution in these words, I yet live to my shame and disgrace, this is not becoming for Nero, it is not becoming. Thou oughtest in such circumstances to have a good heart, come, then, courage, man. 630 The horsemen who had received orders to bring him away alive, were now approaching the house. As soon as he heard them coming, he uttered with a trembling voice the following verse. Hippon M. O Cupidon Amphi Tupos Wada Balle. 631. The noise of swift heeled steeds assails my ears. He drove a dagger into his throat, being assisted in the act by Epaphroditus, his secretary. A centurion bursting in just as he was half dead, and applying his cloak to the wound, pretending that he was come to his assistance, he made no other reply but this, tis too late, and, is this your loyalty? Immediately after pronouncing these words, he expired, with his eyes fixed and starting out of his head, to the terror of all who beheld him. He had requested of his attendants, as the most essential favor, that they would let no one have his head, but that by all means his body might be burnt entire. And this, Isilus, Galba's freedman, granted. He had but a little before been discharged from the prison into which he had been thrown, when the disturbances first broke out. L. The expenses of his funeral amounted to two hundred thousand sesterces. The bed upon which his body was carried to the pile and burnt, being covered with the white robes, interwoven with gold, which he had worn upon the calends of January preceding. His nurses, Eclosia and Alexandra, with his concubine act, deposited his remains in the tomb belonging to the family of the Domitii, which stands upon the top of the hill of the garden 632, and is to be seen from the campus Martius. In that monument, a coffin of porphyry, with an altar of marble of Luna over it, is enclosed by a wall built of stone brought from Thassos.633. Lee. In stature he was a little below the common height, his skin was foul and spotted. His hair inclined to yellow, his features were agreeable, rather than handsome, his eyes grey and dull, his neck was thick, his belly prominent, his legs very slender, his constitution sound. For, though excessively luxurious in his mode of living, he had, in the course of fourteen years, only three fits of sickness, which were so slight, that he neither forbore the use of wine, nor made any alteration in his usual diet. In his dress, and the care of his person, he was so careless, that he had his hair cut in rings, one above another, and when in Achaia, he let it grow long behind. And he generally appeared in public in the loose dress which he used at table, with a handkerchief about his neck, and without either a girdle or shoes. Aii, ai, he was instructed, when a boy, in the rudiments of almost all the liberal sciences. But his mother diverted him from the study of philosophy, as unsuited to one destined to be an emperor, and his preceptor, Seneca, discouraged him from reading the ancient orators, that he might longer secure his devotion to himself. Therefore, having a turn for poetry, he composed verses both with pleasure and ease, nor did he, as some think, publish those of other writers as his own. Several little pocket books and loose sheets have come into my possession, which contain some well known verses in his own hand, and written in such a manner, that it was very evident, from the blotting and interlining, that they had not been transcribed from a copy, nor dictated by another, but were written by the composer of them. Liii, -I, he had likewise great taste for drawing and painting, as well as for molding statues in plaster. But, above all things, he most eagerly coveted popularity, being the rival of every man who obtained the applause of the people for anything he did. It was the general belief, that, after the crowns he won by his performances on the stage, he would the next lustrum have taken his place among the wrestlers at the Olympic Games. For he was continually practicing that art. Nor did he witness the gymnastic games in any part of Greece otherwise than sitting upon the ground in the stadium, as the umpires do. And if a pair of wrestlers happened to break the bounds, he would with his own hands drag them back into the center of the circle. Because he was thought to equal Apollo in music, and the sun in chariot driving, he resolved also to imitate the achievements of Hercules. 
and they say that a lion was got ready for him to kill, either with a club, or with a close hug, in view of the people in the amphitheater, which he was to perform naked. Live. Towards the end of his life, he publicly vowed, that if his power in the state was securely re-established, he would, in the spectacles which he intended to exhibit in honor of his success, include a performance upon organ 634. As well as upon flutes and bagpipes, and, on the last day of the games, would act in the play, and take the part of Turnus, as we find it in Virgil. And there are some who say, that he put to death the player Paris as a dangerous rival. L.V. He had an insatiable desire to immortalize his name, and acquire a reputation which should last through all succeeding ages. But it was capriciously directed. He therefore took from several things and places their former appellations, and gave them new names derived from his own. He called the month of April, Neronius, and designed changing the name of Rome into that of Neropolis. LVI, he held all religious rites in contempt, except those of the Syrian goddess 635. But at last he paid her so little reverence, that he made water upon her, being now engaged in another superstition, in which only he obstinately persisted. For having received from some obscure plebeian a little image of a girl, as a preservative against plots, and discovering a conspiracy immediately after, he constantly worshipped his imaginary protectress as the greatest amongst the gods. Offering to her three sacrifices daily. He was also desirous to have it supposed that he had, by revelations from this deity, a knowledge of future events. A few months before he died, he attended a sacrifice, according to the Etruscan rites, but the omens were not favorable. 57. He died in the thirty-second year of his age 636, upon the same day on which he had formerly put Octavia to death, and the public joy was so great upon the occasion, that the common people ran about the city with caps upon their heads. Some, however, were not wanting, who for a long time decked his tomb with spring and summer flowers. Sometimes they placed his image upon the rostra, dressed in robes of state. At another, they published proclamations in his name, as if he were still alive, and would shortly return to Rome, and take vengeance on all his enemies. Vologesus, king of the Parthians, when he sent ambassadors to the Senate to renew his alliance with the Roman people, earnestly requested that due honor should be paid to the memory of Nero. And, to conclude, when, twenty years afterwards, at which time I was a young man 637, some person of obscure birth gave himself out for Nero, that name secured him so favorable a reception from the Parthians, that he was very zealously supported. And it was with much difficulty that they were prevailed upon to give him up. Remarks on the Life and Times of Nero Though no law had ever passed for regulating the transmission of the imperial power, yet the design of conveying it by lineal descent was implied in the practice of adoption. By the rule of hereditary succession, Britannicus, the son of Claudius, was the natural heir to the throne, but he was supplanted by the artifices of his stepmother, who had the address to procure it for her own son, Nero. From the time of Augustus it had been the custom of each of the new sovereigns to commence his reign in such a manner as tended to acquire popularity, however much they all afterwards degenerated from those specious beginnings. Whether this proceeded entirely from policy, or that nature was not yet vitiated by the intoxication of uncontrolled power, is uncertain. But such were the excesses into which they afterwards plunged, that we can scarcely exempt any of them, except, perhaps, Claudius, from the imputation of great original depravity. The vicious temper of Tiberius was known to his own mother, Livia. That of Caligula had been obvious to those about him from his infancy, Claudius seems to have had naturally a stronger tendency to weakness than to vice, but the inherent wickedness of Nero was discovered at an early period by his preceptor, Seneca. Yet even this emperor commenced his reign in a manner which procured him approbation. Of all the Roman emperors who had hitherto reigned, he seems to have been most corrupted by profligate favorites, who flattered his follies and vices, to promote their own aggrandizement. In the number of these was Tigellinus, who met at last with the fate which he had so amply merited. The several reigns from the death of Augustus present us with uncommon scenes of cruelty and horror. 
but it was reserved for that of Nero to exhibit to the world the atrocious act of an emperor deliberately procuring the death of his mother. Julia Agrippina was the daughter of Germanicus, and married Domitius Enobarbus, by whom she had Nero. At the death of Messalina she was a widow. And Claudius, her uncle, entertaining a design of entering again into the married state, she aspired to an incestuous alliance with him, in competition with Lalia Paulina, a woman of beauty and intrigue, who had been married to see Caesar. The two rivals were strongly supported by their respective parties, but Agrippina, by her superior interest with the emperor's favorites, and the familiarity to which her near relation gave her a claim, obtained the preference. And the portentous nuptials of the emperor and his niece were publicly solemnized in the palace. Whether she was prompted to this flagrant indecency by personal ambition alone, or by the desire of procuring the succession to the empire for her son, is uncertain. But there remains no doubt of her having removed Claudius by poison, with a view to the object now mentioned. Besides Claudius, she projected the death of L. Silanus, and she accomplished that of his brother, Junius Silanus, by means likewise of poison. She appears to have been richly endowed with the gifts of nature, but in her disposition intriguing, violent, imperious, and ready to sacrifice every principle of virtue, in the pursuit of supreme power or sensual gratification. As she resembled Livia in the ambition of a mother, and the means by which she indulged it, so she more than equaled her in the ingratitude of an unnatural son and a parricide. She is said to have left behind her some memoirs, of which Tacitus availed himself in the composition of his annals. In this reign, the conquest of the Britons still continued to be the principal object of military enterprise, and Suetonius Paulinus was invested with the command of the Roman army employed in the reduction of that people. The island of Mona, now Anglesey, being the chief seat of the Druids, he resolved to commence his operations with attacking a place which was the centre of superstition, and to which the vanquished Britons retreated as the last asylum of liberty. The inhabitants endeavoured, both by force of arms and the terrors of religion, to obstruct his landing on this sacred island. The women and druids assembled promiscuously with the soldiers upon the shore, were running about in wild disorder, with flaming torches in their hands, and pouring forth the most hideous exclamations, they struck the Romans with consternation. But Suetonius animating his troops, they boldly attacked the inhabitants, routed them in the field, and burned the Druids in the same fires which had been prepared by those priests for the catastrophe of the invaders. Destroying at the same time all the consecrated groves and altars in the island. Suetonius having thus triumphed over the religion of the Britons, flattered himself with the hopes of soon effecting the reduction of the people. But they, encouraged by his absence, had taken arms, and under the conduct of Boadicea, queen of the Iceni, who had been treated in the most ignominious manner by the Roman tribunes, had already driven the hateful invaders from their several settlements. Suetonius hastened to the protection of London, which was by this time a flourishing Roman colony, but he found upon his arrival, that any attempt to preserve it would be attended with the utmost danger to the army. London therefore was reduced to ashes. And the Romans, and all strangers, to the number of seventy thousand, were put to the sword without distinction, the Britons seeming determined to convince the enemy that they would acquiesce in no other terms than a total evacuation of the island. This massacre, however, was revenged by Suetonius in a decisive engagement, where eighty thousand of the Britons are said to have been killed. After which, Boadicea, to avoid falling into the hands of the insolent conquerors, put a period to her own life by means of poison. It being judged unadvisable that Suetonius should any longer conduct the war against a people whom he had exasperated by his severity, he was recalled, and Petronius Terpilianus appointed in his room. The command was afterwards given successively to Trebellius Maximus and Vettius Bolanus. But the plan pursued by these generals was only to retain, by a conciliatory administration, the parts of the island which had already submitted to the Roman arms. During these transactions in Britain, Nero himself was exhibiting, in Rome or some of the provinces, such scenes of extravagance as almost exceed credibility. In one place, entering the lists amongst the competitors in a chariot race. In another, contending for victory with the common musicians on the stage, 
reveling in open day in the company of the most abandoned prostitutes and the vilest of men. In the night, committing depredations on the peaceful inhabitants of the capital, polluting with detestable lust, or drenching with human blood, the streets, the palace, and the habitations of private families. And, to crown his enormities, setting fire to Rome, while he sung with delight in beholding the dreadful conflagration. In vain would history be ransacked for a parallel to this emperor, who united the most shameful vices to the most extravagant vanity, the most abject meanness to the strongest but most preposterous ambition. And the whole of whose life was one continued scene of lewdness, sensuality, rapine, cruelty, and folly. It is emphatically observed by Tacitus, that Nero, after the murder of many illustrious personages, manifested a desire of extirpating virtue itself. Among the excesses of Nero's reign, are to be mentioned the horrible cruelties exercised against the Christians in various parts of the empire. In which in human transactions the natural barbarity of the emperor was inflamed by the prejudices and interested policy of the pagan priesthood. The tyrant scrupled not to charge them with the act of burning Rome, and he satiated his fury against them by such outrages as are unexampled in history. They were covered with the skins of wild beasts, and torn by dogs. Were crucified, and set on fire, that they might serve for lights in the night time. Nero offered his gardens for this spectacle, and exhibited the games of the circus by this dreadful illumination. Sometimes they were covered with wax and other combustible materials, after which a sharp stake was put under their chin, to make them stand upright, and they were burnt alive, to give light to the spectators. In the person of Nero, it is observed by Suetonius, the race of the Caesars became extinct, a race rendered illustrious by the first and second emperors, but which their successors no less disgraced. The despotism of Julius Caesar, though haughty and imperious, was liberal and humane, that of Augustus, if we exclude a few instances of vindictive severity towards individuals, was mild and conciliating. But the reigns of Tiberius, Caligula, and Nero, for we accept Claudius from part of the censure, while discriminated from each other by some peculiar circumstances, exhibited the most flagrant acts of licentiousness and perverted authority. The most abominable lust, the most extravagant luxury, the most shameful rapaciousness, and the most inhuman cruelty, constitute the general characteristics of those capricious and detestable tyrants. Repeated experience now clearly refuted the opinion of Augustus, that he had introduced amongst the Romans the best form of government, but while we make this observation, it is proper to remark, that, had he even restored the Republic, there is reason to believe that the nation would again have been soon distracted with internal divisions, and a perpetual succession of civil wars. The manners of the people were become too dissolute to be restrained by the authority of elective and temporary magistrates. And the Romans were hastening to that fatal period when general and great corruption, with its attendant debility, would render them an easy prey to any foreign invaders. But the odious government of the emperors was not the only grievance under which the people labored in those disastrous times, patrician avarice concurred with imperial rapacity to increase the sufferings of the nation. The senators, even during the commonwealth, had become openly corrupt in the dispensation of public justice, and under the government of the emperor's pernicious abuse was practiced to a yet greater extent. That class being now, equally with other Roman citizens, dependent on the sovereign power, their sentiments of duty and honor were degraded by the loss of their former dignity. And being likewise deprived of the lucrative governments of provinces, to which they had annually succeeded by an elective rotation in the times of the Republic. They endeavored to compensate the reduction of their emoluments by an unbounded venality in the judicial decisions of the Forum. Every source of national happiness and prosperity was by this means destroyed. The possession of property became precarious. Industry, in all its branches, was effectually discouraged, and the amor patri, which had formerly been the animating principle of the nation, was almost universally extinguished. It is a circumstance corresponding to the general singularity of the present reign, that, of the few writers who flourished in it, and whose works have been transmitted to posterity, two ended their days by the order of the emperor, and the third, from indignation at his conduct. These unfortunate victims were Seneca, Petronius Arbiter, and Lucan. Seneca was born about six years before the Christian era, 
and gave early indication of uncommon talents. His father, who had come from Cordoba to Rome, was a man of letters, particularly fond of declamation, in which he instructed his son, and placed him, for the acquisition of philosophy, under the most celebrated Stoics of that age. Young Seneca, imbibing the precepts of the Pythagorean doctrine, religiously abstained from eating the flesh of animals, until Tiberius having threatened to punish some Jews and Egyptians, who abstained from certain meats. He was persuaded by his father to renounce the Pythagorean practice. Seneca displayed the talents of an eloquent speaker, but dreading the jealousy of Caligula, who aspired to the same excellence, he thought proper to abandon that pursuit, and apply himself towards suing for the honours and offices of the state. He accordingly obtained the place of quester, in which office incurring the imputation of a scandalous amour with Julia Livia, he removed from Rome, and was banished by the emperor Claudius to Corsica. Upon the marriage of Claudius with Agrippina, Seneca was recalled from his exile, in which he had remained near eight years, and was appointed to superintend the education of Nero, now destined to become the successor to the throne. In the character of preceptor he appears to have acquitted himself with ability and credit, though he has been charged by his enemies with having initiated his pupil in those detestable vices which disgraced the reign of Nero. Could he have indeed been guilty of such a moral conduct, it is probable that he would not so easily have forfeited the favour of that emperor. And it is more reasonable to suppose, that his disapprobation of Nero's conduct was the real cause of that odium which soon after proved fatal to him. By the enemies whom distinguished merit and virtue never fail to excite at a profligate court, Seneca was accused of having maintained a criminal correspondence with Agrippina in the lifetime of Claudius. But the chief author of this calumny was Suilius, who had been banished from Rome at the instance of Seneca. He was likewise charged with having amassed exorbitant riches, with having built magnificent houses, and formed beautiful gardens, during the four years in which he had acted as preceptor to Nero. This charge he considered as a prelude to his destruction. Which to avoid, if possible, he requested of the emperor to accept of the riches and possessions which he had acquired in his situation at court, and to permit him to withdraw himself into a life of studious retirement. Nero, dissembling his secret intentions, refused this request, and Seneca, that he might obviate all cause of suspicion or offence, kept himself at home for some time, under the pretext of indisposition. Upon the breaking out of the conspiracy of Piso, in which some of the principal senators were concerned, Natales, the discoverer of the plot, mentioned Seneca's name, as an accessory. There is, however, no satisfactory evidence that Seneca had any knowledge of the plot. Piso, according to the declaration of Natales, had complained that he never saw Seneca. And the latter had observed, in answer, that it was not conducive to their common interest to see each other often. Seneca likewise pleaded indisposition, and said that his own life depended upon the safety of Piso's person. Nero, however, glad of such an occasion of sacrificing the philosopher to his secret jealousy, sent him an order to destroy himself. When the messenger arrived with this mandate, Seneca was sitting at table, with his wife Paulina and two of his friends. He heard the message not only with philosophical firmness, but even with symptoms of joy, and observed, that such an honour might long have been expected from a man who had assassinated all his friends, and even murdered his own mother. The only request which he made, was, that he might be permitted to dispose of his possessions as he pleased, but this was refused him. Immediately turning himself to his friends, who were weeping at his melancholy fate, he said to them, that, since he could not leave them what he considered as his own property, he should leave at least his own life for an example. An innocence of conduct which they might imitate, and by which they might acquire immortal fame. He remonstrated with composure against their unavailing tears and lamentations, and asked them, whether they had not learnt better to sustain the shocks of fortune, and the violence of tyranny. The emotions of his wife he endeavoured to allay with philosophical consolation, and when she expressed a resolution to die with him, he said, that he was glad to find his example imitated with so much fortitude. The veins of both were opened at the same time, but Nero's command extending only to Seneca, the life of Paulina was preserved. And, according to some authors, she was not displeased at being prevented from carrying her precipitate resolution into effect. 
Seneca's veins bleeding but slowly, an opportunity was offered him of displaying in his last moments a philosophical magnanimity similar to that of Socrates. And it appears that his conversation during this solemn period was maintained with dignified composure. To accelerate his lingering fate, he drank a dose of poison. But this producing no effect, he ordered his attendants to carry him into a warm bath, for the purpose of rendering the hemorrhage from his veins more copious. This expedient proving likewise ineffectual, and the soldiers who witnessed the execution of the emperor's order being clamorous for its accomplishment, he was removed into a stove, and suffocated by the steam. He underwent his fate on the 12th of April, in the 65th year of the Christian era, and the 53rd year of his age. His body was burnt, and his ashes deposited in a private manner, according to his will, which had been made during the period when he was in the highest degree of favor with Nero. The writings of Seneca are numerous, and on various subjects. His first composition, addressed to Novacus, is on anger, and continued through three books. After giving a lively description of this passion, the author discusses a variety of questions concerning it, he argues strongly against its utility, in contradiction to the peripatetics, and recommends its restraint. By many just and excellent considerations. This treatise may be regarded, in its general outlines, as a philosophical amplification of the passage in Horace. Ira Fuhrer Brevis est, animum rege, ca, nisi peret. Imperat, hunc frianus, hunc tu compes catina. Epis thy, too. Angers a fitful madness, reign thy mind. Subdue the tyrant, and in fetters bind. Or be thyself the slave. The next treatise is on consolation, addressed to his mother, Helvia, and was written during his exile. He there informs his mother that he bears his banishment with fortitude, and advises her to do the same. He observes, that, in respect to himself, change of place, poverty, ignominy, and contempt, are not real evils. That there may be two reasons for her anxiety on his account, first, that, by his absence, she is deprived of his protection, and in the next place, of the satisfaction arising from his company. On both which heads he suggests a variety of pertinent observations. Prefixed to this treatise, are some epigrams written on the banishment of Seneca, but whether or not by himself, is uncertain. Immediately subsequent to the preceding, is another treatise on consolation, addressed to one of Claudius's freedmen, named Polybius, perhaps after the learned historian. In this tract, which is in several parts mutilated, the author endeavors to console Polybius for the loss of a brother who had lately died. The sentiments and admonitions are well suggested for the purpose. But they are intermixed with such fulsome encomiums on the imperial domestic, as degrade the dignity of the author, and can be ascribed to no other motive than that of endeavoring to procure a recall from his exile. Through the interest of Polybius. A fourth treatise on consolation is addressed to Marcia, a respectable and opulent lady, the daughter of Cremutius Cordus, by whose death she was deeply affected. The author, besides many consolatory arguments, proposes for her imitation a number of examples, by attending to which she may be enabled to overcome a passion that is founded only in too great sensibility of mind. The subject is ingeniously prosecuted, not without the occasional mixture of some delicate flattery, suitable to the character of the correspondent. These consolatory addresses are followed by a treatise on providence, which evinces the author to have entertained the most just and philosophical sentiments on that subject. He infers the necessary existence of a providence from the regularity and constancy observed in the government of the universe but his chief object is to show, why, upon the principle that a providence exists, good men should be liable to evils. The inquiry is conducted with a variety of just observations, and great force of argument. By which the author vindicates the goodness and wisdom of the Almighty, in a strain of sentiment corresponding to the most approved suggestions of natural religion. The next treatise, which is on tranquility of mind, appears to have been written soon after his return from exile. There is a confusion in the arrangement of this tract. But it contains a variety of just observations, and may be regarded as a valuable production. Then follows a discourse on the constancy of a wise man. This has by some been considered as a part of the preceding treatise. 
but they are evidently distinct. It is one of the author's best productions, in regard both of sentiment and composition, and contains a fund of moral observations, suited to fortify the mind under the oppression of accidental calamities. We next meet with a tract on clemency, in two books, addressed to Nero. This appears to have been written in the beginning of the reign of Nero, on whom the author bestows some high encomiums, which, at that time, seem not to have been destitute of foundation. The discourse abounds with just observation, applicable to all ranks of men. And, if properly attended to by that infatuated emperor, might have prevented the perpetration of those acts of cruelty, which, with his other extravagancies, have rendered his name odious to posterity. The discourse which succeeds is on the shortness of life, addressed to Paulinus. In this excellent treatise the author endeavors to show, that the complaint of the shortness of life is not founded in truth, that it is men who make life short, either by passing it in indolence, or otherwise improperly. He inveighs against indolence, luxury, and every unprofitable avocation, observing, that the best use of time is to apply it to the study of wisdom, by which life may be rendered sufficiently long. Next follows a discourse on a happy life, addressed to Gallio. Seneca seems to have intended this as a vindication of himself, against those who calumniated him on account of his riches and manner of living. He maintained that a life can only be rendered happy by its conformity to the dictates of virtue, but that such a life is perfectly compatible with the possession of riches, where they happen to accrue. The author pleads his own cause with great ability, as well as justness of argument. His vindication is in many parts highly beautiful, and accompanied with admirable sentiments respecting the moral obligations to a virtuous life. The conclusion of this discourse bears no similarity, in point of composition, to the preceding parts, and is evidently spurious. The preceding discourse is followed by one upon the retirement of a wise man. The beginning of this tract is wanting. But in the sequel the author discusses a question which was much agitated amongst the Stoics and Epicureans, viz., whether a wise man ought to concern himself with the affairs of the public. Both these sects of philosophers maintained that a life of retirement was most suitable to a wise man, but they differed with respect to the circumstances in which it might be proper to deviate from this conduct. One party considering the deviation as prudent, when there existed a just motive for such conduct, and the other, when there was no forcible reason against it. Seneca regards both these opinions as founded upon principles inadequate to the advancement both of public and private happiness, which ought ever to be the ultimate object of moral speculation. The last of the author's discourses, addressed to Abucius, is on benefits, and continued through seven books. He begins with lamenting the frequency of ingratitude amongst mankind, a vice which he severely censures. After some preliminary considerations respecting the nature of benefits, he proceeds to show in what manner, and on whom, they ought to be conferred. The greater part of these books is employed on the solution of abstract questions relative to benefits, in the manner of Chrysippus. Where the author states explicitly the arguments on both sides, and from the full consideration of them, deduces rational conclusions. The epistles of Seneca consist of 124, all on moral subjects. His natural questions extend through seven books, in which he has collected the hypotheses of Aristotle and other ancient writers. These are followed by a whimsical effusion on the death of Caligula. The remainder of his works comprises seven persuasive discourses, five books of controversies, and ten books containing extracts of declamations. From the multiplicity of Seneca's productions, it is evident, that, notwithstanding the luxurious life he is said to have led, he was greatly devoted to literature, a propensity which, it is probable, was confirmed by his banishment during almost eight years in the island of Corsica, where he was in a great degree secluded from every other resource of amusement to a cultivated mind. But with whatever splendor Seneca's domestic economy may have been supported, it seems highly improbable that he indulged himself in luxurious enjoyment to any vicious excess. His situation at the Roman court, being honorable and important, could not fail of being likewise advantageous, not only from the imperial profusion common at that time, but from many contingent emoluments which his extensive interest and patronage would naturally afford him. He was born of a respectable rank, 
lived in habits of familiar intercourse with persons of the first distinction, and if, in the course of his attendance upon Nero, he had acquired a large fortune. No blame could justly attach to his conduct in maintaining an elegant hospitality. The imputation of luxury was thrown upon him from two quarters, viz., by the dissolute companions of Nero, to whom the mention of such an example served as an apology for their own extreme dissipation. And by those who envied him for the affluence and dignity which he had acquired. The charge, however, is supported only by vague assertion, and is discredited by every consideration which ought to have weight in determining the reality of human characters. It seems totally inconsistent with his habits of literary industry, with the virtuous sentiments which he everywhere strenuously maintains, and the esteem with which he was regarded by a numerous acquaintance, as a philosopher and a moralist. The writings of Seneca have been traduced almost equally with his manner of living, though in both he has a claim to indulgence, from the fashion of the times. He is more studious of minute embellishments in style than the writers of the Augustan age, and the didactic strain, in which he mostly prosecutes his subjects, has a tendency to render him sententious. But the expression of his thoughts is neither enfeebled by decoration, nor involved in obscurity by conciseness. He is not more rich in artificial ornament than in moral admonition. Seneca has been charged with depreciating former writers, to render himself more conspicuous, a charge which, so far as appears from his writings, is founded rather in negative than positive testimony. He has not endeavored to establish his fame by any affectation of singularity in doctrine. And while he passes over in silence the names of illustrious authors, he avails himself with judgment of the most valuable stores with which they had enriched philosophy. On the whole, he is an author whose principles may be adopted not only with safety, but great advantage, and his writings merit a degree of consideration, superior to what they have hitherto ever enjoyed in the literary world. Seneca, besides his prose works, was the author of some tragedies. The Medea, the Troas, and the Hippolytus, are ascribed to him. His father is said to have written the Hercules Furens, Thyestes, Agamemnon, and Hercules Aedius. The three remaining tragedies, the Thebes, Oedipus, and Octavia, usually published in the same collection with the seven preceding, are supposed to be the productions of other authors, but of whom, is uncertain. These several pieces are written in a neat style. The plots and characters are conducted with an attention to probability and nature, but none of them is so forcible, in point of tragical distress, as to excite in the reader any great degree of emotion. Petronius was a Roman knight, and apparently of considerable fortune. In his youth he seems to have given great application to polite literature, in which he acquired a justness of taste, as well as an elegance of composition. Early initiated in the gaieties of fashionable life, he contracted a habit of voluptuousness which rendered him an accommodating companion to the dissipated and the luxurious. The court of Claudius, entirely governed for some time by Messalina, was then the residence of pleasure, and here Petronius failed not of making a conspicuous appearance. More delicate, however, than sensual, he rather joined in the dissipation, than indulged in the vices of the palace. To interrupt a course of life too uniform to afford him perpetual satisfaction, he accepted of the proconsulship of Bithynia, and went to that province, where he discharged the duties of his office with great credit. Upon his return to Rome, Nero, who had succeeded Claudius, made him consul, in recompense of his services. This new dignity, by giving him frequent and easy access to the emperor, created an intimacy between them, which was increased to friendship and esteem on the side of Nero, by the elegant entertainments often given him by Petronius. In a short time, this gay voluptuary became so much a favorite at court, that nothing was agreeable but what was approved by Petronius and the authority which he acquired, by being umpire in whatever related to the economy of gay dissipation. Procured him the title of Arbiter Elegantiarum. Things continued in this state whilst the emperor kept within the bounds of moderation. And Petronius acted as intendant of his pleasures, ordering him shows, games, comedies, music, feats, and all that could contribute to make the hours of relaxation pass agreeably. Seasoning, at the same time, the innocent delights which he procured for the emperor with every possible charm, 
to prevent him from seeking after such as might prove pernicious both to morals and the Republic. Nero, however, giving way to his own disposition, which was naturally vicious, at length changed his conduct, not only in regard to the government of the empire, but of himself and listening to other counsels than those of Petronius. Gave the entire reins to his passions, which afterwards plunged him in ruin. The emperor's new favorite was Tigellinus, a man of the most profligate morals, who omitted nothing that could gratify the inordinate appetites of his prince, at the expense of all decency in virtue. During this period, Petronius gave vent to his indignation, in the satire transmitted under his name by the title of Satyricon. But his total retirement from court did not secure him from the artifices of Tigellinus, who labored with all his power to destroy the man whom he had industriously supplanted in the emperor's favor. With this view he insinuated to Nero, that Petronius was too intimately connected with Savinus not to be engaged in Piso's conspiracy. And, to support his calumny, caused the emperor to be present at the examination of one of Petronius's slaves, whom he had secretly suborned to swear against his master. After this transaction, to deprive Petronius of all means of justifying himself, they threw into prison the greatest part of his domestics. Nero embraced with joy the opportunity of removing a man, to whom he knew the present manners of the court were utterly obnoxious, and he soon after issued orders for arresting Petronius. As it required, however, some time to deliberate whether they should put a person of his consideration to death, without more evident proofs of the charges preferred against him. Such was his disgust at living in the power of so detestable and capricious a tyrant, that he resolved to die. For this purpose, making choice of the same expedient which had been adopted by Seneca, he caused his veins to be opened, but he closed them again, for a little time, that he might enjoy the conversation of his friends. Who came to see him in his last moments? He desired them, it is said, to entertain him, not with discourses on the immortality of the soul, or the consolation of philosophy, but with agreeable tales and poetic gallantries. Disdaining to imitate the servility of those who, dying by the orders of Nero, yet made him their heir, and filled their wills with encomiums on the tyrant and his favorites, he broke to pieces a goblet of precious stones. Out of which he had commonly drank, that Nero, who he knew would seize upon it after his death, might not have the pleasure of using it. As the only present suitable to such a prince, he sent him, under a sealed cover, his satyricon, written purposely against him. And then broke his signet, that it might not, after his death, become the means of accusation against the person in whose custody it should be found. The Satyricon of Petronius is one of the most curious productions in the Latin language. Novel in its nature, and without any parallel in the works of antiquity, some have imagined it to be a spurious composition, fabricated about the time of the revival of learning in Europe. This conjecture, however, is not more destitute of support, than repugnant to the most circumstantial evidence in favor of its authenticity. Others, admitting the work to be a production of the age of Nero, have questioned the design with which it was written, and have consequently imputed to the author a most immoral intention. Some of the scenes, incidents, and characters, are of so extraordinary a nature, that the description of them, without a particular application, must have been regarded as extremely whimsical, and the work, notwithstanding its ingenuity, has been doomed to perpetual oblivion, but history justifies the belief, that in the court of Nero, the extravagancies mentioned by Petronius were realized to a degree which authenticates the representation given of them. The inimitable character of Trimalchio, which exhibits a person sunk in the most debauched effeminacy, was drawn for Nero, and we are assured, that there were formerly medals of that emperor, with these words, see, Nero August. Imp. And on the reverse, Trimalchio. The various characters are well discriminated, and supported with admirable propriety. Never was such licentiousness of description united to such delicacy of coloring. The force of the satire consists not in poignancy of sentiment, but in the ridicule which arises from the whimsical, but characteristic and faithful exhibition of the objects introduced. That Nero was struck with the justness of the representation, is evident from the displeasure which he showed, at finding Petronius so well acquainted with his infamous excesses. After leveling his suspicion on all who could possibly have betrayed him, 
he at last fixed on a senator's wife, named Cilia, who bore a part in his revels, and was an intimate friend of Petronius upon which she was immediately sent into banishment. Amongst the miscellaneous materials in this work, are some pieces of poetry, written in an elegant taste. A poem on the civil war between Caesar and Pompey, is beautiful and animated. Though the muses appear to have been mostly in a quiescent state from the time of Augustus, we find from Petronius Arbiter, who exhibits the manners of the capital during the reign of Nero. That poetry still continued to be a favorite pursuit amongst the Romans, and one to which, indeed, they seem to have had a national propensity. Ecce inter pocula quaerunt. Romulidae saturi, quid dia poemata narent. Perseus, Saturday I, 30. Nay, more. Our nobles, gorged, and swillied with wine. Call o'er the banquet for a lay divine, Gifford. It was cultivated as a kind of fashionable exercise, in short and desultory attempts, in which the chief ambition was to produce verses extempore. They were publicly recited by their authors with great ostentation. And a favorable verdict from an audience, however partial, and frequently obtained either by intrigue or bribery, was construed by those frivolous pretenders into a real adjudication of poetical fame. The custom of publicly reciting poetical compositions, with the view of obtaining the opinion of the hearers concerning them, and for which purpose Augustus had built the Temple of Apollo, was well calculated for the improvement of taste and judgment, as well as the excitement of emulation. But, conducted as it now was, it led to a general degradation of poetry. Barbarism in language, and a corruption of taste, were the natural consequences of this practice, while the judgment of the multitude was either blind or venal, and while public approbation sanctioned the crudities of hasty composition. There arose, however, in this period, some candidates for the bays, who carried their efforts beyond the narrow limits which custom and inadequate genius prescribed to the poetical exertions of their contemporaries. Amongst these were Lucan and Perseus. Lucan was the son of Aeneas Mela, the brother of Seneca, the philosopher. He was born at Corduba, the original residence of the family, but came early to Rome, where his promising talents, and the patronage of his uncle, recommended him to the favor of Nero. By whom he was raised to the dignity of an augur and quester before he had attained the usual age. Prompted by the desire of displaying his political abilities, he had the imprudence to engage in a competition with his imperial patron. The subject chosen by Nero was the tragical fate of Niobe, and that of Lucan was Orpheus. The ease with which the latter obtained the victory in the contest, excited the jealousy of the emperor, who resolved upon depressing his rising genius. With this view, he exposed him daily to the mortification of fresh insults, until at last the poet's resentment was so much provoked, that he entered into the conspiracy of Piso for cutting off the tyrant. The plot being discovered, there remained for the unfortunate Lucan no hope of pardon, and choosing the same mode of death which was employed by his uncle, he had his veins opened, while he sat in a warm bath. And expired in pronouncing with great emphasis the following lines in his Pharsalia. Cindidor avulsus. NEC sicket vulnere sanguis. Emicute lentis, ruptus cadet undic venis. Discursus ganime diversa in membra mintis. Interceptus aquis, nalaius, vita peremti. Est tanta dimisa via, lib. 3. 638. Asunder flies the man. No single wound the gaping rupture seems. Where trickling crimson flows in tender streams. But from an opening horrible and wide. A thousand vessels pour the bursting tide. At once the winding channel's course was broke. Where wandering life her mazy journey took. Ro. Some authors have said that he betrayed pusillanimity at the hour of death. And that, to save himself from punishment, he accused his mother of being involved in the conspiracy. This circumstance, however, is not mentioned by other writers, who relate, on the contrary, that he died with philosophical fortitude. He was then only in the twenty-sixth year of his age. Lucan had scarcely reached the age of puberty when he wrote a poem on the contest between Hector and Achilles. He also composed in his youth a poem on the burning of Rome. 
but his only surviving work is the Pharsalia, written on the civil war between Caesar and Pompey. This poem, consisting of ten books, is unfinished, and its character has been more depreciated than that of any other production of antiquity. In the plan of the poem, the author prosecutes the different events in the civil war, beginning his narrative at the passage of the Rubicon by Caesar. He invokes not the muses, nor engages any gods in the dispute. But endeavors to support an epic dignity by vigor of sentiment, and splendor of description. The horrors of civil war, and the importance of a contest which was to determine the fate of Rome and the empire of the world, are displayed with variety of coloring, and great energy of expression. In the description of scenes, and the recital of heroic actions, the author discovers a strong and lively imagination. While, in those parts of the work which are addressed either to the understanding or the passions, he is bold, figurative, and animated. Indulging too much in amplification, he is apt to tire with prolixity. But in all his excursions he is ardent, elevated, impressive, and often brilliant. His versification has not the smoothness which we admire in the compositions of Virgil, and his language is often involved in the intricacies of technical construction, but with all his defects, his beauties are numerous. And he discovers a greater degree of merit than is commonly found in the productions of a poet of twenty-six years of age, at which time he died. Perseus was born at Voluntary, of an equestrian family, about the beginning of the Christian era. His father dying when he was six years old, he was left to the care of his mother, for whom and for his sisters he expresses the warmest affection. At the age of twelve he came to Rome, where, after attending a course of grammar and rhetoric under the respective masters of those branches of education, he placed himself under the tuition of Aeneas Cornutus, a celebrated Stoic philosopher of that time. There subsisted between him and this preceptor so great a friendship, that at his death, which happened in the twenty-ninth year of his age, he bequeathed to Cornutus a handsome sum of money, and his library. The latter, however, accepting only the books, left the money to Perseus's sisters. Priscian, Quintilian, and other ancient writers, spear of Perseus's satires as consisting of a book without any division. They have since, however, been generally divided into six different satires, but by some only into five. The subjects of these compositions are, the vanity of the poets in his time, the backwardness of youth to the cultivation of moral science. Ignorance and temerity in political administration, chiefly in allusion to the government of Nero, the fifth satire is employed in evincing that the wise man also is free. In discussing which point, the author adopts the observations used by Horace on the same subject. The last satire of Perseus is directed against Avarice. In the fifth, we meet with a beautiful address to Cornutus, whom the author celebrates for his amiable virtues, and peculiar talents for teaching. The following lines, at the same time that they show how diligently the preceptor and his pupil were employed through the whole day in the cultivation of moral science afford a more agreeable picture of domestic comfort and philosophical conviviality, than might be expected in the family of a rigid Stoic. Tecum eaten im longos memini consumer souls. Edi tecum primas epulis de serpera nocts. Unum opus, edi requiem perator disponimus ombo. Ac vericunda laximus feria mensa dot, Saturday v. Can I forget how many a summer's day? spent in your converse, stole, unmarked, away. Or how, while listening with increased delight. I snatched from feasts the earlier hours of night, Gifford. The satires of Perseus are written in a free, expostulatory, and argumentative manner. Possessing the same justness of sentiment as those of Horace, but exerted in the way of derision, and not with the admirable raillery of that facetious author. They are regarded by many as obscure. But this imputation arises more from unacquaintance with the characters and manners to which the author alludes, than from any peculiarity either in his language or composition. His versification is harmonious. And we have only to remark, in addition to similar examples in other Latin writers, that, though Perseus is acknowledged to have been both virtuous and modest, there are in the fourth satire a few passages which cannot decently admit of being translated. Such was the freedom of the Romans, in the use of some expressions, 
which just refinement has now exploded. Dot. Another poet, in this period, was Fabricius Veiento, who wrote a severe satire against the priests of his time. As also one against the senators, for corruption in their judicial capacity. Nothing remains of either of those productions, but, for the latter, the author was banished by Nero. There now likewise flourished a lyric poet, Cesius Bassus, to whom Perseus has addressed his sixth satire. He is said to have been, next to Horace, the best lyric poet among the Romans. But of his various compositions, only a few inconsiderable fragments are preserved. To the two poets now mentioned must be added Pomponius Secundus, a man of distinguished rank in the army, and who obtained the honor of a triumph for a victory over a tribe of barbarians in Germany. He wrote several tragedies, which in the judgment of Quintilian, were beautiful compositions. Sergius Sulpicius Galba I, the race of the Caesars became extinct in Nero, an event prognosticated by various signs, two of which were particularly significant. Formerly, when Livia, after her marriage with Augustus, was making a visit to her villa at VI 638, an eagle flying by, let drop upon her lap a hen, with a sprig of laurel in her mouth, just as she had seized it. Livia gave orders to have the hen taken care of, and the sprig of laurel set, and the hen reared such a numerous brood of chickens, that the villa, to this day, is called the villa of the hen 639. The laurel groves flourished so much, that the Caesars procured thence the boughs and crowns they bore at their triumphs. It was also their constant custom to plant others on the same spot, immediately after a triumph. And it was observed that, a little before the death of each prince, the tree which had been set by him died away. But in the last year of Nero, the whole plantation of laurels perished to the very roots, and the hens all died. About the same time, the temple of the Caesars 640 being struck with lightning, the heads of all the statues in it fell off at once, and Augustus's scepter was dashed from his hands. 2. Nero was succeeded by Galba 641, who was not in the remotest degree allied to the family of the Caesars, but, without doubt, a very noble extraction, being descended from a great and ancient family. For he always used to put amongst his other titles, upon the basis of his statues, his being great-grandson to Q. Catulus Capitolinus. And when he came to be emperor, he set up the images of his ancestors in the hall 642 of the palace according to the inscriptions on which, he carried up his pedigree on the father's side to Jupiter, and by the mother's to Pasiphae, the wife of Minos. 3. To give even a short account of the whole family, would be tedious. I shall, therefore, only slightly notice that branch of it from which he was descended. Why, or whence, the first of the Sulpicii who had the cognomen of Galba, was so called, is uncertain. Some are of opinion, that it was because he set fire to a city in Spain, after he had a long time attacked it to no purpose, with torches dipped in a gum called galbanum, others said he was so named, because, in a lingering disease. He made use of it as a remedy, wrapped up in wool, others, on account of his being prodigiously corpulent, such a one being called, in the language of the Gauls, galba. Or, on the contrary, because he was of a slender habit of body, like those insects which breed in a sort of oak, and are called galbae. Sergius Galba, a person of consular rank 643, and the most eloquent man of his time, gave a luster to the family. History relates, that, when he was propraetor of Spain, he perfidiously put to the sword 30,000 Lusitanians, and by that means gave occasion to the War of Viriatus 644. His grandson being incensed against Julius Caesar, whose lieutenant he had been in Gaul, because he was through him disappointed of the consulship 645, joined with Cassius and Brutus in the conspiracy against him. For which he was condemned by the Pedian law. From him were descended the grandfather and father of the emperor Galba. The grandfather was more celebrated for his application to study, than for any figure he made in the government. For he rose no higher than the praetorship, but published a large and not uninteresting history. His father attained to the consulship 646, he was a short man and humpbacked, but a tolerable orator, and an industrious pleader. He was twice married, the first of his wives was Mummia Achaica, daughter of Catulus, 
and great-granddaughter of Lucius Mummius, who sacked Corinth 647. And the other, Livia Ocelina, a very rich and beautiful woman, by whom it is supposed he was courted for the nobleness of his descent. They say, that she was farther encouraged to persevere in her advances, by an incident which evinced the great ingenuousness of his disposition. Upon her pressing her suit, he took an opportunity, when they were alone, of stripping off his toga, and showing her the deformity of his person, that he might not be thought to impose upon her. He had by Achaica two sons, Caius and Sergius. The elder of these, Caius 648, having very much reduced his estate, retired from town, and being prohibited by Tiberius from standing for a proconsulship in his year, put an end to his own life. 4. The Emperor Sergius Galba was born in the consulship of M. Valerius Messala, and C. N. Lentulus, upon the ninth of the Calends of January, December 24, 649. In a villa standing upon a hill, near Terracina, on the left-hand side of the road to Fundi 650. Being adopted by his step-mother 651, he assumed the name of Livius, with the cognomen of Ocella, and changed his prenomen. For he afterwards used that of Lucius, instead of Sergius, until he arrived at the imperial dignity. It is well known, that when he came once, amongst other boys of his own age, to pay his respects to Augustus, the latter, pinching his cheek, said to him, And thou, child, too, wilt taste our imperial dignity. Tiberius, likewise, being told that he would come to be emperor, but at an advanced age, exclaimed, Let him live, then, since that does not concern me. When his grandfather was offering sacrifice to avert some ill omen from lightning, the entrails of the victim were snatched out of his hand by an eagle, and carried off into an oak tree loaded with acorns. Upon this, the soothsayer said, that the family would come to be masters of the empire, but not until many years had elapsed, at which he, smiling, said, when a mule comes to bear a foal. When Galba first declared against Nero, nothing gave him so much confidence of success, as a mule's happening at that time to have a foal. And whilst all others were shocked at the occurrence, as a most inauspicious prodigy, he alone regarded it as a most fortunate omen, calling to mind the sacrifice and saying of his grandfather. When he took upon him the manly habit, he dreamt that the goddess Fortune said to him, I stand before your door weary, and unless I am speedily admitted, I shall fall into the hands of the first who comes to seize me. On his awaking, when the door of the house was opened, he found a brazen statue of the goddess, above a cubit long, close to the threshold, which he carried with Slim to Tusculum, where he used to pass the summer season. And having consecrated it in an apartment of his house, he ever after worshipped it with a monthly sacrifice, and an anniversary vigil. Though but a very young man, he kept up an ancient but obsolete custom, and now nowhere observed, except in his own family, which was, to have his freedmen and slaves appear in a body before him twice a day, morning and evening. To offer him their salutations. V. Amongst other liberal studies, he applied himself to the law. He married Lepida 652, by whom he had two sons, but the mother and children all dying, he continued a widower. Nor could he be prevailed upon to marry again, not even Agrippina herself, at that time left a widow by the death of Domitius, who had employed all her blandishments to allure him to her embraces, while he was a married man. Insomuch that Lepida's mother, when in company with several married women, rebuked her for it, and even went so far as to cuff her. Most of all, he courted the Empress Livia 653, by whose favor, while she was living, he made a considerable figure, and narrowly missed being enriched by the will which she left at her death. In which she distinguished him from the rest of the legatees, by a legacy of fifty millions of sesterces. But because the sum was expressed in figures, and not in words at length, it was reduced by her heir, Tiberius, to five hundred thousand, and even this he never received. Point six fifty four. Six. Filling the great offices before the age required for it by law, during his praetorship, at the celebration of games in honor of the goddess Flora, he presented the new spectacle of elephants walking upon ropes. He was then governor of the province of Aquitania for near a year, and soon afterwards took the consulship in the usual course, and held it for six months 655. It so happened that he succeeded L. 
Domitius, the father of Nero, and was succeeded by Salvius Otho, father to the emperor of that name, so that his holding it between the sons of these two men, looked like a presage of his future advancement to the empire. Being appointed by Caius Caesar 656 to supersede Gatulicus in his command, the day after his joining the legions, he put a stop to their plaudits in a public spectacle, by issuing an order, that they should keep their hands under their cloaks. Immediately upon which, the following verse became very common in the camp. Dis, miles, militare, galba est, non Gatulicus. Learn, soldier, now in arms to use your hands. Tis Galba, not Catulicus, commands. With equal strictness, he would allow of no petitions for leave of absence from the camp. He hardened the soldiers, both old and young, by constant exercise. And having quickly reduced within their own limits the barbarians who had made inroads into Gaul, upon Caius's coming into Germany, he so far recommended himself and his army to that emperor's approbation, that Amongst the innumerable troops drawn from all the provinces of the empire, none met with higher commendation, or greater rewards from him. He likewise distinguished himself by heading an escort, with a shield in his hand 657, and running at the side of the emperor's chariot twenty miles together. 7. Upon the news of Caius's death, though many earnestly pressed him to lay hold of that opportunity of seizing the empire, he chose rather to be quiet. On this account, he was in great favor with Claudius, and being received into the number of his friends, stood so high in his good opinion, that the expedition to Britain 658 was for some time suspended. Because he was suddenly seized with a slight indisposition. He governed Africa, as proconsul, for two years, being chosen out of the regular course to restore order in the province, which was in great disorder from civil dissensions, and the alarms of the barbarians. His administration was distinguished by great strictness and equity, even in matters of small importance. A soldier upon some expedition being charged with selling, in a great scarcity of corn, a bushel of wheat, which was all he had left, for a hundred denarii, he forbade him to be relieved by any body, when he came to be in want himself. And accordingly he died of famine. When sitting in judgment, a cause being brought before him about some beast of burden, the ownership of which was claimed by two persons. The evidence being slight on both sides, and it being difficult to come at the truth, he ordered the beast to be led to a pond at which he had used to be watered, with his head muffled up, and the covering being there removed. That he should be the property of the person whom he followed of his own accord, after drinking. 8. For his achievements, both at this time in Africa, and formerly in Germany, he received the triumphal ornaments, and three sacerdotal appointments, one among the fifteen, another in the college of Titius, and a third amongst the Augustals. And from that time to the middle of Nero's reign, he lived for the most part in retirement. He never went abroad so much as to take the air, without a carriage attending him, in which there was a million of sesterces in gold, ready at hand. Until at last, at the time he was living in the town of Fundi, the province of Hispania Terraconensis was offered him. After his arrival in the province, whilst he was sacrificing in a temple, a boy who attended with a censer, became all on a sudden grey-headed. This incident was regarded by some as a token of an approaching revolution in the government, and that an old man would succeed a young one, that is, that he would succeed Nero. And not long after, a thunderbolt falling into a lake in Cantabria 659, Twelve axes were found in it, a manifest sign of the supreme power. 9. He governed the province during eight years, his administration being of an uncertain and capricious character. At first he was active, vigorous, and indeed excessively severe, in the punishment of offenders. For, a money dealer having committed some fraud in the way of his business, he cut off his hands, and nailed them to his counter. Another, who had poisoned an orphan, to whom he was guardian, and next heir to the estate, he crucified. On this delinquent imploring the protection of the law, and crying out that he was a Roman citizen, he affected to afford him some alleviation, and to mitigate his punishment, by a mark of honor, ordered a cross, higher than usual, and painted white, to be erected for him. But by degrees he gave himself up to a life of indolence and inactivity, from the fear of giving Nero any occasion of jealousy, and because, as he used to say, 
nobody was obliged to render an account of their leisure hours. He was holding a court of justice on the circuit at New Carthage 660, when he received intelligence of the insurrection in Gaul 661. And while the lieutenant of Aquitania was soliciting his assistance, letters were brought from Vindex, requesting him to assert the rights of mankind, and put himself at their head to relieve them from the tyranny of Nero. Without any long demur, he accepted the invitation, from a mixture of fear and hope. For he had discovered that private orders had been sent by Nero to his procurators in the province to get him dispatched. And he was encouraged to the enterprise, as well by several auspices and omens, as by the prophecy of a young woman of good, family. The more so, because the priest of Jupiter at Clunia 662, admonished by a dream, had discovered in the recesses of the temple some verses similar to those in which she had delivered her prophecy. These had also been uttered by a girl under divine inspiration, about two hundred years before. The import of the verses was, that in time, Spain should give the world a lord and master. X. Taking his seat on the tribunal, therefore, as if there was no other business than the manumitting of slaves, he had the effigies of a number of persons who had been condemned and put to death by Nero, set up before him. Whilst a noble youth stood by, who had been banished, and whom he had purposely sent for from one of the neighboring Balearic Isles. And lamenting the condition of the times, and being thereupon unanimously saluted by the title of emperor, he publicly declared himself only the lieutenant of the senate and people of Rome. Then shutting the courts, he levied legions and auxiliary troops among the provincials, besides his veteran army consisting of one legion, two wings of horse, and three cohorts. Out of the military leaders most distinguished for age and prudence, he formed a kind of senate, with whom to advise upon all matters of importance, as often as occasion should require. He likewise chose several young men of the equestrian order, who were to be allowed the privilege of wearing the gold ring, and, being called, the reserve, should mount guard before his bedchamber, instead of the legionary soldiers. He likewise issued proclamations throughout the provinces of the empire, exhorting all to rise in arms unanimously, and aid the common cause, by all the ways and means in their power. About the same time, in fortifying a town, which he had pitched upon for a military post, a ring was found, of antique workmanship, in the stone of which was engraved the goddess Victory with a trophy. Presently after, a ship of Alexandria arrived at Dertosa 663, loaded with arms, without any person to steer it, or so much as a single sailor or passenger on board. From this incident, nobody entertained the least doubt but the war upon which they were entering was just and honorable, and favored likewise by the gods, when all on a sudden the whole design was exposed to failure. One of the two wings of horse, repenting of the violation of their oath to Nero, attempted to desert him upon his approach to the camp, and were with some difficulty kept in their duty. And some slaves who had been presented to him by a freedman of Nero's, on purpose to murder him, had liked to have killed him as he went through a narrow passage to the bath. Being overheard to encourage one another not to lose the opportunity, they were called to an account concerning it, and recourse being had to the torture, a confession was extorted from them. 11. These dangers were followed by the death of Vindex, at which being extremely discouraged, as if fortune had quite forsaken him, he had thoughts of putting an end to his own life. But receiving advice by his messengers from Rome that Nero was slain, and that all had taken an oath to him as emperor, he laid aside the title of lieutenant, and took upon him that of Caesar. Putting himself upon his march in his general's cloak, and a dagger hanging from his neck before his breast, he did not resume the use of the toga, until Nymphidius Sabinus, prefect of the Praetorian Guards at Rome, with the two lieutenants. Fontius Capito in Germany, and Claudius Macer in Africa, who opposed his advancement, were all put down. 12. Rumors of his cruelty and avarice had reached the city before his arrival, such as that he had punished some cities of Spain and Gaul, for not joining him readily, by the imposition of heavy taxes, and some by leveling their walls. And had put to death the governors and procurators with their wives and children, likewise that a golden crown, of fifteen pounds weight, taken out of the temple of Jupiter, with which he was presented by the people of Terracona, he had melted down. And had exacted from them three ounces which were wanting in the weight. 
This report of him was confirmed and increased, as soon as he entered the town. For some seamen who had been taken from the fleet, and enlisted among the troops by Nero, he obliged to return to their former condition. But they refusing to comply, and obstinately clinging to the more honorable service under their eagles and standards, he not only dispersed them by a body of horse, but likewise decimated them. He also disbanded a cohort of Germans, which had been formed by the preceding emperors, for their bodyguard, and upon many occasions found very faithful. And sent them back into their own country, without giving them any gratuity, pretending that they were more inclined to favor the advancement of Gnaeus Dolabella, near whose gardens they encamped, than his own. The following ridiculous stories were also related of him, but whether with or without foundation, I know not. Such as, that when a more sumptuous entertainment than usual was served up, he fetched a deep groan, that when one of the stewards presented him with an account of his expenses, he reached him a dish of legumes from his table as a reward for his care and diligence. And when Canis, the piper, had played much to his satisfaction, he presented him, with his own hand, five denarii taken out of his pocket. 13. His arrival, therefore, in town was not very agreeable to the people. And this appeared at the next public spectacle. For when the actors in a farce began a well-known song. Venet, Io, Simus 664 Avila. Lo! Claude Pate from his village comes. All the spectators, with one voice, went on with the rest, repeating and acting the first verse several times over. 14. He possessed himself of the imperial power with more favor and authority than he administered it, although he gave many proofs of his being an excellent prince, but these were not so grateful to the people, as his misconduct was offensive. He was governed by three favorites, who, because they lived in the palace, and were constantly about him, obtained the name of his pedagogues. These were Titus Vinius, who had been his lieutenant in Spain, a man of insatiable avarice. Cornelius Laco, who, from an assessor to the prince, was advanced to be prefect of the Praetorian Guards, a person of intolerable arrogance, as well as indolence. And his freedman Isilus, dignified a little before with the privilege of wearing the gold ring, and the use of the cognomen Martianus, who became a candidate for the highest honor within the reach of any person of the Equestrian Order 665. He resigned himself so implicitly into the power of those three favorites, who governed in everything according to the capricious impulse of their vices and tempers, and his authority was so much abused by them. That the tenor of his conduct was not very consistent with itself. At one time, he was more rigorous and frugal, at another, more lavish and negligent, than became a prince who had been chosen by the people, and was so far advanced in years. He condemned some men of the first rank in the senatorian and equestrian orders, upon a very slight suspicion, and without trial. He rarely granted the freedom of the city to any one. And the privilege belonging to such as had three children, only to one or two, and that with great difficulty, and only for a limited time. When the judges petitioned to have a sixth decury added to their number, he not only denied them, but abolished the vacation which had been granted them by Claudius for the winter, and the beginning of the year. 15. It was thought that he likewise intended to reduce the offices held by senators and men of the equestrian order, to a term of two years' continuance, and to bestow them only on those who were unwilling to accept them, and had refused them. All the grants of Nero he recalled, saving only the tenth part of them. For this purpose he gave a commission to fifty Roman knights. With orders, that if players or wrestlers had sold what had been formerly given them, it should be exacted from the purchasers, since the others, having, no doubt, spent the money, were not in a condition to pay. But on the other hand, he suffered his attendants and freedmen to sell or give away the revenue of the state, or immunities from taxes, and to punish the innocent, or pardon criminals, at pleasure. Nay, when the Roman people were very clamorous for the punishment of Helotus and Tigellinus, two of the most mischievous amongst all the emissaries of Nero, he protected them. And even bestowed on Helotus one of the best procurations in his disposal. And as to Tigellinus, he even reprimanded the people for their cruelty by a proclamation. 16. By this conduct, he incurred the hatred of all orders of the people, but especially of the soldiery. 
for their commanders having promised them in his name a donative larger than usual, upon their taking the oath to him before his arrival at Rome. He refused to make it good, frequently bragging, that it was his custom to choose his soldiers, not by them. Thus the troops became exasperated against him in all quarters. The Praetorian guards he alarmed with apprehensions of danger and unworthy treatment, disbanding many of them occasionally as disaffected to his government, and favorers of Nymphidius. But most of all, the army in Upper Germany was incensed against him, as being defrauded of the rewards due to them for the service they had rendered in the insurrection of the Gauls under Vindex. They were, therefore, the first who ventured to break into open mutiny, refusing upon the Calends, the first, of January, to take any oath of allegiance, except to the Senate. And they immediately dispatched deputies to the Praetorian troops, to let them know, they did not like the emperor who had been set up in Spain, and to desire that, they would make choice of another. Who might meet with the approbation of all the armies. 17. Upon receiving intelligence of this, imagining that he was slighted not so much on account of his age, as for having no children, he immediately singled out of a company of young persons of rank, who came to pay their compliments to him. Piso Phrygi Licinianus, a youth of noble descent and great talents, for whom he had before contracted such a regard, that he had appointed him in his will the heir both of his estate and name. Him he now styled his son, and taking him to the camp, adopted him in the presence of the assembled troops, but without making any mention of a donative. This circumstance afforded the better opportunity to Marcus Salvius Otho of accomplishing his object, six days after the adoption. 18. Many remarkable prodigies had happened from the very beginning of his reign, which forewarned him of his approaching fate. In every town through which he passed in his way from Spain to Rome, victims were slain on the right and left of the roads. And one of these, which was a bull, being maddened with the stroke of the axe, broke the rope with which it was tied, and running straight against his chariot, with his four feet elevated, bespattered him with blood. Likewise, as he was alighting, one of the guard, being pushed forward by the crowd, had very nearly wounded him with his lance. And upon his entering the city and, afterwards, the palace, he was welcomed with an earthquake, and a noise like the bellowing of cattle. These signs of ill fortune were followed by some that were still more apparently such. Out of all his treasures he had selected a necklace of pearls and jewels, to adorn his statue of fortune at Tusculum. But it suddenly occurring to him that it deserved a more august place, he consecrated it to the Capitoline Venus. And next night, he dreamt that fortune appeared to him, complaining that she had been defrauded of the present intended her, and threatening to resume what she had given him. Terrified at this denunciation, at break of day he sent forward some persons to Tusculum, to make preparations for a sacrifice which might avert the displeasure of the goddess. And when he himself arrived at the place, he found nothing but some hot embers upon the altar, and an old man in black standing by, holding a little incense in a glass, and some wine in an earthen pot. It was remarked, too, that whilst he was sacrificing upon the calends of January, the chaplet fell from his head, and upon his consulting the pullets for omens, they flew away. Farther, upon the day of his adopting Piso, when he was to harangue the soldiers, the seat which he used upon those occasions, through the neglect of his attendants, was not placed, according to custom, upon his tribunal. And in the senate house, his curule chair was set with the back forward. 19. The day before he was slain, as he was sacrificing in the morning, the augur warned him from time to time to be upon his guard, for that he was in danger from assassins, and that they were near at hand. Soon after, he was informed, that Otho was in possession of the Praetorian camp. And though most of his friends advised him to repair thither immediately, in hopes that he might quell the tumult by his authority and presence, he resolved to do nothing more than keep close within the palace. And secure himself by guards of the legionary soldiers, who were quartered in different parts about the city. He put on a linen coat of mail, however, remarking at the same time, that it would avail him little against the points of so many swords. But being tempted out by false reports, which the conspirators had purposely spread to induce him to venture abroad, some few of those about him too hastily assuring him that the tumult had ceased, the mutineers were apprehended. And the rest coming to congratulate him, 
resolved to continue firm in their obedience, he went forward to meet them with so much confidence, that upon a soldier's boasting that he had killed Otho, he asked him, by what authority? And proceeded as far as the forum. There the knights, appointed to dispatch him, making their way through the crowd of citizens, upon seeing him at a distance, halted a while. After which, galloping up to him, now abandoned by all his attendants, they put him to death. XX, some authors relate, that upon their first approach he cried out, What do you mean, fellow soldiers? I am yours, and you are mine, and promised them a donative, but the generality of writers relate, that he offered his throat to them, saying, Do your work, and strike, since you are resolved upon it. It is remarkable, that not one of those who were at hand, ever made any attempt to assist the emperor, and all who were sent for, disregarded the summons, except a troop of Germans. They, in consideration of his late kindness in showing them particular attention during a sickness which prevailed in the camp, flew to his aid, but came too late, for, being not well acquainted with the town, they had taken a circuitous route. He was slain near the Curdian Lake 666, and there left, until a common soldier returning from the receipt of his allowance of corn, throwing down the load which he carried, cut off his head. There being upon it no hair, by which he might hold it, he hid it in the bosom of his dress, but afterwards thrusting his thumb into the mouth, he carried it in that manner to Otho, who gave it to the drudges and slaves who attended the soldiers. And they, fixing it upon the point of a spear, carried it in derision round the camp, crying out as they went along, You take your fill of joy in your old age. They were irritated to this pitch of rude banter, by a report spread a few days before, that, upon someone's commending his person as still florid and vigorous, he replied. Eti moi minos and pidoi estin. 667. My strength, as yet, has suffered no decay. A freedman of Petrobius's, who himself had belonged to Nero's family, purchased the head from them at the price of a hundred gold pieces, and threw it into the place where, by Galba's order, his patron had been put to death. At last, after some time, his steward Argius buried it, with the rest of his body, in his own gardens near the Aurelian Way. XXI, in person he was of a good size, bald before, with blue eyes, and an aquiline nose. And his hands and feet were so distorted with the gout, that he could neither wear a shoe, nor turn over the leaves of a book, or so much as hold it. He had likewise an excrescence in his right side, which hung down to that degree, that it was with difficulty kept up by a bandage. XXII, he is reported to have been a great eater, and usually took his breakfast in the winter time before day. At supper, he fed very heartily, giving the fragments which were left, by handfuls, to be distributed amongst the attendants. In his lust, he was more inclined to the male sex, and such of them too as were old. It is said of him, that in Spain, when Isilus, an old catamite of his, brought him the news of Nero's death, he not only kissed him lovingly before company, but begged of him to remove all impediments. And then took him aside into a private apartment. Exei, he perished in the seventy-third year of his age, and the seventh month of his reign 668. The Senate, as soon as they could with safety, ordered a statue to be erected for him upon the naval column, in that part of the forum where he was slain. But Vespasian cancelled the decree, upon a suspicion that he had sent assassins from Spain into Judea to murder him. Galba was, for a private man, the most wealthy of any who had ever aspired to the imperial dignity. He valued himself upon his being descended from the family of the Servii, but still more upon his relation to Quintus Catulus Capitolinus, celebrated for integrity in virtue. He was likewise distantly related to Livia, the wife of Augustus, by whose interest he was preferred from the station which he held in the palace, to the dignity of consul, and who left him a great legacy at her death. His parsimonious way of living, and his aversion to all superfluity or excess, were construed into avarice as soon as he became emperor, whence Plutarch observes, that the pride which he took in his temperance and economy was unseasonable. While he endeavoured to reform the profusion in the public expenditure, which prevailed in the reign of Nero, he ran into the opposite extreme. And it is objected to him by some historians, that he maintained not the imperial dignity in a degree consistent even with decency. 
he was not sufficiently attentive either to his own security or the tranquility of the state, when he refused to pay the soldiers the donative which he had promised them. This breach of faith seems to be the only act in his life that affects his integrity, and it contributed more to his ruin than even the odium which he incurred by the open venality and rapaciousness of his favorites, particularly Vinius. A. Salvius Otho I. The ancestors of Otho were originally of the town of Ferentum, of an ancient and honorable family, and, indeed, one of the most considerable in Etruria. His grandfather, M. Salvius Otho, whose father was a Roman knight, but his mother of mean extraction, for it is not certain whether she was freeborn, by the favor of Livia Augusta, in whose house he had his education, was made a senator. But never rose higher than the praetorship. His father, Lucius Otho, was by the mother's side nobly descended, allied to several great families, and so dearly beloved by Tiberius, and so much resembled him in his features, that most people believed Tiberius was his father. He behaved with great strictness and severity, not only in the city offices, but in the proconsulship of Africa, and some extraordinary commands in the army. He had the courage to punish with death some soldiers in Illyricum, who, in the disturbance attempted by Camillus, upon changing their minds, had put their generals to the sword, as promoters of that insurrection against Claudius. He ordered the execution to take place in the front of the camp 669, and under his own eyes, though he knew they had been advanced to higher ranks in the army by Claudius, on that very account. By this action he acquired fame, but lessened his favor at court, which, however, he soon recovered, by discovering to Claudius a design upon his life, carried on by a Roman knight 670, and which he had learnt from some of his slaves. For the Senate ordered a statue of him to be erected in the palace, an honour which had been conferred but upon very few before him. And Claudius advanced him to the dignity of a patrician, commending him, at the same time, in the highest terms, and concluding with these words, A man, than whom I don't so much as wish to have children that should be better. He had two sons by a very noble woman, Albia Terentia, namely, Lucius Titianus, and a younger called Marcus, who had the same cognomen as himself. He had also a daughter, whom he contracted to Drusus, Germanicus's son, before she was of marriageable age. 2. The Emperor Otho was born upon the 4th of the Calends of May, April 28, in the consulship of Camillus Aruntius and Domitius Enobarbus 671. He was from his earliest youth so riotous and wild, that he was often severely scourged by his father. He was said to run about in the night time, and seize upon any one he met, who was either drunk or too feeble to make resistance, and toss him in a blanket 672. After his father's death, to make his court the more effectually to a freed woman about the palace, who was in great favor, he pretended to be in love with her, though she was old, and almost decrepit. Having by her means got into Nero's good graces, he soon became one of the principal favorites, by the congeniality of his disposition to that of the emperor or, as some say, by the reciprocal practice of mutual pollution. He had so great a sway at court, that when a man of consular rank was condemned for bribery, having tampered with him for a large sum of money, to procure his pardon. Before he had quite effected it, he scrupled not to introduce him into the senate, to return his thanks. 3. Having, by means of this woman, insinuated himself into all the emperor's secrets, he, upon the day designed for the murder of his mother, entertained them both at a very splendid feast, to prevent suspicion. Papia Sabina, for whom Nero entertained such a violent passion that he had taken her from her husband 673 and entrusted her to him, he received, and went through the form of marrying her. And not satisfied with obtaining her favors, he loved her so extravagantly, that he could not with patience bear Nero for his rival. It is certainly believed that he not only refused admittance to those who were sent by Nero to fetch her, but that, on one occasion, he shut him out, and kept him standing before the door, mixing prayers and menaces in vain, and demanding back again what was entrusted to his keeping. His pretended marriage, therefore, being dissolved, he was sent lieutenant into Lusitania. This treatment of him was thought sufficiently severe, because harsher proceedings might have brought the whole farce to light, which, notwithstanding, at last came out. 
and was published to the world in the following distich. Cur otho mentitis sit, queritis, exol honore. Uxoris mochis caperat esse sui. You ask why Otho's banished? No, the cause. Comes not within the verge of vulgar laws. Against all rules of fashionable life. The rogue had dared to sleep with his own wife. He governed the province in quality of quester for ten years, with singular moderation and justice. 4. As soon as an opportunity of revenge offered, he readily joined in Galba's enterprises, and at the same time conceived hopes of obtaining the imperial dignity for himself. To this he was much encouraged by the state of the times, but still more by the assurances given him by Seleucus, the astrologer, who, having formerly told him that he would certainly outlive Nero, came to him at that juncture unexpectedly. Promising him again that he should succeed to the empire, and that in a very short time. He, therefore, let slip no opportunity of making his court to every one about him by all manner of civilities. As often as he entertained Galba at supper, he distributed to every man of the cohort which attended the emperor on guard, a gold piece. Endeavouring likewise to oblige the rest of the soldiers in one way or another. Being chosen an arbitrator by one who had a dispute with his neighbour about a piece of land, he bought it, and gave it him. So that now almost every body thought and said, that he was the only man worthy of succeeding to the empire. V. He entertained hopes of being adopted by Galba, and expected it every day. But finding himself disappointed, by Piso's being preferred before him, he turned his thoughts to obtaining his purpose by the use of violence. And to this he was instigated, as well by the greatness of his debts, as by resentment at Galba's conduct towards him. For he did not conceal his conviction, that he could not stand his ground unless he became emperor, and that it signified nothing whether he fell by the hands of his enemies in the field, or of his creditors in the forum. He had a few days before squeezed out of one of the emperor's slaves a million of sesterces for procuring him a stewardship, and this was the whole fund he had for carrying on so great an enterprise. At first the design was entrusted to only five of the guard, but afterwards to ten others, each of the five naming two. They had every one ten thousand sesterces paid down, and were promised fifty thousand more. By these, others were drawn in, but not many, from a confident assurance, that when the matter came to the crisis, they should have enough to join them. 6. His first intention was, immediately after the departure of Piso, to seize the camp, and fall upon Galba, whilst he was at supper in the palace. But he was restrained by a regard for the cohort at that time on duty, lest he should bring too great an odium upon it, because it happened that the same cohort was on guard before, both when Caius was slain, and Nero deserted. For some time afterwards, he was restrained also by scruples about the omens, and by the advice of Seleucus. Upon the day fixed at last for the enterprise, having given his accomplices notice to wait for him in the forum near the temple of Saturn, at the gilded mile, stone 674, he went in the morning to pay his respects to Galba. And being received with a kiss as usual, he attended him at sacrifice, and heard the predictions of the augur 675. A freedman of his, then bringing him word that the architects were come, which was the signal agreed upon, he withdrew, as if it were with a design to view a house upon sale, and went out by a back door of the palace to the place appointed. Some say he pretended to be seized with an ague fit, and ordered those about him to make that excuse for him, if he was inquired after. Being then quickly concealed in a woman's litter, he made the best of his way for the camp. But the bearers growing tired, he got out, and began to run. His shoe becoming loose, he stopped again, but being immediately raised by his attendants upon their shoulders, and unanimously saluted by the title of emperor. He came amidst auspicious acclamations and drawn swords into the Principia 676 in the camp. All who met him joining in the cavalcade, as if they had been privy to the design. Upon this, sending some soldiers to dispatch Galba and Piso, he said nothing else in his address to the soldiery, to secure their affections, than these few words, I shall be content with whatever ye think fit to leave me. 7. Towards the close of the day, he entered the senate, and after he had made a short speech to them, 
pretending that he had been seized in the streets, and compelled by violence to assume the imperial authority. Which he designed to exercise in conjunction with them, he retired to the palace. Besides other compliments which he received from those who flocked about him to congratulate and flatter him, he was called Nero by the mob, and manifested no intention of declining that cognomen. Nay, some authors relate, that he used it in his official acts, and the first letters he sent to the governors of provinces. He suffered all his images and statues to be replaced, and restored his procurators and freedmen to their former posts. And the first writing which he signed as emperor, was a promise of fifty millions of sesterces to finish the golden, house 677. He is said to have been greatly frightened that night in his sleep, and to have groaned heavily. And being found, by those who came running in to see what the matter was, lying upon the floor before his bed, he endeavoured by every kind of atonement to appease the ghost of Galba, by which he had found himself violently tumbled out of bed. The next day, as he was taking the omens, a great storm arising, and sustaining a grievous fall, he muttered to himself from time to time. Tigar moi kai ma alois, 678. What business have I the loud trumpets to sound? 8. About the same time, the armies in Germany took an oath to Vitellius as emperor. Upon receiving this intelligence, he advised the Senate to send to their deputies, to inform them, that a prince had been already chosen. And to persuade them to peace and a good understanding. By letters and messages, however, he offered Vitellius to make him his colleague in the empire, and his son-in-law. But a war being now unavoidable, and the generals and troops sent forward by Vitellius, advancing, he had a proof of the attachment and fidelity of the Praetorian guards, which had nearly proved fatal to the senatory in order. It had been judged proper that some arms should be given out of the stores, and conveyed to the fleet by the marine troops. While they were employed in fetching these from the camp in the night, some of the guards suspecting treachery, excited a tumult. And suddenly the whole body, without any of their officers at their head, ran to the palace, demanding that the entire senate should be put to the sword. And having repulsed some of the tribunes who endeavoured to stop them, and slain others, they broke, all bloody as they were, into the banqueting room, inquiring for the emperor, nor would they quit the place until they had seen him. He now entered upon his expedition against Vitellius with great alacrity, but too much precipitation, and without any regard to the ominous circumstances which attended it. For the Ancilia 679 had been taken out of the Temple of Mars, for the usual procession, but were not yet replaced, during which interval it had of old been looked upon as very unfortunate to engage in any enterprise. He likewise set forward upon the day when the worshippers of the Mother of the God 680 begin their lamentations and wailing. Besides these, other unlucky omens attended him. For, in a victim offered to Father Dis 681, he found the signs such as upon all other occasions are regarded as favourable, whereas, in that sacrifice, the contrary intimations are judged the most propitious. At his first setting forward, he was stopped by inundations of the Tiber, and at twenty miles distance from the city, found the road blocked up by the fall of houses. 9. Though it was the general opinion that it would be proper to protract the war, as the enemy were distressed by famine and the straitness of their quarters, yet he resolved with equal rashness to force them to an engagement as soon as possible. Whether from impatience of prolonged anxiety, and in the hope of bringing matters to an issue before the arrival of Vitellius, or because he could not resist the ardour of the troops, who were all clamorous for battle. He was not, however, present at any of those which ensued, but stayed behind at Brixellum 682. He had the advantage in three slight engagements, near the Alps, about Placentia, and a place called Castor's 683. But was, by a fraudulent stratagem of the enemy, defeated in the last and greatest battle, at Bedriacum 684. For, some hopes of a conference being given, and the soldiers being drawn up to hear the conditions of peace declared, very unexpectedly, and amidst their mutual salutations, they were obliged to stand to their arms. Immediately upon this he determined to put an end to his life, more, as many think, and not without reason, out of shame, at persisting in a struggle for the empire to the hazard of the public interest and so many lives, than from despair. Or distrust of his troops. 
for he had still in reserve, and in full force, those whom he had kept about him for a second trial of his fortune, and others were coming up from Dalmatia, Pannonia, and Mesia. Nor were the troops lately defeated so far discouraged as not to be ready, even of themselves, to run all risks in order to wipe off their recent disgrace. X. My father, Suetonius Linus 685, was in this battle, being at that time an Angusticlavian tribune in the 13th legion. He used frequently to say, that Otho, before his advancement to the empire, had such an abhorrence of civil war, that once, upon hearing an account given at table of the death of Cassius and Brutus, he fell into a trembling. And that he never would have interfered with Galba, but that he was confident of succeeding in his enterprise without a war. Moreover, that he was then encouraged to despise life by the example of a common soldier, who bringing news of the defeat of the army, and finding that he met with no credit, but was railed at for a liar and a coward. As if he had run away from the field of battle, fell upon his sword at the emperor's feet. Upon the sight of which, my father said that Otho cried out, that he would expose to no farther danger such brave men, who had deserved so well at his hands. Advising therefore his brother, his brother's son, and the rest of his friends, to provide for their security in the best manner they could, after he had embraced and kissed them, he sent them away. And then withdrawing into a private room by himself, he wrote a letter of consolation to his sister, containing two sheets. He likewise sent another to Messalina, Nero's widow, whom he had intended to marry, committing to her the care of his relics and memory. He then burnt all the letters which he had by him, to prevent the danger and mischief that might otherwise befall the writers from the conqueror. What ready money he had, he distributed among his domestics. 11. And now being prepared, and just upon the point of dispatching himself, he was induced to suspend the execution of his purpose by a great tumult which had broken out in the camp. Finding that some of the soldiers who were making off had been seized and detained as deserters, let us add, said he, this night to our life. These were his very words. He then gave orders that no violence should be offered to any one. And keeping his chamber door open until late at night, he allowed all who pleased the liberty to come and see him. At last, after quenching his thirst with a draught of cold water, he took up two poniards, and having examined the points of both, put one of them under his pillow, and shutting his chamber door, slept very soundly, until, awaking about break of day, he stabbed himself under the left pap. Some persons bursting into the room upon his first groan, he at one time covered, and at another exposed his wound to the view of the bystanders, and thus life soon ebbed away. His funeral was hastily performed, according to his own order, in the thirty-eighth year of his age, and ninety-fifth day of his reign. 686. 12. The person and appearance of Otho no way corresponded to the great spirit he displayed on this occasion, for he is said to have been of low stature, splay-footed, and bandy-legged. He was, however, effeminately nice in the care of his person, the hair on his body he plucked out by the roots, and because he was somewhat bald, he wore a kind of peruke, so exactly fitted to his head, that nobody could have known it for such. He used to shave every day, and rub his face with soaked bread, the use of which he began when the down first appeared upon his chin, to prevent his having any beard. It is said likewise that he celebrated publicly the sacred rites of Isis 687, clad in a linen garment, such as is used by the worshippers of that goddess. These circumstances, I imagine, caused the world to wonder the more that his death was so little in character with his life. Many of the soldiers who were present, kissing and bedewing with their tears his hands and feet as he lay dead, and celebrating him as, a most gallant man, and an incomparable emperor, immediately put an end to their own lives upon the spot. Not far from his funeral pile. Many of those likewise who were at a distance, upon hearing the news of his death, in the anguish of their hearts, began fighting amongst themselves, until they dispatched one another. To conclude, the generality of mankind, though they hated him whilst living, yet highly extolled him after his death. Insomuch that it was the common talk and opinion, that Galba had been driven to destruction by his rival, not so much for the sake of reigning himself, as of restoring Rome to its ancient liberty. It is remarkable, in the fortune of this emperor, 
that he owed both his elevation and catastrophe to the inextricable embarrassments in which he was involved, first, in respect of pecuniary circumstances, and next, of political. He was not, so far as we can learn, a follower of any of the sects of philosophers which justified, and even recommended suicide, in particular cases, yet he perpetrated that act with extraordinary coolness and resolution. And, what is no less remarkable, from the motive, as he avowed, of public expediency only. It was observed of him, for many years after his death, that none ever died like Otho. Aulus Vitellius. I, very different accounts are given of the origin of the Vitellian family. Some describe it as ancient and noble, others as recent and obscure, nay, extremely mean. I am inclined to think, that these several representations have been made by the flatterers and detractors of Vitellius, after he became emperor, unless the fortunes of the family vary before. There is extant a memoir addressed by Quintus Eulogius to Quintus Vitellius, Quester to the Divine Augustus, in which it is said, that the Vitellii were descended from Faunus, king of the Aborigines, and Vitellia 688, who was worshipped in many places as a goddess, and that they reigned formerly over the whole of Latium, that all who were left of the family removed out of the country of the Sabines to Rome, and were enrolled among the patricians, that some monuments of the family continued a long time. As the Vitellian way, reaching from the Geniculum to the sea, and likewise a colony of that name, which, at a very remote period of time, they desired leave from the government to defend against the quickly 689. With a force raised by their own family only, also that, in the time of the war with the Samnites, some of the Vitellii who went with the troops levied for the security of Apulia, settled at Nasiria 690, and their descendants, a long time afterwards, returned again to Rome, and were admitted into the patrician order. On the other hand, the generality of writers say that the founder of the family was a freedman. Cassius Severus 691 and some others relate that he was likewise a cobbler, whose son having made a considerable fortune by agencies and dealings in confiscated property, begot, by a common strumpet, daughter of one Antiochus, a baker, a child, who afterwards became a Roman knight. Of these different accounts the reader is left to take his choice. 2. It is certain, however, that Publius Vitellius, of Nasiria, whether of an ancient family, or of low extraction, was a Roman knight and a procurator to Augustus. He left behind him four sons, all men of very high station, who had the same cognomen, but the different prenomena of Aulus, Quintus, Publius, and Lucius. Aulus died in the enjoyment of the consulship 692, which office he bore jointly with Domitius, the father of Nero Caesar. He was elegant to excess in his manner of living, and notorious for the vast expense of his entertainments. Quintus was deprived of his rank of senator, when, upon a motion made by Tiberius, a resolution passed to purge the senate of those who were in any respect not duly qualified for that honor. Publius, an intimate friend and companion of Germanicus, prosecuted his enemy and murderer, Gnaeus Piso, and procured sentence against him. After he had been made proctor, being arrested among the accomplices of Sejanus, and delivered into the hands of his brother to be confined in his house, he opened a vein with a penknife, intending to bleed himself to death. He suffered, however, the wound to be bound up and cured, not so much from repenting the resolution he had formed, as to comply with the importunity of his relations. He died afterwards a natural death during his confinement. Lucius, after his consulship 693, was made governor of Syria 694, and by his politic management not only brought Artabanus, king of the Parthians, to give him an interview, but to worship the standards of the Roman legions. He afterwards filled two ordinary consulships 695, and also the censorship 696 jointly with the Emperor Claudius. Whilst that prince was absent upon his expedition into Britain 697, the care of the empire was committed to him, being a man of great integrity and industry. But he lessened his character not a little, by his passionate fondness for an abandoned freed woman, with whose spittle, mixed with honey, he used to anoint his throat and jaws, by way of remedy for some complaint, not privately nor seldom but daily and publicly. Being extravagantly prone to flattery, it was he who gave rise to the worship of Caius Caesar as a god, 
when, upon his return from Syria, he would not presume to accost him any otherwise than with his head covered, turning himself round. And then prostrating himself upon the earth. And to leave no artifice untried to secure the favor of Claudius, who was entirely governed by his wives and freedmen, he requested as the greatest favor from Messalina, that she would be pleased to let him take off her shoes. Which, when he had done, he took her right shoe, and wore it constantly betwixt his toga and his tunic, and from time to time covered it with kisses. He likewise worshipped golden images of Narcissus and Pallas among his household gods. It was he, too, who, when Claudius exhibited the secular games, in his compliments to him upon that occasion, used this expression, May you often do the same. 3. He died of palsy, the day after his seizure with it, leaving behind him two sons, whom he had by a most excellent and respectable wife, Sextilia. He had lived to see them both consuls, the same year and during the whole year also. The younger succeeding the elder for the last six months 698. The senate honored him after his decease with a funeral at the public expense, and with a statue in the rostra, which had this inscription upon the base, one who was steadfast in his loyalty to his prince. The emperor Aulus Vitellius, the son of this Lucius, was born upon the 8th of the Calends of October, September 24th, or, as some say, upon the 7th of the Ides of September, September 7th. In the consulship of Drusus Caesar and Norbanus Flaccus 699. His parents were so terrified with the predictions of astrologers upon the calculation of his nativity, that his father used his utmost endeavors to prevent his being sent governor into any of the provinces, whilst he was alive. His mother, upon his being sent to the legions 700, and also upon his being proclaimed emperor, immediately lamented him as utterly ruined. He spent his youth amongst the Catamites of Tiberius at Capri, was himself constantly stigmatized with the name of Spintria 701, and was supposed to have been the occasion of his father's advancement. By consenting to gratify the emperor's unnatural lust. 4. In the subsequent part of his life, being still most scandalously vicious, he rose to great favor at court. Being upon a very intimate footing with Caius, Caligula, because of his fondness for chariot driving, and with Claudius for his love of gaming. But he was in a still higher degree acceptable to Nero, as well on the same accounts, as for a particular service which he rendered him. When Nero presided in the games instituted by himself, though he was extremely desirous to perform amongst the harpers, yet his modesty would not permit him, notwithstanding the people entreated much for it. Upon his quitting the theatre, Vitellius fetched him back again, pretending to represent the determined wishes of the people, and so afforded him the opportunity of yielding to their entreaties. v. By the favour of these three princes, he was not only advanced to the great offices of state, but to the highest dignities of the sacred order. After which he held the proconsulship of Africa, and had the superintendence of the public works, in which appointment his conduct, and, consequently, his reputation, were very different. For he governed the province with singular integrity during two years, in the latter of which he acted as deputy to his brother, who succeeded him. But in his office in the city, he was said to pillage the temples of their gifts and ornaments, and to have exchanged brass and tin for gold and silver. 702. 6. He took to wife Petronia, the daughter of a man of consular rank, and had by her a son named Petronius, who was blind of an eye. The mother being willing to appoint this youth her heir, upon condition that he should be released from his father's authority, the latter discharged him accordingly. But shortly after, as was believed, murdered him, charging him with a design upon his life, and pretending that he had, from consciousness of his guilt, drank the poison he had prepared for his father. Soon afterwards, he married Galeria Fundana, the daughter of a man of Praetorian rank, and had by her both sons and daughters. Among the former was one who had such a stammering in his speech, that he was little better than if he had been dumb. 7. He was sent by Galba into Lower Germany 703, contrary to his expectation. It is supposed that he was assisted in procuring this appointment by the interest of Titus Junius, a man of great influence at that time, whose friendship he had long before gained by favoring the same set of charioteers with him in the Circensian Games. 
but Galba openly declared that none were less to be feared than those who only cared for their bellies, and that even his enormous appetite must be satisfied with the plenty of that province. So that it is evident he was selected for that government more out of contempt than kindness. It is certain, that when he was to set out, he had not money for the expenses of his journey. He being at that time so much straitened in his circumstances, that he was obliged to put his wife and children, whom he left at Rome, into a poor lodging which he hired for them. In order that he might let his own house for the remainder of the year. And he pawned a pearl taken from his mother's earring, to defray his expenses on the road. A crowd of creditors who were waiting to stop him, and amongst them the people of Sinusa and Formia, whose taxes he had converted to his own use, he eluded, by alarming them with the apprehension of false accusation. He had, however, sued a certain freedman, who was clamorous in demanding a debt of him, under pretense that he had kicked him, which action he would not withdraw, until he had wrung from the freedman fifty thousand sesterces. Upon his arrival in the province, the army, which was disaffected to Galba, and ripe for insurrection, received him with open arms, as if he had been sent them from heaven. It was no small recommendation to their favor, that he was the son of a man who had been thrice consul, was in the prime of life, and of an easy, prodigal disposition. This opinion, which had been long entertained of him, Vitellius confirmed by some late practices. Having kissed all the common soldiers whom he met with upon the road, and been excessively complaisant in the inns and stables to the muleteers and travellers. Asking them in a morning, if they had got their breakfasts, and letting them see, by belching, that he had eaten his. 8. After he had reached the camp, he denied no man anything he asked for, and pardoned all who lay under sentence for disgraceful conduct or disorderly habits. Before a month, therefore, had passed, without regard to the day or season, he was hurried by the soldiers out of his bedchamber, although it was evening, and he in an undress, and unanimously saluted by the title of Emperor 704. He was then carried round the most considerable towns in the neighborhood, with the sword of the divine Julius in his hand, which had been taken by some person out of the Temple of Mars, and presented to him when he was first saluted. Nor did he return to the Praetorium, until his dining room was in flames from the chimneys taking fire. Upon this accident, all being in consternation, and considering it as an unlucky omen, he cried out, Courage, boys! It shines brightly upon us. And this was all he said to the soldiers. The army of the upper province likewise, which had before declared against Galba for the senate, joining in the proceedings, he very eagerly accepted the cognomen of Germanicus, offered him by the unanimous consent of both armies. But deferred assuming that of Augustus, and refused forever that of Caesar. 9. Intelligence of Galba's death arriving soon after, when he had settled his affairs in Germany he divided his troops into two bodies, intending to send one of them before him against Otho, and to follow with the other himself. The army he sent forward had a lucky omen, for, suddenly, an eagle cams flying up to them on the right, and having hovered round the standards, flew gently before them on their road. But, on the other hand, when he began his own march, all the equestrian statues, which were erected for him in several places, fell suddenly down with their legs broken. And the laurel crown, which he had put on as emblematical of auspicious fortune, fell off his head into a river. Soon afterwards, at Vienne 705, as he was upon the tribunal administering justice, a cock perched upon his shoulder, and afterwards upon his head. The issue corresponded to these omens. For he was not able to keep the empire which had been secured for him by his lieutenants. X. He heard of the victory at Bedriacum 706, and the death of Otho, whilst he was yet in Gaul, and without the least hesitation, by a single proclamation, disbanded all the praetorian cohorts, as having, by their repeated treasons, set a dangerous example to the rest of the army, commanding them to deliver up their arms to his tribunes. A hundred and twenty of them, under whose hands he had found petitions presented to Otho, for rewards of their service in the murder of Galba, he besides ordered to be sought out and punished. So far his conduct deserved approbation, and was such as to afford hope of his becoming an excellent prince, had he not managed his other affairs in a way more corresponding with his own disposition, and his former manner of life. 
than to the imperial dignity. For, having begun his march, he rode through every city in his route in a triumphal procession. And sailed down the rivers in ships, fitted out with the greatest elegance, and decorated with various kinds of crowns, amidst the most extravagant entertainments. Such was the want of discipline, and the licentiousness both in his family and army, that, not satisfied with the provision everywhere made for them at the public expense, they committed every kind of robbery and insult upon the inhabitants. Setting slaves at liberty as they pleased. And if any dared to make resistance, they dealt blows and abuse, frequently wounds, and sometimes slaughter amongst them. When he reached the plains on which the battles were fought 707, some of those around him being offended at the smell of the carcasses which lay rotting upon the ground, he had the audacity to encourage them by a most detestable remark. That a dead enemy smelt not amiss, especially if he were a fellow citizen. To qualify, however, the offensiveness of the stench, he quaffed in public a goblet of wine, and with equal vanity and insolence distributed a large quantity of it among his troops. On his observing a stone with an inscription upon it to the memory of Otho, he said, it was a mausoleum good enough for such a prince. He also sent the poniard, with which Otho killed himself, to the colony of Agrippina 708, to be dedicated to Mars. Upon the Apennine hills he celebrated a Bacchanalian feast. 11. At last he entered the city with trumpets sounding, in his general's cloak, and girded with his sword, amidst a display of standards and banners, his attendants being all in the military habit, and the arms of the soldiers unsheathed. Acting more and more in open violation of all laws, both divine and human, he assumed the office of Pontifex Maximus, upon the day of the defeat at the Alia 709, ordered the magistrates to be elected for ten years of office. And made himself consul for life. To put it out of all doubt what model he intended to follow in his government of the empire, he made his offerings to the shade of Nero in the midst of the campus Martius, and with a full assembly of the public priests attending him. And at a solemn entertainment, he desired a harper who pleased the company much, to sing something in praise of Domitius. And upon his beginning some songs of Nero's, he started up in presence of the whole assembly, and could not refrain from applauding him, by clapping his hands. 12. After such a commencement of his career, he conducted his affairs, during the greater part of his reign, entirely by the advice and direction of the vilest amongst the players and charioteers, and especially his freedman Asiaticus. This fellow had, when young, been engaged with him in a course of mutual and unnatural pollution, but, being at last quite tired of the occupation, ran away. His master, some time after, caught him at Putili, selling a liquor called Pasca 710, and put him in chains, but soon released him, and retained him in his former capacity. Growing weary, however, of his rough and stubborn temper, he sold him to a strolling fencing master. After which, when the fellow was to have been brought up to play his part at the conclusion of an entertainment of gladiators, he suddenly carried him off, and at length, upon his being advanced to the government of a province, gave him his freedom. The first day of his reign, he presented him with the gold rings at supper, though in the morning, when all about him requested that favor in his behalf, he expressed the utmost abhorrence of putting so great a stain upon the equestrian order. 13. He was chiefly addicted to the vices of luxury and cruelty. He always made three meals a day, sometimes four, breakfast, dinner, and supper, and a drunken revel after all. This load of victuals he could well enough bear, from a custom to which he had inured himself, of frequently vomiting. For these several meals he would make different appointments at the houses of his friends on the same day. None ever entertained him at less expense than 400,000 sesterces 7-Eleven. The most famous was a set entertainment given him by his brother, at which, it is said, there were served up no less than 2,000 choice fishes, and 7,000 birds. Yet even this supper he himself outdid, at a feast which he gave upon the first use of a dish which had been made for him, and which, for its extraordinary size, he called, the Shield of Minerva. In this dish there were tossed up together the livers of charfish, the brains of pheasants and peacocks, with the tongues of flamingos, and the entrails of lampreys, which had been brought in ships of war as far as from the Carpathian Sea. And the Spanish Straits. 
He was not only a man of an insatiable appetite, but would gratify it likewise at unseasonable times, and with any garbage that came in his way, so that, at a sacrifice, he would snatch from the fire flesh and cakes and eat them upon the spot. When he travelled, he did the same at the inns upon the road, whether the meat was fresh dressed and hot, or what had been left the day before, and was half eaten. 14. He delighted in the infliction of punishments, and even those which were capital, without any distinction of persons or occasions. Several noblemen, his schoolfellows and companions, invited by him to court, he treated with such flattering caresses, as seemed to indicate an affection short only of admitting them to share the honours of the imperial dignity. Yet he put them all to death by some base means or other. To one he gave poison with his own hand, in a cup of cold water which he called for in a fever. He scarcely spared one of all the usurers, notaries, and publicans, who had ever demanded a debt of him at Rome, or any toll or custom upon the road. One of these, while in the very act of saluting him, he ordered for execution, but immediately sent for him back. Upon which all about him applauding his clemency, he commanded him to be slain in his own presence, saying, I have a mind to feed my eyes. Two sons who interceded for their father, he ordered to be executed with him. A Roman knight, upon his being dragged away for execution, and crying out to him, You are my heir, he desired to produce his will, and finding that he had made his freedman joint heir with him. He commanded that both he and the freedman should have their throats cut. He put to death some of the common people for cursing aloud the blue party in the Circentian games, supposing it to be done in contempt of himself, and the expectation of a revolution in the government. There were no persons he was more severe against than jugglers and astrologers, and as soon as any one of them was informed against, he put him to death without the formality of a trial. He was enraged against them, because, after his proclamation by which he commanded all astrologers to quit home, and Italy also, before the Calends, the first, of October, a bill was immediately posted about the city. With the following words, Take notice, 712 The Chaldeans also decree that Vitellius Germanicus shall be no more, by the day of the said Calends. He was even suspected of being accessory to his mother's death, by forbidding sustenance to be given her when she was unwell. A German which 713, whom he held to be oracular, having told him, that he would long reign in security if he survived his mother. But others say, that being quite weary of the state of affairs, and apprehensive of the future, she obtained without difficulty a dose of poison from her son. 15. In the eighth month of his reign, the troops both in Mesia and Pannonia revolted from him. As did likewise, of the armies beyond sea, those in Judea and Syria, some of which swore allegiance to Vespasian as emperor in his own presence, and others in his absence. In order, therefore, to secure the favour and affection of the people, Vitellius lavished on all around whatever he had it in his power to bestow, both publicly and privately, in the most extravagant manner. He also levied soldiers in the city, and promised all who enlisted as volunteers, not only their discharge after the victory was gained, but all the rewards due to veterans who had served their full time in the wars. The enemy now pressing forward both by sea and land, on one hand he opposed against them his brother with a fleet, the new levies, and a body of gladiators, and in another quarter the troops and generals who were engaged at Bedriacum. But being beaten or betrayed in every direction, he agreed with Flavius Sabinus, Vespasian's brother, to abdicate, on condition of having his life spared, and a hundred millions of sesterces granted him. And he immediately, upon the palace steps, publicly declared to a large body of soldiers there assembled, that he resigned the government, which he had accepted reluctantly. But they all remonstrating against it, he deferred the conclusion of the treaty. Next day, early in the morning, he came down to the forum in a very mean habit, and with many tears repeated the declaration from a writing which he held in his hand. But the soldiers and people again interposing, and encouraging him not to give way, but to rely on their zealous support, he recovered his courage, and forced Sabinus, with the rest of the Flavian party, who now thought themselves secure, to retreat into the capital, where he destroyed them all by setting fire to the temple of Jupiter, whilst he beheld the contest and the fire from Tiberius's house 714, where he was feasting. Not long after, 
repenting of what he had done, and throwing the blame of it upon others, he called a meeting, and swore, that nothing was dearer to him than the public peace, which oath he also obliged the rest to take. Then drawing a dagger from his side, he presented it first to the consul, and, upon his refusing it, to the magistrates, and then to every one of the senators. But none of them being willing to accept it, he went away, as if he meant to lay it up in the temple of Concord. But some crying out to him, You are Concord, he came back again, and said that he would not only keep his weapon, but for the future use the cognomen of Concord. 16. He advised the Senate to send deputies, accompanied by the Vestal Virgins, to desire peace, or, at least, time for consultation. The day after, while he was waiting for an answer, he received intelligence by a scout, that the enemy was advancing. Immediately, therefore, throwing himself into a small litter, borne by hand, with only two attendants, a baker and a cook, he privately withdrew to his father's house, on the Aventine Hill, intending to escape thence into Campania. But a groundless report being circulated, that the enemy was willing to come to terms, he suffered himself to be carried back to the palace. Finding, however, nobody there, and those who were with him stealing away, he girded round his waist a belt full of gold pieces, and then ran into the porter's lodge, tying the dog before the door, and piling up against it the bed and bedding. 17. By this time the forerunners of the enemy's army had broken into the palace, and meeting with nobody, searched, as was natural, every corner. Being dragged by them out of his cell, and asked who he was. For they did not recognize him, and if he knew where Vitellius was, he deceived them by a falsehood. But at last being discovered, he begged hard to be detained in custody, even were it in a prison. Pretending to have something to say which concerned Vespasian's security. Nevertheless, he was dragged half naked into the forum, with his hands tied behind him, a rope about his neck, and his clothes torn amidst the most contemptuous abuse, both by word and deed, along the Via Sacra. His head being held back by the hair, in the manner of condemned criminals, and the point of a sword put under his chin, that he might hold up his face to public view. Some of the mob, meanwhile, pelting him with dung and mud, whilst others called him an incendiary and glutton. They also upbraided him with the defects of his person, for he was monstrously tall, and had a face usually very red with hard drinking, a large belly, and one thigh weak, occasioned by a chariot running against him. As he was attending upon Caius 715, while he was driving. At length, upon the scaly Gemonii, he was tormented and put to death in lingering tortures, and then dragged by a hook into the Tiber. 18. He perished with his brother and son 716, in the fifty-seventh year of his age 717, and verified the prediction of those who, from the omen which happened to him at Vienne, as before related 718, foretold that he would be made prisoner by some man of Gaul. For he was seized by Antoninus Primus, a general of the adverse party, who was born at Toulouse, and, when a boy, had the cognomen of Becco 719, which signifies a cock's beak. After the extinction of the race of the Caesars, the possession of the imperial power became extremely precarious, and great influence in the army was the means which now invariably led to the throne. The soldiers having arrogated to themselves the right of nomination, they either unanimously elected one and the same person, or different parties supporting the interests of their respective favorites, there arose between them a contention, which was usually determined by an appeal to arms, and followed by the assassination of the unsuccessful competitor. Vitellius, by being a parasite of all the emperors from Tiberius to Nero inclusively, had risen to a high military rank, by which, with a spirit of enterprise, and large promises to the soldiery, it was not difficult to snatch the reins of government, while they were yet fluctuating in the hands of Otho. His ambition prompted to the attempt, and his boldness was crowned with success. In the service of the four preceding emperors, Vitellius had imbibed the principal vices of them all, but what chiefly distinguished him was extreme voraciousness, which, though he usually pampered it with enormous luxury, could yet be gratified by the vilest and most offensive garbage. The pusillanimity discovered by this emperor at his death, forms a striking contrast to the heroic behavior of Otho. 
T. Flavius Vespasianus Augustus. I. The empire, which had been long thrown into a disturbed and unset state, by the rebellion and violent death of its three last rulers, was at length restored to peace and security by the Flavian family, whose descent was indeed obscure. And which boasted no ancestral honours. But the public had no cause to regret its elevation, though it is acknowledged that Domitian met with the just reward of his avarice and cruelty. Titus Flavius Petro, a townsman of Reate 720, whether a centurion or an evocator 721 of Pompey's party in the civil war, is uncertain, fled out of the battle of Pharsalia and went home. Where, having at last obtained his pardon and discharge, he became a collector of the money raised by public sales in the way of auction. His son, surnamed Sabinus, was never engaged in the military service, though some say he was a centurion of the first order, and others, that whilst he held that rank, he was discharged on account of his bad state of health, this Sabinus, I say, was a publican, and received the tax of the fortieth penny in Asia. And there were remaining, at the time of the advancement of the family, several statues, which had been erected to him by the cities of that province, with this inscription, to the honest tax farmer. 722 he afterwards turned usurer amongst the Helvetii, and there died, leaving behind him his wife, Vespasia Pella, and two sons by her, the elder of whom, Sabinus, came to be prefect of the city, and the younger, Vespasian, to be emperor. Paula, descended of a good family, at Nersia 723, had for her father Vespasius Pollio, thrice appointed military tribune, and at last prefect of the camp, and her brother was a senator of Praetorian dignity. There is to this day, about six miles from Nersia, on the road to Spoletum, a place on the summit of a hill, called Vespasii, where are several monuments of the Vespasii, a sufficient proof of the splendor and antiquity of the family. I will not deny that some have pretended to say, that Petro's father was a native of Gallia Transpadana 724, whose employment was to hire workpeople who used to emigrate every year from the country of the Umbria into that of the Sabines. To assist them in their husbandry 725. But who settled at last in the town of Reate, and there married. But of this I have not been able to discover the least proof, upon the strictest inquiry. 2. Vespasian was born in the country of the Sabines, beyond Reate, in a little country seat called Falacrin, upon the fifth of the Calends of December, November 27th, in the evening. In the consulship of Quintus Sulpicius Camerinus and Caius Papaius Sabinus, five years before the death of Augustus 726. And was educated under the care of Tertulla, his grandmother by the father's side, upon an estate belonging to the family, at Cosa 727. After his advancement to the empire, he used frequently to visit the place where he had spent his infancy. And the villa was continued in the same condition, that he might see everything about him just as he had been used to do. And he had so great a regard for the memory of his grandmother, that, upon solemn occasions and festival days, he constantly drank out of a silver cup which she had been accustomed to use. After assuming the manly habit, he had a long time a distaste for the senator in toga, though his brother had obtained it, nor could he be persuaded by any one but his mother to sue for that badge of honour. She at length drove him to it, more by taunts and reproaches, than by her entreaties and authority, calling him now and then, by way of reproach, his brother's footman. He served as military tribune in Thrace. When made quester, the province of Crete and Cyrene fell to him by lot. He was candidate for the aedileship, and soon after for the praetorship, but met with a repulse in the former case. Though at last, with much difficulty, he came in sixth on the poll books. But the office of praetor he carried upon his first canvas, standing amongst the highest at the poll. Being incensed against the Senate and desirous to gain, by all possible means, the good graces of Caius 728, he obtained leave to exhibit extraordinary 729 games for the emperor's victory in Germany. And advised them to increase the punishment of the conspirators against his life, by exposing their corpses unburied. He likewise gave him thanks in that august assembly for the honor of being admitted to his table. 3. Meanwhile, he married Flavia Domitilla, who had formerly been the mistress of Statilius Capella, a Roman knight of Sabrata in Africa, who, Domitilla, 
enjoyed Latin rights. And was soon after declared fully and freely a citizen of Rome, on a trial before the court of recovery, brought by her father Flavius Liberalis, a native of Ferentum, but no more than secretary to a quester. By her he had the following children, Titus, Domitian, and Domitilla. He outlived his wife and daughter, and lost them both before he became emperor. After the death of his wife, he renewed his union 730 with his former concubine Canis, the freedwoman of Antonia, and also her amanuensis, and treated her, even after he was emperor, almost as if she had been his lawful wife. 731. 4. In the reign of Claudius, by the interest of Narcissus, he was sent to Germany, in command of a legion, whence being removed into Britain, he engaged the enemy in thirty several battles. He reduced under subjection to the Romans two very powerful tribes, and above twenty great towns, with the Isle of Wight, which lies close to the coast of Britain. Partly under the command of Aulus Plautius, the consular lieutenant, and partly under Claudius himself 732. For this success he received the triumphal ornaments, and in a short time after two priesthoods, besides the consulship, which he held during the two last months of the year 733. The interval between that and his proconsulship he spent in leisure and retirement, for fear of Agrippina, who still held great sway over her son, and hated all the friends of Narcissus, who was then dead. Afterwards he got by lot the province of Africa, which he governed with great reputation, excepting that once, in an insurrection at Adramedum, he was pelted with turnips. It is certain that he returned thence nothing richer. For his credit was so low, that he was obliged to mortgage his whole property to his brother, and was reduced to the necessity of dealing in mules, for the support of his rank, for which reason he was commonly called the muleteer. He is said likewise to have been convicted of extorting from a young man of fashion two hundred thousand sesterces for procuring him the broad stripe, contrary to the wishes of his father, and was severely reprimanded for it. While in attendance upon Nero in Achaia, he frequently withdrew from the theatre while Nero was singing, and went to sleep if he remained, which gave so much offence, that he was not only excluded from his society, but debarred the liberty of saluting him in public. Upon this, he retired to a small out-of-the-way town, where he lay skulking in constant fear of his life, until a province, with an army, was offered him. A firm persuasion had long prevailed through all the East 734, that it was fated for the empire of the world, at that time, to devolve on some who should go forth from Judea. This prediction referred to a Roman emperor, as the event shewed. But the Jews, applying it to themselves, broke out into rebellion, and having defeated and slain their governor 735, routed the lieutenant of Syria 736, a man of consular rank, who was advancing to his assistance, and took an eagle, the standard of one of his legions. As the suppression of this revolt appeared to require a stronger force and an active general, who might be safely trusted in an affair of so much importance, Vespasian was chosen in preference to all others, both for his known activity. And on account of the obscurity of his origin and name, being a person of whom there could be not the least jealousy. Two legions, therefore, eight squadrons of horse, and ten cohorts, being added to the former troops in Judea, and, taking with him his eldest son as lieutenant, as soon as he arrived in his province. He turned the eyes of the neighboring provinces upon him, by reforming immediately the discipline of the camp, and engaging the enemy once or twice with such resolution, that, in the attack of a castle 737, he had his knee hurt by the stroke of a stone, and received several arrows in his shield. V. After the deaths of Nero and Galba, whilst Otho and Vitellius were contending for the sovereignty, he entertained hopes of obtaining the empire, with the prospect of which he had long before flattered himself, from the following omens. Upon an estate belonging to the Flavian family, in the neighborhood of Rome, there was an old oak, sacred to Mars, which, at the three several deliveries of Vespasia, put out each time a new branch. Evident intimations of the future fortune of each child. The first was but a slender one, which quickly withered away, and accordingly, the girl that was born did not live long. The second became vigorous, which portended great good fortune. But the third grew like a tree. His father, Sabinus, encouraged by these omens, which were confirmed by the augurs, told his mother, 
that her grandson would be Emperor of Rome. At which she laughed heartily, wondering, she said, that her son should be in his dotage whilst she continued still in full possession of her faculties. Afterwards in his aedileship, when Caius Caesar, being enraged at his not taking care to have the streets kept clean, ordered the soldiers to fill the bosom of his gown with dirt. Some persons at that time construed it into a sign that the government, being trampled underfoot and deserted in some civil commotion, would fall under his protection, and as it were into his lap. Once, while he was at dinner, a strange dog, that wandered about the streets, brought a man's hand 738, and laid it under the table. And another time, while he was at supper, a plough ox throwing the yoke off his neck, broke into the room, and after he had frightened away all the attendants, on a sudden, as if he was tired, fell down at his feet, as he lay still upon his couch, and hung down his neck. A cypress tree likewise, in a field belonging to the family, was torn up by the roots, and laid flat upon the ground, when there was no violent wind, but next day it rose again fresher and stronger than before. He dreamt in Achaia that the good fortune of himself and his family would begin when Nero had a tooth drawn, and it happened that the day after, a surgeon coming into the hall, showed him a tooth which he had just extracted from Nero. In Dudea, upon his consulting the oracle of the divinity at Carmel 739, the answer was so encouraging as to assure him of success in anything he projected, however great or important it might be. And when Josephus 740, one of the noble prisoners, was put in chains, he confidently affirmed that he should be released in a very short time by the same Vespasian, but he would be emperor first 741. Some omens were likewise mentioned in the news from Rome, and among others, that Nero, towards the close of his days, was commanded in a dream to carry Jupiter's sacred chariot out of the sanctuary where it stood, to Vespasian's house. And conduct it thence into the circus. Also not long afterwards, as Galba was going to the election, in which he was created consul for the second time, a statue of the divine Julius 742 turned towards the east. And in the field of Bedriacum 743, before the battle began, two eagles engaged in the sight of the army, and one of them being beaten, a third came from the east, and drove away the conqueror. 6. He made, however, no attempt upon the sovereignty, though his friends were very ready to support him, and even pressed him to the enterprise, until he was encouraged to it by the fortuitous aid of persons unknown to him and at a distance. Two thousand men, drawn out of three legions in the Mosian army, had been sent to the assistance of Otho. While they were upon their march, news came that he had been defeated, and had put an end to his life. Notwithstanding which they continued their march as far as Aquileia, pretending that they gave no credit to the report. There, tempted by the opportunity which the disorder of the times afforded them, they ravaged and plundered the country at discretion. Until at length, fearing to be called to an account on their return, and punished for it, they resolved upon choosing and creating an emperor. For they were no ways inferior, they said, to the army which made Galba emperor, nor to the Praetorian troops which had set up Otho, nor the army in Germany, to whom Vitellius owed his elevation. The names of all the consular lieutenants, therefore, being taken into consideration, and one objecting to one, and another to another, for various reasons. At last some of the third legion, which a little before Nero's death had been removed out of Syria into Mesia, extolled Vespasian in high terms, and all the rest assenting, his name was immediately inscribed on their standards. The design was nevertheless quashed for a time, the troops being brought to submit to Vitellius a little longer. However, the fact becoming known, Tiberius Alexander, governor of Egypt, first obliged the legions under his command to swear obedience to Vespasian as their emperor, on the Calends, the first, of July. Which was observed ever after as the day of his accession to the empire. And upon the fifth of the Ides of the same month, the July twenty-eighth, the army in Judea, where he then was, also swore allegiance to him. What contributed greatly to forward the affair, was a copy of a letter, whether real or counterfeit, which was circulated, and said to have been written by Otho before his decease to Vespasian. Recommending to him in the most urgent terms to avenge his death, and entreating him to come to the aid of the commonwealth. As well as a report which was circulated, that Vitellius, after his success against Otho, 
proposed to change the winter quarters of the legions, and remove those in Germany to a less hazardous station in a warmer climate. Moreover, amongst the governors of provinces, Licinius Mucianus dropping the grudge arising from a jealousy of which he had hitherto made no secret, promised to join him with the Syrian army, and, among the allied kings, Volugesus. King of the Parthians, offered him a reinforcement of forty thousand archers. Seven, having, therefore, entered on a civil war, and sent forward his generals and forces into Italy, he himself, in the meantime, passed over to Alexandria, to obtain possession of the key of Egypt 744. Here having entered alone, without attendance, the temple of Serapis, to take the auspices respecting the establishment of his power, and having done his utmost to propitiate the deity, upon turning round. His freedman, Basilide 745 appeared before him, and seemed to offer him the sacred leaves, chaplets, and cakes, according to the usage of the place, although no one had admitted him, and he had long labored under a muscular debility. Which would hardly have allowed him to walk into the temple. Besides which, it was certain that at the very time he was far away. Immediately after this, arrived letters with intelligence that Vitellius's troops had been defeated at Cremona, and he himself slain at Rome. Vespasian, the new emperor, having been raised unexpectedly from a low estate, wanted something which might clothe him with divine majesty and authority. This, likewise, was now added. A poor man who was blind, and another who was lame, came both together before him, when he was seated on the tribunal, imploring him to heal them 746, and saying that they were admonished in a dream by the god Serapis to seek his aid. Who assured them that he would restore sight to the one by anointing his eyes with his spittle, and give strength to the leg of the other, if he vouchsafed but to touch it with his heel. At first he could scarcely believe that the thing would anyhow succeed, and therefore hesitated to venture on making the experiment. At length, however, by the advice of his friends, he made the attempt publicly, in the presence of the assembled multitudes, and it was crowned with success in both cases 747. About the same time, at Tegia in Arcadia, by the direction of some soothsayers, several vessels of ancient workmanship were dug out of a consecrated place, on which there was an effigy resembling Vespasian. 8. Returning now to Rome, under these auspices, and with a great reputation, after enjoying a triumph for victories over the Jews, he added eight consulship 748 to his former one. He likewise assumed the censorship, and made it his principal concern, during the whole of his government, first to restore order in the state, which had been almost ruined, and was in a tottering condition, and then to improve it. The soldiers, one part of them emboldened by victory, and the other smarting with the disgrace of their defeat, had abandoned themselves to every species of licentiousness and insolence. Nay, the provinces, too, and free cities, and some kingdoms in alliance with Rome, were all in a disturbed state. He, therefore, disbanded many of Vitellius's soldiers, and punished others. And so far was he from granting any extraordinary favors to the sharers of his success, that it was late before he paid the gratuities due to them by law. That he might let slip no opportunity of reforming the discipline of the army, upon a young man's coming much perfumed to return him thanks for having appointed him to command a squadron of horse, he turned away his head in disgust, and giving him this sharp reprimand, I had rather you had smelt of garlic, revoked his commission. When the men belonging to the fleet, who travelled by turns from Ostia and Putiali to Rome, petitioned for an addition to their pay, under the name of shoe money, thinking that it would answer little purpose to send them away without a reply. He ordered them for the future to run barefooted. And so they have done ever since. He deprived of their liberties, Achaia, Lycia, Rhodes, Byzantium, and Samos, and reduced them into the form of provinces. Thrace, also, and Cilicia, as well as Comagene, which until that time had been under the government of kings. He stationed some legions in Cappadocia on account of the frequent inroads of the barbarians, and, instead of a Roman knight, appointed as governor of it a man of consular rank. The ruins of houses which had been burnt down long before, being a great decite to the city, he gave leave to any one who would, to take possession of the void ground and build upon it. If the proprietors should hesitate to perform the work themselves, 
He resolved upon rebuilding the capital, and was the foremost to put his hand to clearing the ground of the rubbish, and remove some of it upon his own shoulder. And he undertook, likewise, to restore the three thousand tables of brass which had been destroyed in the fire which consumed the capital. Searching in all quarters for copies of those curious and ancient records, in which were contained the decrees of the Senate, almost from the building of the city, as well as the acts of the people, relative to alliances, treaties, and privileges granted to any person. 9. He likewise erected several new public buildings, namely, the Temple of Peace 749 near the Forum, that of Claudius on the Coelian Mount, which had been begun by Agrippina, but almost entirely demolished by Nero 750. And an amphitheater 751 in the middle of the city, upon finding that Augustus had projected such a work. He purified the senatorian and equestrian orders, which had been much reduced by the havoc made amongst them at several times, and was fallen into disrepute by neglect. Having expelled the most unworthy, he chose in their room the most honorable persons in Italy and the provinces. And to let it be known that those two orders differed not so much in privileges as in dignity, he declared publicly, when some altercation passed between a senator and a Roman knight, that senators ought not to be treated with scurrilous language. Unless they were the aggressors, and then it was fair and lawful to return it. X. The business of the courts had prodigiously accumulated, partly from old lawsuits which, on account of the interruption that had been given to the course of justice, still remained undecided. And partly from the accession of new suits arising out of the disorder of the times. He, therefore, chose commissioners by lot to provide for the restitution of what had been seized by violence during the war, and others with extraordinary jurisdiction to decide causes belonging to the centumbri and reduce them to as small a number as possible, for the dispatch of which, otherwise, the lives of the litigants could scarcely allow sufficient time. 11. Lust and luxury, from the license which had long prevailed, had also grown to an enormous height. He, therefore, obtained a decree of the Senate, that a woman who formed an union with the slave of another person, should be considered a bondwoman herself and that usurers should not be allowed to take proceedings at law for the recovery of money lent to young men whilst they lived in their father's family, not even after their fathers were dead. 12. In other affairs, from the beginning to the end of his government, he conducted himself with great moderation and clemency. He was so far from dissembling the obscurity of his extraction, that he frequently made mention of it himself. When some affected to trace his pedigree to the founders of Reate, and a companion of Hercules 752, whose monument is still to be seen on the Salarian road, he laughed at them for it. And he was so little fond of external and adventitious ornaments, that, on the day of his triumph 753, being quite tired of the length and tediousness of the procession, he could not forbear saying, he was rightly served. For having in his old age been so silly as to desire a triumph. As if it was either due to his ancestors, or had ever been expected by himself. Nor would he for a long time accept of the tribunician authority, or the title of father of his country. And in regard to the custom of searching those who came to salute him, he dropped it even in the time of the civil war. 13. He bore with great mildness the freedom used by his friends, the satirical illusions of advocates, and the petulance of philosophers. Licinius Mucianus, who had been guilty of notorious acts of lewdness, but, presuming upon his great services, treated him very rudely, he reproved only in private. And when complaining of his conduct to a common friend of theirs, he concluded with these words, However, I am a man. Salvius Liberalis, in pleading the cause of a rich man under prosecution, presuming to say, What is it to Caesar, if Hipparchus possesses a hundred millions of sesterces, he commended him for it. Demetrius, the cynic philosopher 754, who had been sentenced to banishment, meeting him on the road, and refusing to rise up or salute him, nay, snarling at him in scurrilous language, he only called him a cur. 14. He was little disposed to keep up the memory of affronts or quarrels, nor did he harbor any resentment on account of them. He made a very splendid marriage for the daughter of his enemy Vitellius, and gave her, besides, a suitable fortune and equipage. Being in a great consternation after he was forbidden the court in the time of Nero, 
and asking those about him, what he should do. Or, whither he should go. One of those whose office it was to introduce people to the emperor, thrusting him out, bid him go to Morbonia 755. But when this same person came afterwards to beg his pardon, he only vented his resentment in nearly the same words. He was so far from being influenced by suspicion or fear to seek the destruction of any one, that, when his friends advised him to beware of Medius Pomposianus, because it was commonly believed, on his nativity being cast. That he was destined by fate to the empire, he made him consul, promising for him, that he would not forget the benefit conferred. 15. It will scarcely be found, that so much as one innocent person suffered in his reign, unless in his absence, and without his knowledge, or, at least, contrary to his inclination, and when he was imposed upon. Although Helvidius Priscus 756 was the only man who presumed to salute him on his return from Syria by his private name of Vespasian, and, when he came to be praetor, omitted any mark of honour to him, or even any mention of him in his edicts. Yet he was not angry, until Helvidius proceeded to inveigh against him with the most scurrilous language. Though he did indeed banish him, and afterwards ordered him to be put to death, yet he would gladly have saved him notwithstanding, and accordingly dispatched messengers to fetch back the executioners. And he would have saved him, had he not been deceived by a false account brought, that he had already perished. He never rejoiced at the death of any man, nay he would shed tears, and sigh, at the just punishment of the guilty. 16. The only thing deservedly blamable in his character was his love of money. For not satisfied with reviving the imposts which had been repealed in the time of Galba, he imposed new and onerous taxes, augmented the tribute of the provinces, and doubled that of some of them. He likewise openly engaged in a traffic, which is discreditable 757 even to a private individual, buying great quantities of goods, for the purpose of retailing them again to advantage. Nay, he made no scruple of selling the great offices of the state to candidates, and pardons to persons under prosecution, whether they were innocent or guilty. It is believed, that he advanced all the most rapacious amongst the procurators to higher offices, with the view of squeezing them after they had acquired great wealth. He was commonly said, to have used them as sponges, because it was his practice, as we may say, to wet them when dry, and squeeze them when wet. It is said that he was naturally extremely covetous, and was upbraided with it by an old herdsman of his, who, upon the emperor's refusing to enfranchise him gratis, which on his advancement he humbly petitioned for, cried out. That the fox changed his hair, but not his nature. On the other hand, some are of opinion, that he was urged to his rapacious proceedings by necessity, and the extreme poverty of the treasury and exchequer, of which he took public notice in the beginning of his reign. Declaring that, no less than four hundred thousand millions of sesterces were wanting to carry on the government. This is the more likely to be true, because he applied to the best purposes what he procured by bad means. 17. His liberality, however, to all ranks of people, was excessive. He made up to several senators the estate required by law to qualify them for that dignity. Relieving likewise such men of consular rank as were poor, with a yearly allowance of 500,000 sesterces 758. And rebuilt, in a better manner than before, several cities in different parts of the empire, which had been damaged by earthquakes or fires. 18. He was a great encourager of learning and the liberal arts. He first granted to the Latin and Greek professors of rhetoric the yearly stipend of a hundred thousand sesterces 759 each out of the exchequer. He also bought the freedom of superior poets and artists 760, and gave a noble gratuity to the restorer of the cone of Venus 761, and to another artist who repaired the Colossus 762. Some one offering to convey some immense columns into the capital at a small expense by a mechanical contrivance, he rewarded him very handsomely for his invention, but would not accept his service, saying, Suffer me to find maintenance for the poor people. 763. 19. In the games celebrated when the stage scenery of the theatre of Marcellus 764 was repaired, he restored the old musical entertainments. He gave Apollinaris, the tragedian, 400,000 sesterces, and to Terpinus and Diodorus, the harpers, 200,000, 
to some a hundred thousand. And the least he gave to any of the performers was forty thousand, besides many golden crowns. He entertained company constantly at his table, and often in great state and very sumptuously, in order to promote trade. As in the Saturnalia he made presents to the men which they were to carry away with them, so did he to the women upon the calends of March 765, notwithstanding which, he could not wipe off the disrepute of his former stinginess. The Alexandrians called him constantly Sibiosax, a name which had been given to one of their kings who was sordidly avaricious. Nay, at his funeral, Favo, the principal mimic, personating him, and imitating, as actors do, both his manner of speaking and his gestures, asked aloud of the procurators, how much his funeral and the procession would cost. And being answered, ten millions of sesterces, he cried out, Give him but a hundred thousand sesterces, and they might throw his body into the Tiber, if they would. XX. He was broad set, strong limbed, and his features gave the idea of a man in the act of straining himself. In consequence, one of the city wits, upon the emperor's desiring him to say something droll respecting himself, facetiously answered, I will, when you have done relieving your bowels. 766 He enjoyed a good state of health, though he used no other means to preserve it, than repeated friction, as much as he could bear, on his neck and other parts of his body, in the tennis court attached to the baths. Besides fasting one day in every month. XXI His method of life was commonly this. After he became emperor, he used to rise very early, often before daybreak. Having read over his letters, and the briefs of all the departments of the government offices, he admitted his friends. And while they were paying him their compliments, he would put on his own shoes, and dress himself with his own hands. Then, after the dispatch of such business as was brought before him, he rode out, and afterwards retired to repose, lying on his couch with one of his mistresses, of whom he kept several after the death of Canis 767. Coming out of his private apartments, he passed to the bath, and then entered the supper room. They say that he was never more good humoured and indulgent than at that time, and therefore his attendants always seized that opportunity, when they had any favour to ask. 22. At supper, and, indeed, at other times, he was extremely free and jocose. For he had humour, but of a low kind, and he would sometimes use indecent language, such as is addressed to young girls about to be married. Yet there are some things related of him not void of ingenious pleasantry, amongst which are the following. Being once reminded by Mestrius Floris, that plostra was a more proper expression than plostra, he the next day saluted him by the name of Floris 768. A certain lady pretending to be desperately enamoured of him, he was prevailed upon to admit her to his bed, and after he had gratified her desires, he gave her 769 400,000 sesterces. When his steward desired to know how he would have the sum entered in his accounts, he replied, for Vespasian's being seduced. Xei, he used Greek verses very wittily. Speaking of a tall man, who had enormous parts. Maxi Bibus, Croton Dolikoskian Anchos. Still shaking, as he strode, his vast long spear. And of Serilus, a freedman, who being very rich, had begun to pass himself off as freeborn, to elude the exchequer at his decease, and assumed the name of Laches, he said. O Laches, Laches. Epinapothenes, Othus ex Archis Easy Carolos. Ah, Laches, Laches. When thou art no more. Thou LT Serilus be called, just as before. He chiefly affected wit upon his own shameful means of raising money, in order to wipe off the odium by some joke, and turn it into ridicule. One of his ministers, who was much in his favour, requesting of him a stewardship for some person, under pretence of his being his brother, he deferred granting him his petition, and in the meantime sent for the candidate. And having squeezed out of him as much money as he had agreed to give to his friend at court, he appointed him immediately to the office. The minister soon after renewing his application, you must, said he, find another brother, for the one you adopted is in truth mine. Suspecting once, during a journey, that his mule driver had alighted to shoe his mules, only in order to have an opportunity for allowing a person they met, who was engaged in a lawsuit, to speak to him, 
he asked him. How much he got for shoeing his mules. And insisted on having a share of the profit. When his son Titus blamed him for even laying a tax upon urine, he applied to his nose a piece of the money he received in the first installment, and asked him, if it stunk. And he replying no, and yet, said he, it is derived from urine. Some deputies having come to acquaint him that a large statue, which would cost a vast sum, was ordered to be erected for him at the public expense, he told them to pay it down immediately, holding out the hollow of his hand, and saying, There was a base ready for the statue. Not even when he was under the immediate apprehension and peril of death, could he forbear jesting. For when, among other prodigies, the mausoleum of the Caesars suddenly flew open, and a blazing star appeared in the heavens. One of the prodigies, he said, concerned Julia Calvina, who was of the family of Augustus 770, and the other, the king of the Parthians, who wore his hair long. And when his distemper first seized him, I suppose, said he, I shall soon be a god. 771. 24. In his ninth consulship, being seized, while in Campania, with a slight indisposition, and immediately returning to the city, he soon afterwards went thence to Cutilii 772, and his estates in the country about Riate, where he used constantly to spend the summer. Here, though his disorder much increased, and he injured his bowels by too free use of the cold waters, he nevertheless attended to the dispatch of business, and even gave audience to ambassadors in bed. At last, being taken ill of a diarrhea, to such a degree that he was ready to faint, he cried out, an emperor ought to die standing upright. In endeavouring to rise, he died in the hands of those who were helping him up, upon the 8th of the Calends of July, June 24, 773, being sixty-nine years, one month, and seven days old. 25. All are agreed that he had such confidence in the calculations on his own nativity and that of his sons, that, after several conspiracies against him, he told the Senate, that either his sons would succeed him, or nobody. It is said likewise, that he once saw in a dream a balance in the middle of the porch of the Palatine house exactly poised, in one scale of which stood Claudius and Nero, in the other, himself and his sons. The event corresponded to the symbol. For the reigns of the two parties were precisely of the same duration. 774. Neither consanguinity nor adoption, as formerly, but great influence in the army having now become the road to the imperial throne, no person could claim a better title to that elevation than Titus Flavius Vespasian. He had not only served with great reputation in the wars both in Britain and Judea, but seemed as yet untainted with any vice which could pervert his conduct in the civil administration of the empire. It appears, however, that he was prompted more by the persuasion of friends, than by his own ambition, to prosecute the attainment of the imperial dignity. To render this enterprise more successful, recourse was had to a new and peculiar artifice, which, while well accommodated to the superstitious credulity of the Romans, impressed them with an idea. That Vespasian's destiny to the throne was confirmed by supernatural indications. But, after his elevation, we hear no more of his miraculous achievements. The prosecution of the war in Britain, which had been suspended for some years, was resumed by Vespasian. And he sent thither Petilius Cerealis, who by his bravery extended the limits of the Roman province. Under Julius Frontinus, successor to that general, the invaders continued to make farther progress in the reduction of the island, but the commander who finally established the dominion of the Romans in Britain, was Julius Agricola. Not less distinguished for his military achievements, than for his prudent regard to the civil administration of the country. He began his operations with the conquest of North Wales, whence passing over into the island of Anglesey, which had revolted since the time of Suetonius Paulinus, he again reduced it to subjection. Then proceeding northwards with his victorious army, he defeated the Britons in every engagement, took possession of all the territories in the southern parts of the island, and driving before him all who refused to submit to the Roman arms. Penetrated even into the forests and mountains of Caledonia. He defeated the natives under Galvicus, their leader, in a decisive battle. And fixing a line of garrisons between the friths of Clyde and Forth, 
he secured the Roman province from the incursions of the people who occupied the parts of the island beyond that boundary. Wherever he established the Roman power, he introduced laws and civilization amongst the inhabitants, and employed every means of conciliating their affection, as well as of securing their obedience. The war in Dudea, which had been commenced under the former reign, was continued in that of Vespasian. But he left the siege of Jerusalem to be conducted by his son Titus, who displayed great valor and military talents in the prosecution of the enterprise. After an obstinate defense by the Jews, that city, so much celebrated in the sacred writings, was finally demolished, and the glorious temple itself, the admiration of the world, reduced to ashes. Contrary, however, to the will of Titus, who exerted his utmost efforts to extinguish the flames. The manners of the Romans had now attained to an enormous pitch of depravity, through the unbounded licentiousness of the times. And, to the honor of Vespasian, he discovered great zeal in his endeavors to effect a national reformation. Vigilant, active, and persevering, he was indefatigable in the management of public affairs, and rose in the winter before daybreak, to give audience to his officers of state. But if we give credit to the whimsical imposition of a tax upon urine, we cannot entertain any high opinion either of his talents as a financier, or of the resources of the Roman Empire. By his encouragement of science, he displayed a liberality, of which there occurs no example under all the preceding emperors, since the time of Augustus. Pliny the Elder was now in the height of reputation, as well as in great favor with Vespasian, and it was probably owing not a little to the advice of that minister, that the emperor showed himself so much the patron of literary men. A writer mentioned frequently by Pliny, and who lived in this reign, was Licinius Mucianus, a Roman knight, he treated of the history and geography of the eastern countries. Juvenal, who had begun his satires several years before, continued to inveigh against the flagrant vices of the times, but the only author whose writings we have to notice in the present reign, is a poet of a different class. C. Valerius Flaccus wrote a poem in eight books, on the expedition of the Argonauts, a subject which, next to the wars of Thebes and Troy, was in ancient times the most celebrated. Of the life of this author, biographers have transmitted no particulars, but we may place his birth in the reign of Tiberius, before all the writers who flourished in the Augustan age were extinct. He enjoyed the rays of the setting sun which had illumined that glorious period, and he discovers the efforts of an ambition to recall its meridian splendor. As the poem was left incomplete by the death of the author, we can only judge imperfectly of the conduct and general consistency of the fable, but the most difficult part having been executed, without any room for the censure of candid criticism. We may presume that the sequel would have been finished with an equal claim to indulgence, if not to applause. The traditional anecdotes relative to the Argonautic expedition are introduced with propriety, and embellished with the graces of poetical fiction. In describing scenes of tenderness, this author is happily pathetic, and in the heat of combat, proportionably animated. His similes present the imagination with beautiful imagery, and not only illustrate, but give additional force to the subject. We find in Flaccus a few expressions not countenanced by the authority of the most celebrated Latin writers. His language, however, in general, is pure, but his words are perhaps not always the best that might have been chosen. The versification is elevated, though not uniformly harmonious, and there pervades the whole poem an epic dignity, which renders it superior to the production ascribed to Orpheus, or to that of Apollonius, on the same subject. Titus Flavius Vespasianus Augustus I, Titus, who had the same cognomen with his father, was the darling and delight of mankind, so much did the natural genius, address, or good fortune he possessed tend to conciliate the favor of all. This was, indeed, extremely difficult, after he became emperor, as before that time, and even during the reign of his father, he lay under public odium and censure. He was born upon the third of the Calends of January, December 30th. In the year remarkable for the death of Caius 775, near the Septizonium 776, in a mean house, and a very small and dark room, which still exists, and is shown to the curious. 2. He was educated in the palace with Britannicus, and instructed in the same branches of learning, and under the same masters. 
During this time, they say, that a physiognomist being introduced by Narcissus, the freedman of Claudius, to examine the features of Britannicus 777, positively affirmed that he would never become emperor, but that Titus, who stood by, would. They were so familiar, that Titus being next him at table, is thought to have tasted of the fatal potion which put an end to Britannicus's life, and to have contracted from it a distemper which hung about him a long time. In remembrance of all these circumstances, he afterwards erected a golden statue of him in the Palladium, and dedicated to him an equestrian statue of ivory, attending it in the Circentian procession, in which it is still carried to this day. 3. While yet a boy, he was remarkable for his noble endowments both of body and mind, and as he advanced in years, they became still more conspicuous. He had a fine person, combining an equal mixture of majesty and grace. Was very strong, though not tall, and somewhat corpulent. Gifted with an excellent memory, and a capacity for all the arts of peace and war, he was a perfect master of the use of arms and writing. Very ready in the Latin and Greek tongues, both in verse and prose, and such was the facility he possessed in both, that he would harangue and versify extempore. Nor was he unacquainted with music, but could both sing and play upon the harp sweetly and scientifically. I have likewise been informed by many persons, that he was remarkably quick in writing shorthand, would in merriment and jest engage with his secretaries in the imitation of any handwriting he saw, and often say, that he was admirably qualified for forgery. 4. He filled with distinction the rank of a military tribune both in Germany and Britain, in which he conducted himself with the utmost activity, and no less modesty and reputation. As appears evident from the great number of statues, with honorable inscriptions, erected to him in various parts of both those provinces. After serving in the wars, he frequented the courts of law, but with less assiduity than applause. About the same time, he married Aracidia, the daughter of Tertullus, who was only a knight, but had formerly been prefect of the Praetorian Guards. After her decease, he married Marcia Fernilla, of a very noble family, but afterwards divorced her, taking from her the daughter he had by her. Upon the expiration of his questorship, he was raised to the rank of commander of a legion 778, and took the two strong cities of Terakia and Gamala, in Dudea. And having his horse killed under him in a battle, he mounted another, whose rider he had encountered and slain. V. Soon afterwards, when Galba came to be emperor, he was sent to congratulate him, and turned the eyes of all people upon himself, wherever he came. It being the general opinion amongst them, that the emperor had sent for him with a design to adopt him for his son. But finding all things again in confusion, he turned back upon the road. And going to consult the oracle of Venus at Paphos about his voyage, he received assurances of obtaining the empire for himself. These hopes were speedily strengthened, and being left to finish the reduction of Judea, in the final assault of Jerusalem, he slew seven of its defenders, with the like number of arrows, and took it upon his daughter's birth, day 779. So great was the joy and attachment of the soldiers, that, in their congratulations, they unanimously saluted him by the title of Emperor 780. And, upon his quitting the province soon afterwards, would needs have detained him, earnestly begging him, and that not without threats, either to stay, or take them all with him. This occurrence gave rise to the suspicion of his being engaged in a design to rebel against his father, and claim for himself the government of the East. And the suspicion increased, when, on his way to Alexandria, he wore a diadem at the consecration of the ox Apis at Memphis. And, though he did it only in compliance with an ancient religious usage of the country, yet there was some who put a bad construction upon it. Making, therefore, what haste he could into Italy, he arrived first at Regium, and sailing thence in a merchant ship to Puteoli, went to Rome with all possible expedition. Presenting himself unexpectedly to his father, he said, by way of contradicting the strange reports raised concerning him, I am come, father, I am come. 6. From that time he constantly acted as colleague with his father, and, indeed, as regent of the empire. He triumphed 781 with his father, bore jointly with him the office of censor 782, 
and was, besides, his colleague not only in the Tribunician Authority 783, but in 7 Consulship 784. Taking upon himself the care and inspection of all offices, he dictated letters, wrote proclamations in his father's name, and pronounced his speeches in the Senate in place of the quaestor. He likewise assumed the command of the Praetorian Guards, although no one but a Roman knight had ever before been their prefect. In this he conducted himself with great haughtiness and violence, taking off without scruple or delay all those he had most reason to suspect, after he had secretly sent his emissaries into the theatres and camp, to demand, as if by general consent, that the suspected persons should be delivered up to punishment. Among these, he invited to supper a Kisina, a man of consular rank, whom he ordered to be stabbed at his departure, immediately after he had gone out of the room. To this act, indeed, he was provoked by an imminent danger. For he had discovered a writing under the hand of Kisina, containing an account of a plot hatched among the soldiers. By these acts, though he provided for his future security, yet for the present he so much incurred the hatred of the people, that scarcely ever any one came to the empire with a more odious character, or more universally disliked. 7. Besides his cruelty, he lay under the suspicion of giving way to habits of luxury, as he often prolonged his revels till midnight with the most riotous of his acquaintance. Nor was he unsuspected of lewdness, on account of the swarms of catamites and eunuchs about him, and his well-known attachment to Queen Berenice 785, who received from him, as it is reported, a promise of marriage. He was supposed, besides, to be of a rapacious disposition, for it is certain, that, in causes which came before his father, he used to offer his interest for sale, and take bribes. In short, people publicly expressed an unfavorable opinion of him, and said he would prove another Nero. This prejudice, however, turned out in the end to his advantage, and enhanced his praises to the highest pitch when he was found to possess no vicious propensities, but, on the contrary, the noblest virtues. His entertainments were agreeable rather than extravagant, and he surrounded himself with such excellent friends, that the succeeding princes adopted them as most serviceable to themselves and the state. He immediately sent away Berenice from the city, much against both their inclinations. Some of his old eunuchs, though such accomplished dancers, that they bore an uncontrollable sway upon the stage, he was so far from treating with any extraordinary kindness. That he would not so much as witness their performances in the crowded theatre. He violated no private right, and if ever man refrained from injustice, he did, nay, he would not accept of the allowable and customary offerings. Yet, in munificence, he was inferior to none of the princes before him. Having dedicated his amphitheater 786, and built some warm baths 787 close by it with great expedition, he entertained the people with most magnificent spectacles. He likewise exhibited a naval fight in the old Namakia, besides a combat of gladiators, and in one day brought into the theater 5,000 wild beasts of all kinds. 788. 8. He was by nature extremely benevolent. For whereas all the emperors after Tiberius, according to the example he had set them, would not admit the grants made by former princes to be valid, unless they received their own sanction, he confirmed them all by one general edict. Without waiting for any applications respecting them. Of all who petitioned for any favor, he sent none away without hopes. And when his ministers represented to him that he promised more than he could perform, he replied, no one ought to go away downcast from an audience with his prince. Once at supper, reflecting that he had done nothing for any that day, he broke out into that memorable and justly admired saying, My friends, I have lost a day. 789 More particularly, he treated the people on all occasions with so much courtesy, that, on his presenting them with a show of gladiators, he declared, he should manage it, not according to his own fancy, but that of the spectators and did accordingly. He denied them nothing, and very frankly encouraged them to ask what they pleased. Espousing the cause of the Thracian party among the gladiators, he frequently joined in the popular demonstrations in their favor, but without compromising his dignity or doing injustice. To omit no opportunity of acquiring popularity, he sometimes made use himself of the baths he had erected, without excluding the common people. There happened in his reign some dreadful accidents. 
An eruption of Mount Vesuvius 790, in Campania, and a fire in Rome, which continued during three days and three nights 791, besides a plague, such as was scarcely ever known before. Amidst these many great disasters, he not only manifested the concern which might be expected from a prince but even the affection of a father, for his people. One while comforting them by his proclamations, and another while relieving them to the utmost of his power. He chose by lot, from amongst the men of consular rank, commissioners for repairing the losses in Campania. The estates of those who had perished by the eruption of Vesuvius, and who had left no heirs, he applied to the repair of the ruined cities. With regard to the public buildings destroyed by fire in the city, he declared that nobody should be a loser but himself. Accordingly, he applied all the ornaments of his palaces to the decoration of the temples, and purposes of public utility, and appointed several men of the equestrian order to superintend the work. For the relief of the people during the plague, he employed, in the way of sacrifice and medicine, all means both human and divine. Amongst the calamities of the times, were informers and their agents. A tribe of miscreants who had grown up under the license of former reigns. These he frequently ordered to be scourged or beaten with sticks in the forum, and then, after he had obliged them to pass through the amphitheatre as a public spectacle, commanded them to be sold for slaves. Or else banished them to some rocky islands. And to discourage such practices for the future, amongst other things, he prohibited actions to be successively brought under different laws for the same cause. Or the state of affairs of deceased persons to be inquired into after a certain number of years. 9. Having declared that he accepted the office of Pontifex Maximus for the purpose of preserving his hands undefiled, he faithfully adhered to his promise. For after that time he was neither directly nor indirectly concerned in the death of any person, though he sometimes was justly irritated. He swore that he would perish himself, rather than prove the destruction of any man. Two men of patrician rank being convicted of aspiring to the empire, he only advised them to desist, saying, that the sovereign power was disposed of by fate, and promised them, that if there was anything else they desired of him, he would grant it. He also immediately sent messengers to the mother of one of them, who was at a great distance, and in deep anxiety about her son, to assure her of his safety. Nay, he not only invited them to sup with him, but next day, at a show of gladiators, purposely placed them close by him, and handed to them the arms of the combatants for his inspection. It is said likewise, that having had their nativities cast, he assured them, that a great calamity was impending on both of them, but from another hand, and not from his. Though his brother was continually plotting against him, almost openly stirring up the armies to rebellion, and contriving to get away, yet he could not endure to put him to death, or to banish him from his presence. Nor did he treat him with less respect than before. But from his first accession to the empire, he constantly declared him his partner in it, and that he should be his successor. Begging of him sometimes in private, with tears in his eyes, to return the affection he had for him. X. Amidst all these favorable circumstances, he was cut off by an untimely death, more to the loss of mankind than himself. At the close of the public spectacles, he wept bitterly in the presence of the people, and then retired into the Sabine country 792, rather melancholy, because a victim had made its escape while he was sacrificing. And loud thunder had been heard while the atmosphere was serene. At the first resting place on the road, he was seized with a fever, and being carried forward in a litter, they say that he drew back the curtains, and looked up to heaven, complaining heavily, that his life was taken from him. Though he had done nothing to deserve it. For there was no action of his that he had occasion to repent of, but one. What that was, he neither disclosed himself, nor is it easy for us to conjecture. Some imagine that he alluded to the connection which he had formerly had with his brother's wife. But Domitia solemnly denied it on oath, which she would never have done, had there been any truth in the report. Nay, she would certainly have gloried in it, as she was forward enough to boast of all her scandalous intrigues. 11. He died in the same villa where his father had died before him, upon the Ides of September, the 13th of September. Two years, two months, and twenty days after he had succeeded his father, and in the one and fortieth year of his age 793. 
As soon as the news of his death was published, all people mourned for him, as for the loss of some near relative. The Senate assembled in haste, before they could be summoned by proclamation, and locking the doors of their house at first, but afterwards opening them, gave him such thanks, and heaped upon him such praises, now he was dead. As they never had done whilst he was alive and present amongst them. Titus Flavius Vespasian, the younger, was the first prince who succeeded to the empire by hereditary right. And having constantly acted, after his return from Judea, as colleague with his father in the administration, he seemed to be as well qualified by experience as he was by abilities, for conducting the affairs of the empire. But with respect to his natural disposition, and moral behavior, the expectations entertained by the public were not equally flattering. He was immoderately addicted to luxury, he had betrayed a strong inclination to cruelty. And he lived in a habitual practice of lewdness, no less unnatural than intemperate. But, with a degree of virtuous resolution unexampled in history, he had no sooner taken into his hands the entire reins of government, than he renounced every vicious attachment. Instead of wallowing in luxury, as before, he became a model of temperance, instead of cruelty, he displayed the strongest proofs of humanity and benevolence. And in the room of lewdness, he exhibited a transition to the most unblemished chastity and virtue. In a word, so sudden and great a change was never known in the character of mortal. And he had the peculiar glory to receive the appellation of, the darling and delight of mankind. Under a prince of such a disposition, the government of the empire could not but be conducted with the strictest regard to the public welfare. The reform, which was begun in the late reign, he prosecuted with the most ardent application. And, had he lived for a longer time, it is probable that his authority and example would have produced the most beneficial effects upon the manners of the Romans. During the reign of this emperor, in the seventy-ninth year of the Christian era, happened the first eruption of Mount Vesuvius, which has ever since been celebrated for its volcano. Before this time, Vesuvius is spoken of, by ancient writers, as being covered with orchards and vineyards, and of which the middle was dry and barren. The eruption was accompanied by an earthquake, which destroyed several cities of Campania, particularly Pompeii and Herculaneum, while the lava, pouring down the mountain in torrents, overwhelmed, in various directions, the adjacent plains. The burning ashes were carried not only over the neighboring country, but as far as the shores of Egypt, Libya, and even Syria. Amongst those to whom this dreadful eruption proved fatal, was Pliny, the celebrated naturalist, whose curiosity to examine the phenomenon led him so far within the verge of danger, that he could not afterwards escape. Pliny, surnamed the Elder, was born at Verona, of a noble family. He distinguished himself early by his military achievements in the German war, received the dignity of an augur, at Rome, and was afterwards appointed governor of Spain. In every public character, he acquitted himself with great reputation, and enjoyed the esteem of the several emperors under whom he lived. The assiduity with which he applied himself to the collection of information, either curious or useful, surpasses all example. From an early hour in the morning, until late at night, he was almost constantly employed in discharging the duties of his public station, in reading or hearing books read by his amanuensis. And in extracting from them whatever seemed worthy of notice. Even during his meals, and while travelling in his carriage upon business, he prosecuted with unremitting zeal and diligence his taste for inquiry and compilation. No man ever displayed so strong a persuasion of the value of time, or availed himself so industriously of it. He considered every moment as lost which was not employed in literary pursuits. The books which he wrote, in consequence of this indefatigable exertion, were, according to the account transmitted by his nephew, Pliny the Younger, numerous, and on various subjects. The catalogue of them is as follows, a book on equestrian archery, which discovered much skill in the art, the life of Q, Pomponius Secundus, twenty books of the wars of Germany, a complete treatise on the education of an orator, in six volumes. Eight books of doubtful discourses, written in the latter part of the reign of Nero, when every kind of moral discussion was attended with danger. With a hundred and sixty volumes of remarks on the writings of the various authors which he had perused. For the last-mentioned production only, and before it was brought near to its accomplishment, we are told, 
that he was offered by Largius Licinius 400,000 sesterces, amounting to upwards of 3,200 pounds sterling. An enormous sum for the copyright of a book before the invention of printing. But the only surviving work of this voluminous author is his natural history, in 37 books, compiled from the various writers who had treated of that extensive and interesting subject. If we estimate this great work either by the authenticity of the information which it contains, or its utility in promoting the advancement of arts and sciences, we should not consider it as an object of any extraordinary encomiums. But when we view it as a literary monument, which displays the whole knowledge of the ancients, relative to natural history, collected during a period of about 700 years, from the time of Thales the Milesian. It has a just claim to the attention of every speculative inquirer. It is not surprising, that the progress of the human mind, which, in moral science, after the first dawn of inquiry, was rapid both amongst the Greeks and Romans, should be slow in the improvement of such branches of knowledge as depended entirely on observation and facts, which were peculiarly difficult of attainment. Natural knowledge can only be brought to perfection by the prosecution of inquiries in different climates, and by a communication of discoveries amongst those by whom it is cultivated. But neither could inquiries be prosecuted, nor discoveries communicated, with success, while the greater part of the world was involved in barbarism, while navigation was slow and limited, and the art of printing unknown. The consideration of these circumstances will afford sufficient apology for the imperfect state in which natural science existed amongst the ancients. But we proceed to give an abstract of their extent, as they appear in the compilation of Pliny. This work is divided into 37 books, the first of which contains the preface, addressed to the Emperor Vespasian, probably the father, to whom the author pays high compliments. The second book treats of the world, the elements, and the stars. In respect to the world, or rather the universe, the author's opinion is the same with that of several ancient philosophers, that it is a deity, uncreated, infinite, and eternal. Their notions, however, as might be expected, on a subject so incomprehensible, are vague, confused, and imperfect. In a subsequent chapter of the same book, where the nature of the deity is more particularly considered, the author's conceptions of infinite power are so inadequate, that, by way of consolation for the limited powers of man, he observes that there are many things even beyond the power of the Supreme Being. Such, for instance, as the annihilation of his own existence, to which the author adds, the power of rendering mortals eternal, and of raising the dead. It deserves to be remarked, that, though a future state of rewards and punishments was maintained by the most eminent among the ancient philosophers, the resurrection of the body was a doctrine with which they were wholly unacquainted. The author next treats of the planets, and the periods of their respective revolutions. Of the stars, comets, winds, thunder, lightning, and other natural phenomena, concerning all which he delivers the hypothetical notions maintained by the ancients. And mentions a variety of extraordinary incidents which had occurred in different parts of the world. The third book contains a general system of geography, which is continued through the fourth, fifth, and sixth books. The seventh treats of conception, and the generation of the human species, with a number of miscellaneous observations, unconnected with the general subject. The eighth treats of quadrupeds, the ninth, of aquatic animals, the tenth, of birds. The eleventh, of insects and reptiles, the twelfth, of trees, the thirteenth, of ointments, and of trees which grow near the sea coast, the fourteenth, of vines, the fifteenth, of fruit trees, the sixteenth, of forest trees. The seventeenth, of the cultivation of trees, the eighteenth, of agriculture, the nineteenth, of the nature of lint, hemp, and similar productions, the twentieth, of the medicinal qualities of vegetables cultivated in gardens. The twenty-first, of flowers, the twenty-second, of the properties of herbs, the twenty-third, of the medicines yielded by cultivated trees, the twenty-fourth, of medicines derived from forest trees. The twenty-fifth, of the properties of wild herbs, and the origin of their use, the twenty-sixth, of other remedies for diseases, and of some new diseases, the twenty-seventh, of different kinds of herbs. The twenty-eighth, twenty-ninth, and thirtieth, of medicines procured from animals, 
the 31st and 32nd, of medicines obtained from aquatic animals, with some extraordinary facts relative to the subject. The 33rd, of the nature of metals, the 34th, of brass, iron, lead, and tin, the 35th, of pictures, and observations relative to painting, the 36th, of the nature of stones and marbles. The 37th, of the origin of gems. To the contents of each book, the author subjoins a list of the writers from whom his observations have been collected. Of Pliny's talents as a writer, it might be deemed presumptuous to form a decided opinion from his natural history, which is avowedly a compilation from various authors, and executed with greater regard to the matter of the work. Than to the elegance of composition. Making allowance, however, for a degree of credulity, common to the human mind in the early stage of physical researches, he is far from being deficient in the essential qualifications of a writer of natural history. His descriptions appear to be accurate, his observations precise, his narrative is in general perspicuous, and he often illustrates his subject by a vivacity of thought, as well as by a happy turn of expression. It has been equally his endeavor to give novelty to stale disquisitions, and authority to new observations. He has both removed the rust, and dispelled the obscurity, which enveloped the doctrines of many ancient naturalists. But, with all his care and industry, he has exploded fewer errors, and sanctioned a greater number of doubtful opinions, than was consistent with the exercise of unprejudiced and severe investigation. Pliny was fifty-six years of age at the time of his death, the manner of which is accurately related by his nephew, the elegant Pliny the Younger, in a letter to Tacitus, who entertained the design of writing the life of the naturalist. Titus Flavius Domitianus. I. Domitian was born upon the ninth of the Calends of November, October 24, 794, when his father was consul-elect, being to enter upon his office the month following, in the sixth region of the city, at the pomegranate 795. In the house which he afterwards converted into a temple of the Flavian family. He is said to have spent the time of his youth in so much want and infamy, that he had not one piece of plate belonging to him. And it is well known, that Clodius Pollio, a man of Praetorian rank, against whom there is a poem of Nero's extant, entitled Lucio, kept a note in his handwriting, which he sometimes produced. In which Domitian made an assignation with him for the foulest purposes. Some, likewise, have said, that he prostituted himself to Nerva, who succeeded him. In the war with Vitellius, he fled into the capital with his uncle Sabinus, and a part of the troops they had in the city 796. But the enemy breaking in, and the temple being set on fire, he hid himself all night with the sacristan. And next morning, assuming the disguise of a worshipper of Isis, and mixing with the priests of that idle superstition, he got over the Tiber 797, with only one attendant, to the house of a woman who was the mother of one of his schoolfellows. And lurked there so close, that, though the enemy, who were at his heels, searched very strictly after him, they could not discover him. At last, after the success of his party, appearing in public, and being unanimously saluted by the title of Caesar, he assumed the office of praetor of the city, with consular authority, but in fact had nothing but the name. For the jurisdiction he transferred to his next colleague. He used, however, his absolute power so licentiously, that even then he plainly discovered what sort of prince he was likely to prove. Not to go into details, after he had made free with the wives of many men of distinction, he took Domitia Longina from her husband, Elias Lamia, and married her, and in one day disposed of above twenty offices in the city and the provinces. Upon which Vespasian said several times, he wondered he did not send him a successor too. 2. He likewise designed an expedition into Gaul and Germany 798, without the least necessity for it, and contrary to the advice of all his father's friends. And this he did only with the view of equaling his brother in military achievements and glory. But for this he was severely reprimanded, and that he might the more effectually be reminded of his age and position, was made to live with his father, and his litter had to follow his father's and brother's carriage, as often as they went abroad. But he attended them in their triumph for the conquest of Judea 799, mounted on a white horse. Of the six consulships which he held, only one was ordinary, and that he obtained by the cession and interest of his brother. 
he greatly affected a modest behavior, and, above all, a taste for poetry, insomuch, that he rehearsed his performances in public, though it was an art he had formerly little cultivated, and which he afterwards despised and abandoned. Devoted, however, as he was at this time to poetical pursuits, yet when Vologesus, king of the Parthians, desired succors against the Alani, with one of Vespasian's sons to command them, he labored hard to procure for himself that appointment. But the scheme proving abortive, he endeavored by presents and promises to engage other kings of the East to make a similar request. After his father's death, he was for some time in doubt, whether he should not offer the soldiers a donative double to that of his brother, and made no scruple of saying frequently, that he had been left his partner in the empire. But that his father's will had been fraudulently set aside. From that time forward, he was constantly engaged in plots against his brother, both publicly and privately, until, falling dangerously ill, he ordered all his attendants to leave him, under pretense of his being dead, before he really was so. And, at his decease, paid him no other honor than that of enrolling him amongst the gods, and he often, both in speeches and edicts, carpeted at his memory by sneers and insinuations. 3. In the beginning of his reign, he used to spend daily an hour by himself in private, during which time he did nothing else but catch flies, and stick them through the body with a sharp pin. When someone therefore inquired, whether any one was with the emperor, it was significantly answered by Vibius Crispus, not so much as a fly. Soon after his advancement, his wife Domitia, by whom he had a son in his second consulship, and whom the year following he complimented with the title of Augusta, being desperately in love with Paris, the actor, he put her away. But within a short time afterwards, being unable to bear the separation, he took her again, under pretense of complying with the people's importunity. During some time, there was in his administration a strange mixture of virtue and vice, until at last his virtues themselves degenerated into vices. Being, as we may reasonably conjecture concerning his character, inclined to avarice through want, and to cruelty through fear. 4. He frequently entertained the people with most magnificent and costly shows, not only in the amphitheater, but the circus. Where, besides the usual races with chariots drawn by two or four horses abreast, he exhibited the representation of an engagement between both horse and foot, and a sea fight in the amphitheater. The people were also entertained with the chase of wild beasts and the combat of gladiators, even in the nighttime, by torchlight. Nor did men only fight in these spectacles, but women also. He constantly attended at the games given by the questers, which had been disused for some time, but were revived by him. And upon those occasions, always gave the people the liberty of demanding two pair of gladiators out of his own school, who appeared last in court uniforms. Whenever he attended the shows of gladiators, there stood at his feet a little boy dressed in scarlet, with a prodigiously small head, with whom he used to talk very much, and sometimes seriously. We are assured, that he was overheard asking him, if he knew for what reason he had in the late appointment, made Medius Rufus governor of Egypt. He presented the people with naval fights, performed by fleets almost as numerous as those usually employed in real engagements, making a vast lake near the Tiber 800, and building seats round it. And he witnessed them himself during a very heavy rain. He likewise celebrated the Secular Games 801, reckoning not from the year in which they had been exhibited by Claudius, but from the time of Augustus's celebration of them. In these, upon the day of the Circensian sports, in order to have a hundred races performed, he reduced each course from seven rounds to five. He likewise instituted, in honor of Jupiter Capitolinus, a solemn contest in music to be performed every five years, besides horse racing and gymnastic exercises, with more prizes than are at present allowed. There was also a public performance in elocution, both Greek and Latin and besides the musicians who sung to the harp, there were others who played concerted pieces or solos, without vocal accompaniment. Young girls also ran races in the stadium, at which he presided in his sandals, dressed in a purple robe, made after the Grecian fashion, and wearing upon his head a golden crown bearing the effigies of Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva. With the flamen of Jupiter, and the college of priests sitting by his side in the same dress, excepting only that their crowns had also his own image on them. 
He celebrated also upon the Alban Mount every year the festival of Minerva, for whom he had appointed a college of priests, out of which were chosen by lot persons to preside as governors over the college. Who were obliged to entertain the people with extraordinary chases of wild beasts, and stage plays, besides contests for prizes in oratory and poetry. He thrice bestowed upon the people a largess of three hundred sesterces each man. And, at a public show of gladiators, a very plentiful feast. At the festival of the Seven Hills 802, he distributed large hampers of provisions to the senatorian and equestrian orders, and small baskets to the common people, and encouraged them to eat by setting them the example. The day after, he scattered among the people a variety of cakes and other delicacies to be scrambled for. And on the greater part of them falling amidst the seats of the crowd, he ordered five hundred tickets to be thrown into each range of benches belonging to the senatorian and equestrian orders. V. He rebuilt many noble edifices which had been destroyed by fire, and amongst them the capital, which had been burnt down a second time 803, but all the inscriptions were in his own name, without the least mention of the original founders. He likewise erected a new temple in the capital to Jupiter Custos, and a forum, which is now called Nerva S804, as also the temple of the Flavian family 805, a stadium 806, an odium 807, and a Namakia 808. Out of the stone dug from which, the sides of the Circus Maximus, which had been burnt down, were rebuilt. 6. He undertook several expeditions, some from choice, and some from necessity. That against the Cadi 809 was unprovoked, but that against the Sarmatians was necessary, an entire legion, with its commander, having been cut off by them. He sent two expeditions against the Dacians. The first upon the defeat of Appius Sabinus, a man of consular rank, and the other, upon that of Cornelius Fuscus, prefect of the Praetorian cohorts, to whom he had entrusted the conduct of that war. After several battles with the Cadian Deci, he celebrated a double triumph. But for his successes against the Sarmatians, he only bore in procession the laurel crown to Jupiter Capitolinus. The civil war, begun by Lucius Antonius, governor of Upper Germany, he quelled, without being obliged to be personally present at it, with remarkable good fortune. For, at the very moment of joining battle, the Rhine suddenly thawing, the troops of the barbarians which were ready to join L. Antonius, were prevented from crossing the river. Of this victory he had noticed by some presages, before the messengers who brought the news of it arrived. For upon the very day the battle was fought, a splendid eagle spread its wings round his statue at Rome, making most joyful cries. And shortly after, a rumour became common, that Antonius was slain, nay, many positively affirmed, that they saw his head brought to the city. 7. He made many innovations in common practices. He abolished the Sportula 810, and revived the old practice of regular suppers. To the four former parties in the Circentian Games, he added two new, who were gold and scarlet. He prohibited the players from acting in the theatre, but permitted them the practice of their art in private houses. He forbade the castration of males, and reduced the price of the eunuchs who were still left in the hands of the dealers in slaves. On the occasion of a great abundance of wine, accompanied by a scarcity of corn, supposing that the tillage of the ground was neglected for the sake of attending too much to the cultivation of vineyards. He published a proclamation forbidding the planting of any new vines in Italy, and ordering the vines in the provinces to be cut down, nowhere permitting more than one half of them to remain 811. But he did not persist in the execution of this project. Some of the greatest offices he conferred upon his freedmen and soldiers. He forbade two legions to be quartered in the same camp, and more than a thousand sesterces to be deposited by any soldier with the standards. Because it was thought that Lucius Antonius had been encouraged in his late project by the large sum deposited in the military chest by the two legions which he had in the same winter quarters. He made an addition to the soldiers' pay, of three gold pieces a year. 8. In the administration of justice he was diligent and assiduous. And frequently sat in the forum out of course, to cancel the judgments of the court of the one hundred, which had been procured through favour, or interest. He occasionally cautioned the judges of the court of recovery to beware of being too ready to admit claims for freedom brought before them. 
He set a mark of infamy upon judges who were convicted of taking bribes, as well as upon their assessors. He likewise instigated the tribunes of the people to prosecute a corrupt edile for extortion, and to desire the Senate to appoint judges for his trial. He likewise took such effectual care in punishing magistrates of the city, and governors of provinces, guilty of malversation, that they never were at any time more moderate or more just. Most of these, since his reign, we have seen prosecuted for crimes of various kinds. Having taken upon himself the reformation of the public manners, he restrained the license of the populace in sitting promiscuously with the knights in the theatre. Scandalous libels, published to defame persons of rank, of either sex, he suppressed, and inflicted upon their authors a mark of infamy. He expelled a man of quaestorian rank from the Senate, for practicing mimicry in dancing. He debarred infamous women the use of litters, as also the right of receiving legacies, or inheriting estates. He struck out of the list of judges a Roman knight for taking again his wife whom he had divorced and prosecuted for adultery. He condemned several men of the senatorian and equestrian orders, upon the Scantinian Law 812. The lewdness of the Vestal Virgins, which had been overlooked by his father and brother, he punished severely, but in different ways, viz. Offences committed before his reign, with death, and those since its commencement, according to ancient custom. For to the two sisters called Ocelity, he gave liberty to choose the mode of death which they preferred, and banished their paramours. But Cornelia, the president of the Vestals, who had formerly been acquitted upon a charge of incontinence, being a long time after again prosecuted and condemned, he ordered to be buried alive. And her gallants to be whipped to death with rods in the commissium. Excepting only a man of praetorian rank, to whom, because he confessed the fact, while the case was dubious, and it was not established against him, though the witnesses had been put to the torture, he granted the favour of banishment. And to preserve pure and undefiled the reverence due to the gods, he ordered the soldiers to demolish a tomb, which one of his freedmen had erected for his son out of the stones designed for the temple of Jupiter Capitolinus. And to sink in the sea the bones and relics buried in it. 9. Upon his first succeeding to power, he felt such an abhorrence for the shedding of blood, that, before his father's arrival in Rome, calling to mind the verse of Virgil. Impia quam quisis gens est epulata juvenses 8.13. Ere impious man. Restrained from blood in vain. Began to feast on flesh of bullocks slain. He designed to have published a proclamation, to forbid the sacrifice of oxen. Before his accession to the imperial authority, and during some time afterwards, he scarcely ever gave the least grounds for being suspected of covetousness or avarice. But, on the contrary, he often afforded proofs, not only of his justice, but his liberality. To all about him he was generous even to profusion, and recommended nothing more earnestly to them than to avoid doing anything mean. He would not accept the property left him by those who had children. He also set aside a legacy bequeathed by the will of Ruscus Scipio, who had ordered his heir to make a present yearly to each of the senators upon their first assembling. He exonerated all those who had been under prosecution from the treasury for above five years before. And would not suffer suits to be renewed, unless it was done within a year, and on condition, that the prosecutor should be banished, if he could not make good his cause. The secretaries of the questors having engaged in trade, according to custom, but contrary to the Clodian Law 814, he pardoned them for what was past. Such portions of land as had been left when it was divided amongst the veteran soldiers, he granted to the ancient possessors, as belonging to them by prescription. He put a stop to false prosecutions in the exchequer, by severely punishing the prosecutors, and this saying of his was much taken notice of, that a prince who does not punish informers, encourages them. X. But he did not long persevere in this course of clemency and justice, although he sooner fell into cruelty than into avarice. He put to death a scholar of Paris, the pantomimic 815, though a minor, and then sick, only because, both in person and the practice of his art, he resembled his master. As he did likewise Hermogenes of Tarsus for some oblique reflections in his history, crucifying, besides, the scribes who had copied the work. One who was master of a band of gladiators, 
happening to say, that a Thrax was a match for a Marmillo 816, but not so for the exhibitor of the games, he ordered him to be dragged from the benches into the arena, and exposed to the dogs. With this label upon him, a Parmularian 817 guilty of talking impiously. He put to death many senators, and amongst them several men of consular rank. In this number were, Civica Cerealis, when he was proconsul in Africa, Salvadianus Orphidus, and Asilius Glabrio in exile, under the pretense of their planning to revolt against him. The rest he punished upon very trivial occasions. As Elias Lamia for some jocular expressions, which were of old date, and perfectly harmless, because, upon his commending his voice after he had taken his wife from him 818, he replied, Alas! I hold my tongue. And when Titus advised him to take another wife, he answered him thus, What? Have you a mind to marry? Salvius Coxianus was condemned to death for keeping the birthday of his uncle Otho, the emperor, Medius Pomposianus, because he was commonly reported to have an imperial nativity 819, and to carry about with him a map of the world upon vellum. With the speeches of kings and generals extracted out of Titus Levius. And for giving his slaves the names of Mago and Hannibal, Celestius Lucullus, lieutenant in Britain, for suffering some lances of a new invention to be called Lucullian. And Junius Rusticus, for publishing a treatise in praise of Paetus Thracia and Helvidius Priscus, and calling them both most upright men. Upon this occasion, he likewise banished all the philosophers from the city and Italy. He put to death the younger Helvidius, for writing a farce, in which, under the character of Paris and Inoni, he reflected upon his having divorced his wife. And also Flavius Sabinus, one of his cousins, because, upon his being chosen at the consular election to that office, the public crier had, by a blunder, proclaimed him to the people not consul, but emperor. Becoming still more savage after his success in the civil war, he employed the utmost industry to discover those of the adverse party who absconded, many of them he racked with a new invented torture, inserting fire through their private parts. And from some he cut off their hands. It is certain, that only two of any note were pardoned, a tribune who wore the narrow stripe, and a centurion. Who, to clear themselves from the charge of being concerned in any rebellious project, proved themselves to have been guilty of prostitution, and consequently incapable of exercising any influence either over the general or the soldiers. 11. His cruelties were not only excessive, but subtle and unexpected. The day before he crucified a collector of his rents, he sent for him into his bedchamber, made him sit down upon the bed by him, and sent him away well pleased, and, so far as could be inferred from his treatment, in a state of perfect security. Having vouchsafed him the favor of a plate of meat from his own table. When he was on the point of condemning to death Aretinus Clemens, a man of consular rank, and one of his friends and emissaries, he retained him about his person in the same or greater favor than ever. Until at last, as they were riding together in the same litter, upon seeing the man who had informed against him, he said, Are you willing that we should hear this base slave tomorrow? Contemptuously abusing the patience of men, he never pronounced a severe sentence without prefacing it with words which gave hopes of mercy, so that, at last, there was not a more certain token of a fatal conclusion, than a mild commencement. He brought before the Senate some persona accused of treason, declaring, that he should prove that day how dear he was to the Senate, and so influenced them, that they condemned the accused to be punished according to the ancient usage 820. Then, as if alarmed at the extreme severity of their punishment, to lessen the odiousness of the proceeding, he interposed in these words. For it is not foreign to the purpose to give them precisely as they were delivered, permit me, conscript fathers, so far to prevail upon your affection for me, however extraordinary the request may seem. As to grant the condemned criminals the favor of dying in the manner they choose. For by so doing, ye will spare your own eyes, and the world will understand that I interceded with the Senate on their behalf. 12. Having exhausted the exchequer by the expense of his buildings and public spectacles, with the augmentation of pay lately granted to the troops, he made an attempt at the reduction of the army, in order to lessen the military charges. But reflecting, that he should, by this measure, expose himself to the insults of the barbarians, 
while it would not suffice to extricate him from his embarrassments, he had recourse to plundering his subjects by every mode of exaction. The estates of the living and the dead were sequestered upon any accusation, by whomsoever preferred. The unsupported allegation of any one person, relative to a word or action construed to affect the dignity of the emperor, was sufficient. Inheritances, to which he had not the slightest pretension, were confiscated, if there was found so much as one person to say, he had heard from the deceased when living, that he had made the emperor his heir. Besides the exactions from others, the poll tax on the Jews was levied with extreme rigor, both on those who lived after the manner of Jews in the city, without publicly professing themselves to be such 821, and on those who, by concealing their origin, avoided paying the tribute imposed upon that people. I remember, when I was a youth, to have been present 822, when an old man, ninety years of age, had his person exposed to view in a very crowded court, in order that, on inspection, the procurator might satisfy himself whether he was circumcised. 823. From his earliest years Domitian was anything but courteous, of a forward, assuming disposition, and extravagant both in his words and actions. When Canis, his father's concubine, upon her return from Istria, offered him a kiss, as she had been used to do, he presented her his hand to kiss. Being indignant, that his brother's son-in-law should be waited on by servants dressed in white 824, he exclaimed. Uc agathon polyquireni.825. Too many princes are not good. 13. After he became emperor, he had the assurance to boast in the senate, that he had bestowed the empire on his father and brother, and they had restored it to him. And upon taking his wife again, after the divorce, he declared by proclamation, that he had recalled her to his pulviner. 826 He was not a little pleased too, at hearing the acclamations of the people in the amphitheatre on a day of festival, all happiness to our lord and lady. But when, during the celebration of the Capitoline trial of skill, the whole concourse of people entreated him with one voice to restore Palfurius Sura to his place in the senate. From which he had been long before expelled, he having then carried away the prize of eloquence from all the orators who had contended for it, he did not vouchsafe to give them any answer. But only commanded silence to be proclaimed by the voice of the crier. With equal arrogance, when he dictated the form of a letter to be used by his procurators, he began it thus, Our Lord and God commands so and so, whence it became a rule that no one should style him otherwise either in writing or speaking. He suffered no statues to be erected for him in the capital, unless they were of gold and silver, and of a certain weight. He erected so many magnificent gates and arches, surmounted by representations of chariots drawn by four horses, and other triumphal ornaments, in different quarters of the city, that a wag inscribed on one of the arches the Greek word axkii. It is enough. 827 He filled the office of consul seventeen times, which no one had ever done before him, and for the seven middle occasions in successive years, but in scarcely any of them had he more than the title. For he never continued in office beyond the calends of May, the May 1st, and for the most part only till the Ides of January, January 13th. After his two triumphs, when he assumed the cognomen of Germanicus, he called the months of September and October, Germanicus and Domitian, after his own names, because he commenced his reign in the one, and was born in the other. 14. Becoming by these means universally feared and odious, he was at last taken off by a conspiracy of his friends and favorite freedmen, in concert with his wife 828. He had long entertained a suspicion of the year and day when he should die, and even of the very hour and manner of his death, all which he had learned from the Chaldeans, when he was a very young man. His father once at supper laughed at him for refusing to eat some mushrooms, saying, that if he knew his fate, he would rather be afraid of the sword. Being, therefore, in perpetual apprehension and anxiety, he was keenly alive to the slightest suspicions, insomuch that he is thought to have withdrawn the edict ordering the destruction of the vines. Chiefly because the copies of it which were dispersed had the following lines written upon them. Came me fagis api risonomos api cartophoriso. Asin epispicei caesari thuomino. 829. Gnaw thou my root, yet shall my juice suffice. To pour on Caesar's head in sacrifice. 
It was from the same principle of fear, that he refused a new honor, devised and offered him by the Senate, though he was greedy of all such compliments. It was this, that as often as he held the consulship, Roman knights, chosen by lot, should walk before him, clad in atrabia, with lances in their hands, amongst his lictors and apparitors. As the time of the danger which he apprehended drew near, he became daily more and more disturbed in mind. Insomuch that he lined the walls of the porticos in which he used to walk, with the stone called Fengites 830, by the reflection of which he could see every object behind him. He seldom gave an audience to persons in custody, unless in private, being alone, and he himself holding their chains in his hand. To convince his domestics that the life of a master was not to be attempted upon any pretext, however plausible, he condemned to death Epaphroditus his secretary, because it was believed that he had assisted Nero, in his extremity, to kill himself. 15. His last victim was Flavius Clemens 831, his cousin German, a man below contempt for his want of energy, whose sons, then of very tender age, he had avowedly destined for his successors, and, discarding their former names, had ordered one to be called Vespasian, and the other Domitian. Nevertheless, he suddenly put him to death upon some very slight suspicion 832, almost before he was well out of his consulship. By this violent act he very much hastened his own destruction. During eight months together there was so much lightning at Rome, and such accounts of the phenomenon were brought from other parts, that at last he cried out, Let him now strike whom he will. The capital was struck by lightning, as well as the temple of the Flavian family, with the Palatine house, and his own bedchamber. The tablet also, inscribed upon the base of his triumphal statue was carried away by the violence of the storm, and fell upon a neighboring monument. The tree which just before the advancement of Vespasian had been prostrated, and rose again 833, suddenly fell to the ground. The goddess Fortune of Prenest, to whom it was his custom on New Year's Day to commend the empire for the ensuing year, and who had always given him a favorable reply, at last returned him a melancholy answer, not without mention of blood. He dreamt that Minerva, whom he worshipped even to a superstitious excess, was withdrawing from her sanctuary, declaring she could protect him no longer, because she was disarmed by Jupiter. Nothing, however, so much affected him as an answer given by Ascleterio, the astrologer, and his subsequent fate. This person had been informed against, and did not deny his having predicted some future events, of which, from the principles of his art, he confessed he had a foreknowledge. Domitian asked him, what end he thought he should come to himself. To which replying, I shall in a short time be torn to pieces by dogs, he ordered him immediately to be slain, and, in order to demonstrate the vanity of his art, to be carefully buried. But during the preparations for executing this order, it happened that the funeral pile was blown down by a sudden storm, and the body, half burnt, was torn to pieces by dogs. Which being observed by Latinus, the comic actor, as he chanced to pass that way, he told it, amongst the other news of the day, to the emperor at supper. 16. The day before his death, he ordered some dates 834, served up at table, to be kept till the next day, adding, if I have the luck to use them. And turning to those who were nearest him, he said, Tomorrow the moon in Aquarius will be bloody instead of watery, and an event will happen, which will be much talked of all the world over. About midnight, he was so terrified that he leaped out of bed. That morning he tried and passed sentence on a soothsayer sent from Germany, who being consulted about the lightning that had lately happened, predicted from it a change of government. The blood running down his face as he scratched an ulcerous tumor on his forehead, he said, would this were all that is to befall me. Then, upon his asking the time of the day, instead of five o'clock, which was the hour he dreaded, they purposely told him it was six. Overjoyed at this information. As if all danger were now past, and hastening to the bath, Parthenius, his chamberlain, stopped him, by saying that there was a person come to wait upon him about a matter of great importance, which would admit of no delay. Upon this, ordering all persons to withdraw, he retired into his chamber, and was there slain. 17. Concerning the contrivance and mode of his death, the common account is this. The conspirators being in some doubt when and where they should attack him, whether while he was in the bath, or at supper, 
Stephanus, a steward of Domitilla S835, then under prosecution for defrauding his mistress. Offered them his advice and assistance. And wrapping up his left arm, as if it was hurt, in wool and bandages for some days, to prevent suspicion, at the hour appointed, he secreted a dagger in them. Pretending then to make a discovery of a conspiracy, and being for that reason admitted, he presented to the emperor a memorial, and while he was reading it in great astonishment, stabbed him in the groin. But Domitian, though wounded, making resistance, Clodionus, one of his guards, Maximus, a freedman of Parthenius's, Saturius, his principal chamberlain, with some gladiators, fell upon him, and stabbed him in seven places. A boy who had the charge of the Laras in his bedchamber, and was then in attendance as usual, gave these further particulars, that he was ordered by Domitian, upon receiving his first wound, to reach him a dagger which lay under his pillow, and call in his domestics. But that he found nothing at the head of the bed, excepting the hilt of a poniard, and that all the doors were fastened, that the emperor in the meantime got hold of Stephanus, and throwing him upon the ground, struggled a long time with him. One while endeavouring to wrench the dagger from him, another while, though his fingers were miserably mangled, to tear out his eyes. He was slain upon the fourteenth of the Calends of October, September 18th. In the forty-fifth year of his age, and the fifteenth of his reign 836. His corpse was carried out upon a common bier by the public bearers, and buried by his nurse Phyllis, at his suburban villa on the Latin Way. But she afterwards privately conveyed his remains to the temple of the Flavian family 837, and mingled them with the ashes of Julia, the daughter of Titus, whom she had also nursed. 18. He was tall in stature, his face modest, and very ruddy. He had large eyes, but was dim-sighted. Naturally graceful in his person, particularly in his youth, excepting only that his toes were bent somewhat inward, he was at last disfigured by baldness, corpulence, and the slenderness of his legs, which were reduced by a long illness. He was so sensible how much the modesty of his countenance recommended him, that he once made this boast to the Senate, Thus far you have approved both of my disposition and my countenance. His baldness so much annoyed him, that he considered it an affront to himself, if any other person was reproached with it, either in jest or in earnest. Though in a small tract he published, addressed to a friend, concerning the preservation of the hair, he uses for their mutual consolation the words following. Ouch oras oios cago calos te megas te. Sayest thou my graceful mien, my stately form? And yet the fate of my hair awaits me, however, I bear with fortitude this loss of my hair while I am still young. Remember that nothing is more fascinating than beauty, but nothing of shorter duration. 19. He so shrunk from undergoing fatigue, that he scarcely ever walked through the city on foot. In his expeditions and on a march, he seldom rode on horseback, but was generally carried in a litter. He had no inclination for the exercise of arms, but was very expert in the use of the bow. Many persons have seen him often kill a hundred wild animals, of various kinds, at his Alban retreat, and fix his arrows in their heads with such dexterity, that he could, in two shots, plant them, like a pair of horns, in each. He would sometimes direct his arrows against the hand of a boy standing at a distance, and expand it as a mark, with such precision, that they all passed between the boy's fingers, without hurting him. XX. In the beginning of his reign, he gave up the study of the liberal sciences, though he took care to restore, at a vast expense, the libraries which had been burnt down. Collecting manuscripts from all parts, and sending scribes to Alexandria 838 either to copy or correct them. Yet he never gave himself the trouble of reading history or poetry, or of employing his pen even for his private purposes. He perused nothing but the commentaries and acts of Tiberius Caesar. His letters, speeches, and edicts were all drawn up for him by others, though he could converse with elegance, and sometimes expressed himself in memorable sentiments. I could wish, said he once, that I was but as handsome as Medius fancies himself to be. And of the head of someone whose hair was partly reddish, and partly grey, he said, that it was snow sprinkled with mead. 21. The lot of princes, he remarked, was very miserable, 
for no one believed them when they discovered a conspiracy, until they were murdered. When he had leisure, he amused himself with dice, even on days that were not festivals, and in the morning. He went to the bath early, and made a plentiful dinner, insomuch that he seldom ate more at supper than a Mattian apple 839, to which he added a draught of wine, out of a small flask. He gave frequent and splendid entertainments, but they were soon over, for he never prolonged them after sunset, and indulged in no revel after. For, till bedtime, he did nothing else but walk by himself in private. 22. He was insatiable in his lusts, calling frequent commerce with women, as if it was a sort of exercise, clinopoline, bed wrestling. And it was reported that he plucked the hair from his concubines, and swam about in company with the lowest prostitutes. His brother's daughter 840 was offered him in marriage when she was a virgin. But being at that time enamored of Domitia, he obstinately refused her. Yet not long afterwards, when she was given to another, he was ready enough to debauch her, and that even while Titus was living. But after she had lost both her father and her husband, he loved her most passionately, and without disguise, insomuch that he was the occasion of her death, by obliging her to procure a miscarriage when she was with child by him. 23. The people shewed little concern at his death, but the soldiers were roused by it to great indignation, and immediately endeavoured to have him ranked among the gods. They were also ready to revenge his loss, if there had been any to take the lead. However, they soon after effected it, by resolutely demanding the punishment of all those who had been concerned in his assassination. On the other hand, the senate was so overjoyed, that they met in all haste, and in a full assembly reviled his memory in the most bitter terms. Ordering ladders to be brought in, and his shields and images to be pulled down before their eyes, and dashed in pieces upon the floor of the senate house passing at the same time a decree to obliterate his titles everywhere. And abolish all memory of him. A few months before he was slain, a raven on the capital uttered these words, All will be well. Some person gave the following interpretation of this prodigy. Nuper tarpio que sed et colmen cornix. Est bene, non potuit dicera, dixit, erit. Late croaked a raven from Tarpeius height. All is not yet, but shall be, right. They say likewise that Domitian dreamed that a golden hump grew out of the back of his neck, which he considered as a certain sign of happy days for the empire after him. Such an auspicious change indeed shortly afterwards took place, through the justice and moderation of the succeeding emperors. Remarks on the Life and Times of Domitian If we view Domitian in the different lights in which he is represented, during his lifetime and after his decease, his character and conduct discover a greater diversity than is commonly observed in the objects of historical detail. But as posthumous character is always the most just, its decisive verdict affords the surest criterion by which this variegated emperor must be estimated by impartial posterity. According to this rule, it is beyond a doubt that his vices were more predominant than his virtues, and when we follow him into his closet, for some time after his accession, when he was thirty years of age, the frivolity of his daily employment. In the killing of flies, exhibits an instance of dissipation, which surpasses all that has been recorded of his imperial predecessors. The encouragement, however, which the first Vespasian had shown to literature, continued to operate during the present reign, and we behold the first fruits of its auspicious influence in the valuable treatise of Quintilian. Of the life of this celebrated writer, little is known upon any authority that has a title to much credit. We learn, however, that he was the son of a lawyer in the service of some of the preceding emperors, and was born in Rome, though in what consulship, or under what emperor, it is impossible to determine. He married a woman of a noble family, by whom he had two sons. The mother died in the flower of her age, and the sons, at the distance of some time from each other, when their father was advanced in years. The precise time of Quintilian's own death is equally inauthenticated with that of his birth. Nor can we rely upon an author of suspicious veracity, who says that he passed the latter part of his life in a state of indigence which was alleviated by the liberality of his pupil, Pliny the Younger. Quintilian opened a school of rhetoric at Rome, where he not only discharged that laborious employment with great applause, during more than twenty years, 
but pleaded at the bar, and was the first who obtained a salary from the state for executing the office of a public teacher. He was also appointed by Domitian Preceptor to the two young princes who were intended to succeed him on the throne. After his retirement from the situation of a teacher, Quintilian devoted his attention to the study of literature, and composed a treatise on the causes of the corruption of eloquence. At the earnest solicitation of his friends, he was afterwards induced to undertake his institution's oratory, the most elaborate system of oratory extant in any language. This work is divided into twelve books, in which the author treats with great precision of the qualities of a perfect orator. Explaining not only the fundamental principles of eloquence, as connected with the constitution of the human mind, but pointing out, both by argument and observation, the most successful method of exercising that admirable art. For the accomplishment of its purpose. So minutely, and upon so extensive a plan, has he prosecuted the subject, that he delineates the education suitable to a perfect orator, from the stage of infancy in the cradle, to the consummation of rhetorical fame, in the pursuits of the bar. Or those, in general, of any public assembly. It is sufficient to say, that in the execution of this elaborate work, Quintilian has called to the assistance of his own acute and comprehensive understanding, the profound penetration of Aristotle, the exquisite graces of Cicero. All the stores of observation, experience, and practice, and in a word, the whole accumulated exertions of ancient genius on the subject of oratory. It may justly be regarded as an extraordinary circumstance in the progress of scientific improvement, that the endowments of a perfect orator were never fully exhibited to the world. Until it had become dangerous to exercise them for the important purposes for which they were originally cultivated. And it is no less remarkable, that, under all the violence and caprice of imperial despotism which the Romans had now experienced, their sensibility to the enjoyment of poetical compositions remained still unabated. As if it served to console the nation for the irretrievable loss of public liberty. From this source of entertainment, they reaped more pleasure during the present reign, than they had done since the time of Augustus. The poets of this period were Juvenal, Statius, and Martial. Juvenal was born at Aquinum, but in what year is uncertain, though, from some circumstances, it seems to have been in the reign of Augustus. Some say that he was the son of a freedman, while others, without specifying the condition of his father, relate only that he was brought up by a freedman. He came at an early age to Rome, where he declaimed for many years, and, pleaded causes in the forum with great applause, but at last he betook himself to the writing of satires, in which he acquired great fame. One of the first, and the most constant object of his satire, was the pantomime Paris, the great favorite of the Emperor Nero, and afterwards of Domitian. During the reign of the former of these emperors, no resentment was shown towards the poet but he experienced not the same impunity after the accession of the latter, when, to remove him from the capital, he was sent as governor to the frontiers of Egypt, but in reality, into an honorable exile. According to some authors, he died of chagrin in that province, but this is not authenticated, and seems to be a mistake, for in some of Martial's epigrams, which appear to have been written after the death of Domitian, Juvenal is spoken of as residing at Rome. It is said that he lived to upwards of eighty years of age. The remaining compositions of this author are sixteen satires, all written against the dissipation and enormous vices which prevailed at Rome in his time. The various objects of animadversion are painted in the strongest colors, and placed in the most conspicuous points of view. Giving loose reins to just and moral indignation, Juvenal is everywhere animated, vehement, petulant, and incessantly acrimonious. Disdaining the more lenient modes of correction, or despairing of their success, he neither adopts the raillery of Horace, nor the derision of Perseus, but prosecutes vice and folly with all the severity of sentiment, passion, and expression. He sometimes exhibits a mixture of humor with his invectives, but it is a humor which partakes more of virulent rage than of pleasantry, broad, hostile, but coarse, and rivaling in indelicacy the profligate manners which it assails. The satires of Juvenal abound in philosophical apothems, and, where they are not sullied by obscene description, are supported with a uniform air of virtuous elevation. Amidst all the intemperance of sarcasm, his numbers are harmonious. 
had his zeal permitted him to direct the current of his impetuous genius into the channel of ridicule, and endeavor to put to shame the vices and follies of those licentious times. As much as he perhaps exasperated conviction rather than excited contrition, he would have carried satire to the highest possible pitch, both of literary excellence and moral utility. With every abatement of attainable perfection, we hesitate not to place him at the head of this arduous department of poetry. Of Statius no farther particulars are preserved than that he was born at Naples. That his father's name was Statius of Epirus, and his mother's age Lena, and that he died about the end of the first century of the Christian era. Some have conjectured that he maintained himself by writing for the stage, but of this there is no sufficient evidence, and if ever he composed dramatic productions, they have perished. The works of Statius now extant, are two poems, viz. The Thebais and the Achilles, besides a collection, named Silvi. The Thebais consists of twelve books, and the subject of it is the Theban War, which happened 1,236 years before the Christian era, in consequence of a dispute between Idiocles and Polynices, the sons of Oedipus and Jocasta. These brothers had entered into an agreement with each other to reign alternately for a year at a time, and Idiocles being the elder, got first possession of the throne. This prince refusing to abdicate at the expiration of the year, Polynices fled to Argos, where marrying Argia, the daughter of Adrastus, king of that country, he procured the assistance of his father-in-law. To enforce the engagement stipulated with his brother Idiocles. The Argives marched under the command of seven able generals, who were to attack separately the seven gates of Thebes. After much blood had been spilt without any effect, it was at last agreed between the two parties, that the brothers should determine the dispute by single combat. In the desperate engagement which ensued, they both fell. And being burnt together upon the funeral pile, it is said that their ashes separated, as if actuated by the implacable resentment which they had borne to each other. If we accept the Aeneid, this is the only Latin production extant which is epic in its form, and it likewise approaches nearest in merit to that celebrated poem, which Statius appears to have been ambitious of emulating. In unity and greatness of action, the Thebais corresponds to the laws of the Epopoeia, but the fable may be regarded as defective in some particulars, which, however, arise more from the nature of the subject, than from any fault of the poet. The distinction of the hero is not sufficiently prominent, and the poem possesses not those circumstances which are requisite towards interesting the reader's affections in the issue of the contest. To this it may be added, that the unnatural complexion of the incestuous progeny diffuses a kind of gloom which obscures the splendor of thought, and restrains the sympathetic indulgence of fancy to some of the boldest excursions of the poet. For grandeur, however, and animation of sentiment and description, as well as for harmony of numbers, the Thebais is eminently conspicuous, and deserves to be held in a much higher degree of estimation than it has generally obtained. In the contrivance of some of the episodes, and frequently in the modes of expression, Statius keeps an attentive eye to the style of Virgil. It is said that he was twelve years employed in the composition of this poem. And we have his own authority for affirming, that he polished it with all the care and assiduity practiced by the poets in the Augustan age. Quip, te Fido Monitor, Nostra. Thebais, Multa Cruciata Lima. Tentat Odyssey Fide Manchuani. Gaudia Femi. Silvi, Lib. 4. 7. 4. Taught by you, with steadfast care. I trim my song of Thebes, and dare with generous rivalry to share. The glories of the Montuan bard. The Achilles relates to the same hero who is celebrated by Homer in the Iliad. But it is the previous history of Achilles, not his conduct in the Trojan War, which forms the subject of the poem of Statius. While the young hero is under the care of the centaur Chiron, Thetis makes a visit to the preceptor's sequestered habitation, where, to save her son from the fate which, it was predicted, would befall him at Troy. If he should go to the siege of that place, she orders him to be dressed in the disguise of a girl, and sent to live in the family of Lycomedes, king of Cyros. But as Troy could not be taken without the aid of Achilles, Ulysses, accompanied by Diomede, is deputed by the Greeks to go to Cyros, and bring him thence to the Grecian camp. 
The artifice by which the sagacious ambassador detected Achilles amongst his female companions, was by placing before them various articles of merchandise, amongst which was some armor. Achilles no sooner perceived the latter, than he eagerly seized a sword and shield, and manifesting the strongest emotions of heroic enthusiasm, discovered his sex. After an affectionate parting with Lycomede's daughter, Datamaya, whom he left pregnant of a son, he set sail with the Grecian chiefs, and, during the voyage, gives them an account of the manner of his education with Chiron. This poem consists of two books, in heroic measure, and is written with taste and fancy. Commentators are of opinion, that the Achilles was left incomplete by the death of the author. But this is extremely improbable, from various circumstances, and appears to be founded only upon the word Hactinus, in the conclusion of the poem. Hactinus anorum, comites, elementum eorum. Edimemini, edimemonis juvat, sit quitera mater. Thus far, companions dear, with mindful joy I've told. My youthful deeds, the rest my mother can unfold. That any consequential reference was intended by Hactinus, seems to me plainly contradicted by the words which immediately follow, sit quitera mater. Statius could not propose the giving any further account of Achilles's life, because a general narrative of it had been given in the first book. The voyage from Cyrus to the Trojan coast, conducted with the celerity which suited the purpose of the poet, admitted of no incidents which required description or recital, and after the voyagers had reached the Grecian camp. It is reasonable to suppose, that the action of the Iliad immediately commenced. But that Statius had no design of extending the plan of the Achilles beyond this period, is expressly declared in the exordium of the poem. Magnanimum Iacidon, Formid Attempt Ton Anti. Progenium, E. Patrio Vetitum Succedera Scylla. Diva, Refer. Quanquam acta viri multum inclita cantu. Mionio, Set plura vacant. Nos ire per omnum. Sycamore est, Heroa velis, Cyroque latentem. Delicia profere tuba, NEC in Hector tracto. Sistir, said tota juvenum deducere troja. Aid me, O goddess. While I sing of him. Who shook the thunderer's throne, and, for his crime. Was doomed to lose his birthright in the skies. The great Iacides. Meonian strains. Have made his mighty deeds their glorious theme. Still much remains, be mine the pleasing task. To trace the future hero's young career. Not dragging Hector at his chariot wheels. But while disguised in Cyrus yet he lurked. Till trumpet stirred, he sprung to manly arms. And sage Ulysses led him to the Trojan coast. The Silvi is a collection of poems almost entirely in heroic verse, divided into five books, and for the most part written extempore. Statius himself affirms, in his dedication to Stella, that the production of none of them employed him more than two days, yet many of them consist of between 100 and 200 hexameter lines. We meet with one of 216 lines, one of 234, one of 262, and one of 277, a rapidity of composition approaching to what Horace mentions of the poet Lucilius. It is no small encomium to observe, that, considered as extemporaneous productions, the meanest in the collection is far from meriting censure, either in point of sentiment or expression, and many of them contain passages which command our applause. The poet Marshall, surnamed likewise Cocos, was born at Bilbilis, in Spain, of obscure parents. At the age of twenty-one, he came to Rome, where he lived during five and thirty years under the emperors Galba, Otho, Vitellius, the two Vespasians, Domitian, Nerva, and the beginning of the reign of Trajan. He was the panegyrist of several of those emperors, by whom he was liberally rewarded, raised to the equestrian order, and promoted by Domitian to the tribuneship. But being treated with coldness and neglect by Trajan, he returned to his native country, and, a few years after, ended his days, at the age of seventy-five. He had lived at Rome in great splendor and affluence, as well as in high esteem for his poetical talents. But upon his return to Bilbilis, it is said that he experienced a great reverse of fortune, and was chiefly indebted for his support to the gratuitous benefactions of Pliny the Younger, 
whom he had extolled in some epigrams. The poems of Marshall consist of fourteen books, all written in the epigrammatic form, to which species of composition, introduced by the Greeks, he had a peculiar propensity. Amidst such a multitude of verses, on a variety of subjects, often composed extempore, and many of them, probably, in the moments of fashionable dissipation, it is not surprising that we find a large number unworthy the genius of the author. Delicacy, and even decency, is often violated in the productions of Marshall. Grasping at every thought which afforded even the shadow of ingenuity, he gave unlimited scope to the exercise of an active and fruitful imagination. In respect to composition, he is likewise liable to censure. At one time he wearies, and at another tantalizes the reader, with the prolixity or ambiguity of his preambles. His prelusive sentiments are sometimes far-fetched, and converge not with a natural declination into the focus of epigram. In dispensing praise and censure, he often seems to be governed more by prejudice or policy, than by justice and truth. And he is more constantly attentive to the production of wit, than to the improvement of morality. But while we remark the blemishes and imperfections of this poet, we must acknowledge his extraordinary merits. In composition he is, in general, elegant and correct, and where the subject is capable of connection with sentiment, his inventive ingenuity never fails to extract from it the essence of delight and surprise. His fancy is prolific of beautiful images, and his judgment expert in arranging them to the greatest advantage. He bestows panegyric with inimitable grace, and satirises with equal dexterity. In a fund of Attic salt, he surpasses every other writer. And though he seems to have at command all the varied stores of Gaul, he is not destitute of candor. With almost every kind of versification he appears to be familiar. And notwithstanding a facility of temper, too accommodating, perhaps, on many occasions, to the licentiousness of the times, we may venture from strong indications to pronounce, that, as a moralist, his principles were virtuous. It is observed of this author, by Pliny the Younger, that, though his compositions might, perhaps, not obtain immortality, he wrote as if they would. Aeterna, quae scripsit, non erunt fortas, I'll to men scripsit tanquum futura. The character which Marshall gives of his epigrams, is just and comprehensive. Sunt bona, sunt quidem mediocria, sunt mala plura. Quae legis, hic a litter non fit, avite, liber. Some are good, some indifferent, and some again still worse. Such, avitus, you will find is a common case with verse. The End of the Twelve Caesars Lives of Eminent Grammarians I, the science of grammar 841 was in ancient times far from being in vogue at Rome. Indeed, it was of little use in a rude state of society, when the people were engaged in constant wars, and had not much time to bestow on the cultivation of the liberal arts 842. At the outset, its pretensions were very slender, for the earliest men of learning, who were both poets and orators, may be considered as half-Greek, I speak of Livius 843 and Ennius 844. Who are acknowledged to have taught both languages as well at Rome as in foreign parts 845. But they only translated from the Greek, and if they composed anything of their own in Latin, it was only from what they had before read. For although there are those who say that this Ennius published two books, one on letters and syllables, and the other on meters, Lucius Cotta has satisfactorily proved that they are not the works of the poet Ennius. But of another writer of the same name, to whom also the treatise on the rules of augury is attributed. 2. Crates of Mallows 846, then, was, in our opinion, the first who introduced the study of grammar at Rome. He was cotemporary with Aristarchus 847, and having been sent by King Attalus as envoy to the Senate in the interval between the Second and Third Punic Wars 848, soon after the death of Ennius 849. He had the misfortune to fall into an open sewer in the Palatine quarter of the city, and broke his leg. After which, during the whole period of his embassy and convalescence, he gave frequent lectures, taking much pains to instruct his hearers, and he has left us an example well worthy of imitation. It was so far followed, that poems hitherto little known, the works either of deceased friends or other approved writers, were brought to light and being read and commented on, 
or explain to others. Thus, Caius Octavius Lampadio edited the Punic War of Naevius 850, which having been written in one volume without any break in the manuscript, he divided into seven books. After that, Quintus Varguntius undertook the Annals of Ennius, which he read on certain fixed days to crowded audiences. So Laelius Archelaus, and Vectius Philocomus, read and commented on the satires of their friend Lucilius 851, which Linnaeus Pompeius, a freedman, tells us he studied under Archelaus, and Valerius Cato, under Philocomus. Two others also taught and promoted grammar in various branches, namely, Lucius Aelius Laniavinus, the son-in-law of Quintus Aelius, and Servius Claudius, both of whom were Roman knights. And men who rendered great services both to learning and the Republic. 3. Lucius Aelius had a double cognomen, for he was called Preconius, because his father was a herald, Stylo, because he was in the habit of composing orations for most of the speakers of highest rank. Indeed, he was so strong a partisan of the nobles, that he accompanied Quintus Metellus Nemiticus 852 in his exile. Servius 853 having clandestinely obtained his father-in-law's book before it was published, was disowned for the fraud, which he took so much to heart, that, overwhelmed with shame and distress, he retired from Rome. And being seized with a fit of the gout, in his impatience, he applied a poisonous ointment to his feet, which half killed him, so that his lower limbs mortified while he was still alive. After this, more attention was paid to the science of letters, and it grew in public estimation, insomuch, that men of the highest rank did not hesitate in undertaking to write something on the subject. And it is related that sometimes there were no less than twenty celebrated scholars in Rome. So high was the value, and so great were the rewards, of grammarians, that Lutatius Daphnides, jocularly called Pan's Herd 854 by Linnaeus Melissus, was purchased by Quintus Catullus for two hundred thousand sesterces. And shortly afterwards made a freedman. And that Lucius Apuleius, who was taken into the pay of Apicius Calvinus, a wealthy Roman knight, at the annual salary of ten thousand crowns, had many scholars. Grammar also penetrated into the provinces, and some of the most eminent amongst the learned taught it in foreign parts, particularly in Gallia Togata. In the number of these, we may reckon Octavius Tusser, Sicenius Jacus, and Appius Cares 855, who persisted in teaching to a most advanced period of his life, at a time when he was not only unable to walk, but his sight failed. 4. The appellation of grammarian was borrowed from the Greeks, but at first, the Latins called such persons literati. Cornelius Nepos, also, in his book, where he draws a distinction between a literate and a philologist, says that in common phrase, those are properly called literati who are skilled in speaking or writing with care or accuracy. And those more especially deserve the name who translated the poets, and were called grammarians by the Greeks. It appears that they were named literators by Messala Corvinus, in one of his letters, when he says, that it does not refer to Furius by Baculus, nor even to Sigida, nor to Cato, the literator, 856 meaning, doubtless. That Valerius Cato was both a poet and an eminent grammarian. Some there are who draw a distinction between a literati and a literator, as the Greeks do between a grammarian and a grammatist, applying the former term to men of real erudition, the latter to those whose pretensions to learning are moderate. And this opinion Orbilius supports by examples. For he says that in old times, when a company of slaves was offered for sale by any person, it was not customary, without good reason, to describe either of them in the catalogue as a literati, but only as a literator. Meaning that he was not a proficient in letters, but had a smattering of knowledge. The early grammarians taught rhetoric also, and we have many of their treatises which include both sciences. Whence it arose, I think, that in later times, although the two professions had then become distinct, the old custom was retained, or the grammarians introduced into their teaching some of the elements required for public speaking. Such as the problem, the periphrasis, the choice of words, description of character, and the like. In order that they might not transfer their pupils to the rhetoricians no better than ill-taught boys. But I perceive that these lessons are now given up in some cases, on account of the want of application, or the tender years, of the scholar, 
for I do not believe that it arises from any dislike in the master. I recollect that when I was a boy it was the custom of one of these, whose name was Princeps, to take alternate days for declaiming and disputing. And sometimes he would lecture in the morning, and declaim in the afternoon, when he had his pulpit removed. I heard, also, that even within the memories of our own fathers, some of the pupils of the grammarians passed directly from the schools to the courts, and at once took a high place in the ranks of the most distinguished advocates. The professors at that time were, indeed, men of great eminence, of some of whom I may be able to give an account in the following chapters. V. Cedius 857 Nicanor first acquired fame and reputation by his teaching, and, besides, he made commentaries, the greater part of which, however, are said to have been borrowed. He also wrote a satire, in which he informs us that he was a freedman, and had a double cognomen, in the following verses. Cevius Nicanor Marci Libertus Negabit. Cevius Postumius Edom, said Marcus, Docebit. What Cevius Nicanor, the freedman of Marcus, will deny. The same Cevius, called also Postumius Marcus, will assert. It is reported, that in consequence of some infamy attached to his character, he retired to Sardinia, and there ended his days. 6. Aurelius Opilius 858, the freedman of some Epicurean, first taught philosophy, then rhetoric, and last of all, grammar. Having closed his school, he followed Rutilius Rufus, when he was banished to Asia, and there the two friends grew old together. He also wrote several volumes on a variety of learned topics, nine books of which he distinguished by the number and names of the nine muses, as he says, not without reason, they being the patrons of authors and poets. I observe that its title is given in several indexes by a single letter, but he uses two in the heading of a book called Pinax. 7. Marcus Antonius Nifo 859, a freeborn native of Gaul, was exposed in his infancy, and afterwards received his freedom from his foster father, and, as some say, was educated at Alexandria, where Dionysius Cytobrachian 860 was his fellow pupil. This, however, I am not very ready to believe, as the times at which they flourished scarcely agree. He is said to have been a man of great genius, of singular memory, well read in Greek as well as Latin, and of a most obliging and agreeable temper, who never haggled about remuneration, but generally left it to the liberality of his scholars. He first taught in the house of Julius Caesar 861, when the latter was yet but a boy, and, afterwards, in his own private house. He gave instruction in rhetoric also, teaching the rules of eloquence every day, but declaiming only on festivals. It is said that some very celebrated men frequented his school, and, among others, Marcus Cicero, during the time he held the praetorship 862. He wrote a number of works, although he did not live beyond his fiftieth year. But Atias, the philologist 863, says, that he left only two volumes, the Latino Sermon, and, that the other works ascribed to him, were composed by his disciples, and were not his, although his name is sometimes to be found in them. 8. M. Pompilius Andronicus, a native of Syria, while he professed to be a grammarian, was considered an idle follower of the Epicurean sect, and little qualified to be a master of a school. Finding, Therefore, that, at Rome, not only Antonius Nifo, but even other teachers of less note were preferred to him, he retired to Cumi, where he lived at his ease. And, though he wrote several books, he was so needy, and reduced to such straits, as to be compelled to sell that excellent little work of his, the Index to the Annals, for sixteen thousand sesterces. Orbilius has informed us, that he redeemed this work from the oblivion into which it had fallen, and took care to have it published with the author's name. 9. Orbilius Pupillus, of Beneventum, being left an orphan, by the death of his parents, who both fell a sacrifice to the plots of their enemies on the same day, acted, at first, as a parator to the magistrates. He then joined the troops in Macedonia, when he was first decorated with the plumed helmet 864, and, afterwards, promoted to serve on horseback. Having completed his military service, he resumed his studies, which he had pursued with no small diligence from his youth upwards. And, having been a professor for a long period in his own country, at last, during the consulship of Cicero, made his way to Rome, 
where he taught with more reputation than profit. For in one of his works he says, that, he was then very old, and lived in a garret. He also published a book with the title of Periologos. Containing complaints of the injurious treatment to which professors submitted, without seeking redress at the hands of parents. His sour temper betrayed itself, not only in his disputes with the sophists opposed to him, whom he lashed on every occasion, but also towards his scholars, as Horace tells us, who calls him a flogger. 865 and Domitius Marcus 866, who says of him. See quos orbilius ferula scuticake cessidit. If those orbilius with rod or feral thrashed. And not even men of rank escaped his sarcasms. For, before he became noticed, happening to be examined as a witness in a crowded court, Varro, the advocate on the other side, put the question to him, what he did and by what profession he gained his livelihood. He replied, that he lived by removing hunchbacks from the sunshine into the shade, alluding to Murina's deformity. He lived till he was near a hundred years old. But he had long lost his memory, as the verse of Bibaculus informs us. Orbilius Eubinum est, literarum oblivio. Where is Orbilius now, that wreck of learning lost? His statue is shown in the capital at Beneventum. It stands on the left hand, and is sculptured in marble 867, representing him in a sitting posture, wearing the pallium, with two writing cases in his hand. He left a son, named also Orbilius, who, like his father, was a professor of grammar. X. Atias, the philologist, a freedman, was born at Athens. Of him, Capito Atias 868, the well-known jurisconsult, says that he was a rhetorician among the grammarians, and a grammarian among the rhetoricians. Asinius Pollio 869, in the book in which he finds fault with the writings of Sallust for his great affectation of obsolete words, speaks thus, in this work his chief assistant was a certain Atias, a man of rank, a splendid Latin grammarian. The aider and preceptor of those who studied the practice of declamation. In short, one who claimed for himself the cognomen of Philologus. Writing to Lucius Hermes, he says, that he had made great proficiency in Greek literature, and some in Latin. That he had been a hearer of Antonius Nifo, and his Hermes 870, and afterwards began to teach others. Moreover, that he had for pupils many illustrious youths, among whom were the two brothers, Appius and Pulcher Claudius. And that he even accompanied them to their province. He appears to have assumed the name of Philologus, because, like Eratosthenes 871, who first adopted that cognomen, he was in high repute for his rich and varied stores of learning. Which, indeed, is evident from his commentaries, though but few of them are extant. Another letter, however, to the same Hermes, shews that they were very numerous, remember, it says, to recommend generally our extracts, which we have collected, as you know, of all kinds, into eight hundred books. He afterwards formed an intimate acquaintance with Caius Celestius, and, on his death, with Asinius Pollio. And when they undertook to write a history, he supplied the one with short annals of all Roman affairs, from which he could select at pleasure, and the other, with rules on the art of composition. I am, therefore, surprised that Asinius Pollio should have supposed that he was in the habit of collecting old words and figures of speech for Sallust, when he must have known that his own advice was, that none but well known. And common and appropriate expressions should be made use of. And that, above all things, the obscurity of the style of Sallust, and his bold freedom in translations, should be avoided. 11. Valerius Cato was, as some have informed us, the freedman of one Bersinus, a native of Gaul. He himself tells us, in his little work called Indignatio, that he was born free, and being left an orphan, was exposed to be easily stripped of his patrimony during the license of Scylla's administrations. He had a great number of distinguished pupils, and was highly esteemed as a preceptor suited to those who had a poetical turn, as appears from these short lines. Cato Grammaticus, Latina Siren. Casolus legit ac facet potus. Cato, the Latin siren, grammar taught in verse. To form the poet skilled, and poetry rehearse. Besides his treatise on grammar, 
he composed some poems, of which, his Lydia and Diana, are most admired. Tikaida mentions his, Lydia. Lydia, Doctorum Maxima Cura Liber. Lydia, a work to men of learning dear. Sina 872 thus notices that, Diana. Secula permaniat nostri Diana Catonis. Immortal be Arcado's song of Dien. He lived to extreme old age, but in the lowest state of penury, and almost in actual want, having retired to a small cottage when he gave up his Tusculan villa to his creditors. As by Baculus tells us. Seek his forte me domum Catonis. Depictas minio asulas, et illos. Custodis vidit horchulos priapi. Mirator, cabus au disciplinis. Tantam sit sapientium assecutis. Quam tres colliculi et salibra ferris. Racemi duo, tegula sub una. Ad summum prope nutrient senectum. If, perchance, any one has seen the house of Mycato, with marble slabs of the richest hues, and his gardens worthy of having Priapus 873 for their guardian, he may well wonder by what philosophy he has gained so much wisdom. That a daily allowance of three colworts, half a pound of meal, and two bunches of grapes, under a narrow roof, should serve for his subsistence to extreme old age. And he says in another place. Catoni's motto, Gal, Tusculanum. Tota creditor herb venditahat. Mirati summus unicum magistrum. Summum grammaticum, optimum potam. Omne solvera posse questions. Unum difficile expedire nomen. N. C. O. R. Zenodoti, N. Jacur crate tis. We lately saw, my Gallus, Cato's Tusculan villa exposed to public sale by his creditors. And wondered that such an unrivaled master of the schools, most eminent grammarian, an accomplished poet, could solve all propositions and yet found one question too difficult for him to settle, how to pay his debts. We find in him the genius of Zenodotus 874, the wisdom of Crates 875. 12. Cornelius Epicadius, a freedman of Lucius Cornelius Silla, the dictator, was his apparitor in the augural priesthood, and much beloved by his son Faustus. So that he was proud to call himself the freedman of both. He completed the last book of Silla's commentaries, which his patron had left unfinished. 876. 13. Liberius Hira was bought by his master out of a slave dealer's cage, and obtained his freedom on account of his devotion to learning. It is reported that his disinterestedness was such, that he gave gratuitous instruction to the children of those who were proscribed in the time of Silla. 14. Curtius Nicia was the intimate friend of Gnaeus Pompeius and Caius Memmius. But having carried notes from Memmius to Pompey's wife 877, when she was debauched by Memmius, Pompey was indignant, and forbade him his house. He was also on familiar terms with Marcus Cicero, who thus speaks of him in his epistle to Dolabella 878, I have more need of receiving letters from you, than you have of desiring them from me. For there is nothing going on at Rome in which I think you would take any interest, except, perhaps, that you may like to know that I am appointed umpire between our friends Nicius and Vidius. The one, it appears, alleges in two short verses that Nicius owes him money, the other, like an Aristarchus, cavils at them. I, like an old critic, am to decide whether they are Nicius's or Spurius. Again, in a letter to Atticus 879, he says, as to what you write about Nicias, nothing could give me greater pleasure than to have him with me, if I was in a position to enjoy his society. But my province is to me a place of retirement and solitude. Sicca easily reconciled himself to this state of things, and, therefore, I would prefer having him. Besides, you are well aware of the feebleness, and the nice and luxurious habits, of our friend Nicias. Why should I be the means of making him uncomfortable? when he can afford me no pleasure. At the same time, I value his goodwill. 15. Linnaeus was a freedman of Pompey the Great, and attended him in most of his expeditions. On the death of his patron and his sons, he supported himself by teaching in a school which he opened near the temple of Tellus, in the Carium, in the quarter of the city where the house of the Pompeys stood 880. Such was his regard for his patron's memory, that when Sallust described him as having a brazen face, 
and a shameless mind, he lashed the historian in a most bitter satire 881, as, a bull's pizzle, a gormandizer, a braggart, and a tippler. A man whose life and writings were equally monstrous. Besides charging him with being, a most unskillful plagiarist, who borrowed the language of Cato and other old writers. It is related, that, in his youth, having escaped from slavery by the contrivance of some of his friends, he took refuge in his own country. And, that after he had applied himself to the liberal arts, he brought the price of his freedom to his former master, who, however, struck by his talents and learning, gave him manumission gratuitously. 16. Quintus Cicilius, an epirot by descent, but born at Tusculum, was a freedman of Atticus Satrius, a Roman knight, to whom Cicero addressed his epistles 882. He became the tutor of his patron's daughter 883, who was contracted to Marcus Agrippa, but being suspected of an illicit intercourse with her, and sent away on that account, he betook himself to Cornelius Gallus. And lived with him on terms of the greatest intimacy, which, indeed, was imputed to Gallus as one of his heaviest offences, by Augustus. Then, after the condemnation and death of Gallus 884, he opened a school, but had few pupils, and those very young, nor any belonging to the higher orders, excepting the children of those he could not refuse to admit. He was the first, it is said, who held disputations in Latin, and who began to lecture on Virgil and the other modern poets, which the verse of Domitius Marcus 885 points out. Epirota tenalorum matricula vatum. The Epirot who, with tender care, our unfledged poets nursed. 17. Various Flaccus 886, a freedman, distinguished himself by a new mode of teaching. For it was his practice to exercise the wits of his scholars, by encouraging emulation among them, not only proposing the subjects on which they were to write, but offering rewards for those who were successful in the contest. These consisted of some ancient, handsome, or rare book. Being, in consequence, selected by Augustus, as preceptor to his grandsons, he transferred his entire school to the Palladium, but with the understanding that he should admit no fresh scholars. The hall in Catalan's house, which had then been added to the palace, was assigned him for his school, with a yearly allowance of 100,000 sesterces. He died of old age, in the reign of Tiberius. There is a statue of him at Prenest, in the semicircle at the lower side of the forum, where he had set up calendars arranged by himself, and inscribed on slabs of marble. 18. Lucius Crassitius, a native of Tarentum, and in rank a freedman, had the cognomen of Passides, which he afterwards changed for Pansa. His first employment was connected with the stage, and his business was to assist the writers of farces. After that, he took to giving lessons in a gallery attached to a house, until his commentary on the Smyrna 887 so brought him into notice that the following lines were written on him. Uni Crisitio se credir Smyrna probavit. Desinite indocti, conjugio hank patir. Soli Crisitio se dixit nubera vel. Intima cui soli nota sua extiterant. Crisitius only counts on Smyrna's love. Fruitless the wooings of the unlettered prove. Crisitius she receives with loving arms. For he alone unveiled her hidden charms. However, after having taught many scholars, some of whom were of high rank, and amongst others, Julius Antonius, the triumvir's son, so that he might be even compared with various Flaccus. He suddenly closed his school, and joined the sect of Quintus Septimius, the philosopher. 19. Scribonius Aphrodisius, the slave and disciple of Orbilius, who was afterwards redeemed and presented with his freedom by Scribonia 888, the daughter of Lebo who had been the wife of Augustus, taught in the time of Varius. Whose books on orthography he also revised, not without some severe remarks on his pursuits and conduct. XX C. Julius Hyginus, a freedman of Augustus, was a native of Spain, although some say he was born at Alexandria, and that when that city was taken, Caesar brought him, then a boy, to Rome. He closely and carefully imitated Cornelius Alexander 889, a Greek grammarian, who, for his antiquarian knowledge, was called by many polyhistor, and by some history. He had the charge of the Palatine Library, 
but that did not prevent him from having many scholars. And he was one of the most intimate friends of the poet Ovid, and of Caius Licinius, the historian, a man of consular rank 890, who has related that Hyginus died very poor, and was supported by his liberality as long as he lived. Julius Modestus 891, who was a freedman of Hyginus, followed the footsteps of his patron in his studies and learning. 21. Caius Melissus 892, a native of Spoletum, was freeborn, but having been exposed by his parents in consequence of quarrels between them, he received a good education from his foster father, by whose care and industry he was brought up. And was made a present of to Machinus, as a grammarian. Finding himself valued and treated as a friend, he preferred to continue in his state of servitude, although he was claimed by his mother, choosing rather his present condition than that which his real origin entitled him to. In consequence, his freedom was speedily given him, and he even became a favorite with Augustus. By his appointment he was made curator of the library in the portico of Octavia 893. And, as he himself informs us, undertook to compose, when he was a sexagenarian, his books of witticisms, which are now called the Book of Jests. Of these he accomplished 150, to which he afterwards added several more. He also composed a new kind of story about those who wore the toga, and called it Trabit 894. 22. Marcus Pomponius Marcellus, a very severe critic of the Latin tongue, who sometimes pleaded causes, in a certain address on the plaintiff's behalf, persisted in charging his adversary with making a solecism. Until Cassius Severus appealed to the judges to grant an adjournment until his client should produce another grammarian, as he was not prepared to enter into a controversy respecting a solecism, instead of defending his client's rights. On another occasion, when he had found fault with some expression in a speech made by Tiberius, Atias Capito 895 affirmed, that if it was not Latin, at least it would be so in time to come, Capito is wrong, cried Marcellus. It is certainly in your power, Caesar, to confer the freedom of the city on whom you please, but you cannot make words for us. Asinius Gallus 896 tells us that he was formerly a pugilist, in the following epigram. Ca caput ad lavum deicit, glossimata nobis. Precipit, os nullum, vel podius pugilis. Who ducked his head, to shun another's fist. Though he expound old saws, yet, well I wist. With pummeled nose and face, he's but a pugilist. 23. Remius Polemon 897, of Vicentia 898, the offspring of a bondwoman, acquired the rudiments of learning, first as the companion of a weaver's, and then of his master's, son, at school. Being afterwards made free, he taught at Rome, where he stood highest in the rank of the grammarians. But he was so infamous for every sort of vice, that Tiberius and his successor Claudius publicly denounced him as an improper person to have the education of boys and young men entrusted to him. Still, his powers of narrative and agreeable style of speaking made him very popular, besides which, he had the gift of making extempore verses. He also wrote a great many in various and uncommon meters. His insolence was such, that he called Marcus Varro a hog, and bragged that letters were born and would perish with him. And that, his name was not introduced inadvertently in the Bucolics 899, as Virgil divined that a polemon would some day be the judge of all poets and poems. He also boasted, that having once fallen into the hands of robbers, they spared him on account of the celebrity his name had acquired. He was so luxurious, that he took the bath many times in a day. Nor did his means suffice for his extravagance, although his school brought him in forty thousand sesterces yearly, and he received not much less from his private estate, which he managed with great care. He also kept a broker's shop for the sale of old clothes, and it is well known that a vine 900, he planted himself, yielded 350 bottles of wine. But the greatest of all his vices was his unbridled licentiousness in his commerce with women, which he carried to the utmost pitch of foul indecency 901. They tell a droll story of someone who met him in a crowd, and upon his offering to kiss him, could not escape the salute, Master, said he, do you want to mouth everyone you meet with in a hurry? 24. Marcus Valerius Probus, of Baratus 902, after long aspiring to the rank of centurion, 
being at last tired of waiting, devoted himself to study. He had met with some old authors at a bookseller's shop in the provinces, where the memory of ancient times still lingers, and is not quite forgotten, as it is at Rome. Being anxious carefully to reperuse these, and afterwards to make acquaintance with other works of the same kind, he found himself an object of contempt, and was laughed at for his lectures, instead of their gaining him fame or profit. Still, however, he persisted in his purpose, and employed himself in correcting, illustrating, and adding notes to many works which he had collected, his labours being confined to the province of a grammarian, and nothing more. He had, properly speaking, no scholars, but some few followers. For he never taught in such a way as to maintain the character of a master, but was in the habit of admitting one or two, perhaps at most three or four, disciples in the afternoon. And while he lay at ease and chatted freely on ordinary topics, he occasionally read some book to them, but that did not often happen. He published a few slight treatises on some subtle questions, besides which, he left a large collection of observations on the language of the ancients. Lives of Eminent Rhetoricians I, rhetoric, also, as well as grammar, was not introduced amongst us till a late period, and with still more difficulty, inasmuch as we find that, at times, the practice of it was even prohibited. In order to leave no doubt of this, I will subjoin an ancient decree of the Senate, as well as an edict of the censors, in the consulship of Caius Fannius Strabo, and Marcus Polerius Missala 903, the praetor Marcus Pomponius moved the Senate. That an act be passed respecting philosophers and rhetoricians. In this matter, they have decreed as follows, it shall be lawful for M. Pomponius, the praetor, to take such measures, and make such provisions, as the good of the republic, and the duty of his office, require, that no philosophers or rhetoricians be suffered at Rome. After some interval, the censor Nius Domitius Enobarbus and Lucius Licinius Crassus issued the following edict upon the same subject, it is reported to us that certain persons have instituted a new kind of discipline. That our youth resort to their schools, that they have assumed the title of Latin rhetoricians, and that young men waste their time there for whole days together. Our ancestors have ordained what instruction it is fitting their children should receive, and what schools they should attend. These novelties, contrary to the customs and instructions of our ancestors, we neither approve, nor do they appear to us good. Wherefore it appears to be our duty that we should notify our judgment both to those who keep such schools, and those who are in the practice of frequenting them, that they meet our disapprobation. However, by slow degrees, rhetoric manifested itself to be a useful and honorable study, and many persons devoted themselves to it, both as a means of defense and of acquiring reputation. Cicero declaimed in Greek until his praetorship, but afterwards, as he grew older, in Latin also, and even in the consulship of Hirtius and Pansa 904, whom he calls his great and noble disciples. Some historians state that Gnaeus Pompey resumed the practice of declaiming even during the civil war, in order to be better prepared to argue against Caius Curio, a young man of great talents, to whom the defense of Caesar was entrusted. They say, likewise, that it was not forgotten by Mark Antony, nor by Augustus, even during the War of Medina. Nero also declaimed 905 even after he became emperor, in the first year of his reign, which he had done before in public but twice. Many speeches of orators were also published. In consequence, public favor was so much attracted to the study of rhetoric, that a vast number of professors and learned men devoted themselves to it. And it flourished to such a degree, that some of them raised themselves by it to the rank of senators and the highest offices. But the same mode of teaching was not adopted by all, nor, indeed, did individuals always confine themselves to the same system, but each varied his plan of teaching according to circumstances. For they were accustomed, in stating their argument with the utmost clearness, to use figures and apologies, to put cases, as circumstances required, and to relate facts, sometimes briefly and succinctly, and, at other times, more at large and with greater feeling. Nor did they omit, on occasion, to resort to translations from the Greek, and to expatiate in the praise, or to launch their censures on the faults, of illustrious men. They also dealt with matters connected with everyday life, pointing out such as are useful and necessary, 
and such as are hurtful and needless. They had occasion often to support the authority of fabulous accounts, and to detract from that of historical narratives, which sort the Greeks call propositions, refutations, and corroboration. Until by a gradual process they have exhausted these topics, and arrive at the gist of the argument. Among the ancients, subjects of controversy were drawn either from history, as indeed some are even now, or from actual facts, of recent occurrence. It was, therefore, the custom to state them precisely, with details of the names of places. We certainly so find them collected and published, and it may be well to give one or two of them literally, by way of example. A company of young men from the city, having made an excursion to Ostia in the summer season, and going down to the beach, fell in with some fishermen who were casting their nets in the sea. Having bargained with them for the haul, whatever it might turn out to be, for a certain sum, they paid down the money. They waited a long time while the nets were being drawn, and when at last they were dragged on shore, there was no fish in them, but some gold sewn up in a basket. The buyers claim the haul as theirs, the fishermen assert that it belongs to them. Again, some dealers having to land from a ship at Brundusium a cargo of slaves, among which there was a handsome boy of great value, they, in order to deceive the collectors of the customs, smuggled him ashore in the dress of a freeborn youth. With the Bulum 906 hung about his neck. The fraud easily escaped detection. They proceed to Rome, the affair becomes the subject of judicial inquiry, it is alleged that the boy was entitled to his freedom, because his master had voluntarily treated him as free. Formerly, they called these by a Greek term, syntaxius, but of late, controversies, but they may be either fictitious cases, or those which come under trial in the courts. Of the eminent professors of this science, of whom any memorials are extant, it would not be easy to find many others than those of whom I shall now proceed to give an account. 2. Lucius Plotius Gallus. Of him Marcus Tullius Cicero thus writes to Marcus Titinius 907, I remember well that when we were boys, one Lucius Plotius first began to teach Latin. And as great numbers flocked to his school, so that all who were most devoted to study were eager to take lessons from him, it was a great trouble to me that I too was not allowed to do so. I was prevented, however, by the decided opinion of men of the greatest learning, who considered that it was best to cultivate the genius by the study of Greek. This same Gallus, for he lived to a great age, was pointed at by M. Celius, in a speech which he was forced to make in his own cause, as having supplied his accuser, Atrocinus 908, with materials for his charge. Suppressing his name, he says that such a rhetorician was like barley bread 909 compared to a wheaten loaf, windy, chaffy, and coarse. 3. Lucius Octacilius Pilatus is said to have been a slave, and, according to the old custom, chained to the door like a watch, dog 910. Until, having been presented with his freedom for his genius and devotion to learning, he drew up for his patron the act of accusation in a cause he was prosecuting. After that, becoming a professor of rhetoric, he gave instructions to Gnaeus Pompey the Great, and composed an account of his actions, as well as of those of his father, being the first freedman, according to the opinion of Cornelius Nepos 911, who ventured to write history, which before his time had not been done by anyone who was not of the highest ranks in society. For, about this time, Epidius 912 having fallen into disgrace for bringing a false accusation, opened a school of instruction, in which he taught, among others, Mark Antony and Augustus. On one occasion Caius Canusius jeered them for presuming to belong to the party of the consul Isauricus 913 in his administration of the Republic. Upon which he replied, that he would rather be the disciple of Isauricus, than of Epidius, the false accuser. This Epidius claimed to be descended from Epidius Nuncio, who, as ancient traditions assert, fell into the fountain of the river Sarnus 914 when the streams were overflown, and not being afterwards found, was reckoned among the number of the gods. V. Sextus Clodius, a native of Sicily, a professor both of Greek and Latin eloquence, had bad eyes and a facetious tongue. It was a saying of his, that he lost a pair of eyes from his intimacy with Mark Antony, the Triumvir 915. Of his wife, Fulvia, when there was a swelling in one of her cheeks, 
he said that, she tempted the point of his style, 916 nor did Antony think any the worse of him for the joke, but quite enjoyed it. And soon afterwards, when Antony was consul 917, he even made him a large grant of land, which Cicero charges him with in his Philippics 918. You patronize, he said, a master of the schools for the sake of his buffoonery, and make a rhetorician one of your pot companions, allowing him to cut his jokes on any one he pleased. A witty man, no doubt, but it was an easy matter to say smart things of such as you and your companions. But listen, conscript fathers, while I tell you what reward was given to this rhetorician, and let the wounds of the Republic be laid bare to view. You assigned two thousand acres of the Leontine territory 919 to Sextus Clodius, the rhetorician, and not content with that, exonerated the estate from all taxes. Hear this, and learn from the extravagance of the grant, how little wisdom is displayed in your acts. 6. Caius Albucius Silas, of Nevera 920, while, in the execution of the office of Edile in his native place, he was sitting for the administration of justice was dragged by the feet from the tribunal by some persons against whom he was pronouncing a decree. In great indignation at this usage, he made straight for the gate of the town, and proceeded to Rome. There he was admitted to fellowship, and lodged, with Plancus the Orator 921, whose practice it was, before he made a speech in public, to set up someone to take the contrary side in the argument. The office was undertaken by Albucius with such success, that he silenced Plancus, who did not venture to put himself in competition with him. This bringing him into notice, he collected an audience of his own, and it was his custom to open the question proposed for debate, sitting, but as he warmed with the subject, he stood up, and made his peroration in that posture. His declamations were of different kinds, sometimes brilliant and polished, at others, that they might not be thought to savor too much of the schools, he curtailed them of all ornament, and used only familiar phrases. He also pleaded causes, but rarely, being employed in such as were of the highest importance, and in every case undertaking the peroration only. In the end, he gave up practicing in the forum, partly from shame, partly from fear. For, in a certain trial before the court of the 10922, having lashed the defendant as a man void of natural affection for his parents, he called upon him by a bold figure of speech to swear by the ashes of his father and mother which lay unburied. His adversary taking him up for the suggestion, and the judges frowning upon it, he lost his cause, and was much blamed. At another time, on a trial for murder at Milan, before Lucius Piso, the proconsul, having to defend the culprit, he worked himself up to such a pitch of vehemence, that in a crowded court, who loudly applauded him. Notwithstanding all the efforts of the lictor to maintain order, he broke out into a lamentation on the miserable state of Italy 923, then in danger of being again reduced, he said, into the form of a province. And turning to the statue of Marcus Brutus, which stood in the forum, he invoked him as, the founder and vindicator of the liberties of the people. For this he narrowly escaped a prosecution. Suffering, at an advanced period of life, from an ulcerated tumor, he returned to Nevera, and calling the people together in a public assembly, addressed them in a set speech, of considerable length. Explaining the reasons which induced him to put an end to existence, and this he did by abstaining from food. End of the Lives of Grammarians and Rhetoricians Lives of the Poets The Life of Terence Publius Terentius Afer, a native of Carthage, was a slave, at Rome, of the senator Terentius Lucanus, struck by his abilities and handsome person, gave him not only a liberal education in his youth, but his freedom when he arrived at years of maturity. Some say that he was a captive taken in war, but this, as Fenestella 924 informs us, could by no means have been the case. Since both his birth and death took place in the interval between the termination of the Second Punic War and the commencement of the Third 925, nor, even supposing that he had been taken prisoner by the Numidian or Gatulian tribes, could he have fallen into the hands of a Roman general. As there was no commercial intercourse between the Italians and Africans until after the fall of Carthage 926, Terence lived in great familiarity with many persons of high station, and especially with Scipio Africanus, 
and Caius Delius, whose favor he is even supposed to have purchased by the foulest means. But Fenestella reverses the charge, contending that Terence was older than either of them. Cornelius Nepos, however, informs us that they were all of nearly equal age. And Portia's intimates a suspicion of this criminal commerce in the following passage. While Terence plays the wanton with the great, and recommends himself to them by the meretricious ornaments of his person. While, with greedy ears, he drinks in the divine melody of Africanus's voice, while he thinks of being a constant guest at the table of Furius, and the handsome Laelius. While he thinks that he is fondly loved by them, and often invited to Albanum for his youthful beauty, he finds himself stripped of his property, and reduced to the lowest state of indigence. Then, withdrawing from the world, he betook himself to Greece, where he met his end, dying at Strymphalos, a town in Arcadia. What availed him the friendship of Scipio, of Laelius, or of Furius, three of the most affluent nobles of that age? They did not even minister to his necessities so much as to provide him a hired house, to which his slave might return with the intelligence of his master's death. He wrote comedies, the earliest of which, the Andrea, having to be performed at the public spectacles given by the Aediles 927, he was commanded to read it first before Cecilius 928. Having been introduced while Cecilius was at supper, and being meanly dressed, he is reported to have read the beginning of the play seated on a low stool near the great man's couch. But after reciting a few verses, he was invited to take his place at table, and, having supped with his host, went through the rest to his great delight. This play and five others were received by the public with similar applause, although Volcatius, in his enumeration of them, says that, the Hesira 929 must not be reckoned among these. The eunuch was even acted twice the same day 930, and earned more money than any comedy, whoever was the writer, had ever done before, namely, 8,000 sesterces 931, besides which, a certain sum accrued to the author for the title. But Vero prefers the opening of the Adelphi 932 to that of Menander. It is very commonly reported that Terence was assisted in his works by Laelius and Scipio 933, with whom he lived in such great intimacy. He gave some currency to this report himself, nor did he ever attempt to defend himself against it, except in a light way, as in the prologue to the Adelphi. Nam quat isti dicunt malevoli, homines no hiles. Hunc agiter, acid una scribery. Quat illi maledictin vehemens existiment. Im laudem hic ducit maximum, cum illis placet. Cavobus universus edi populo placent. Quorum opera in bello, in ocio, in negotio. Sua quisc tempore usus est sine superbia. For this. Which malice tells that certain noble persons. Assist the bard, and write in concert with him. That which they deem a heavy slander, he. Esteems his greatest praise, that he can please. Those who in war, in peace, as counselors have rendered you the dearest services, and ever borne their faculties so meekly. Coleman. He appears to have protested against this imputation with less earnestness, because the notion was far from being disagreeable to Laelius and Scipio. It therefore gained ground, and prevailed in aftertimes. Quintus Memmius, in his speech in his own defense, says, Publius Africanus, who borrowed from Terence a character which he had acted in private, brought it on the stage in his name. Nepos tells us he found in some book that c. Laelius, when he was on some occasion at Putili, on the Calends, the 1st, of March, 934 being requested by his wife to rise early, begged her not to suffer him to be disturbed, as he had gone to bed late. Having been engaged in writing with more than usual success. On her asking him to tell her what he had been writing, he repeated the verses which are found in the Huden Timuruminos. Satis pol protervmi siri promessa, Hutton. 4, 4. 1. I faith. The rogue Cyrus's impudent pretenses. Santra 935 is of opinion that if Terence required any assistance in his compositions 936, he would not have had recourse to Scipio and Laelius, who were then very young men, but rather to Sulpicius Gallus 937. An accomplished scholar, who had been the first to introduce his plays at the games given by the consuls. 
or to Q, Fabius Labio, or Marcus Papilius 938, both men of consular rank, as well as poets. It was for this reason that, in alluding to the assistance he had received, he did not speak of his coadjutors as very young men, but as persons of whose services the people had full experience in peace, in war, and in the administration of affairs. After he had given his comedies to the world, at a time when he had not passed his thirty-fifth year, in order to avoid suspicion, as he found others publishing their works under his name, or else to make himself acquainted with the modes of life and habits of the Greeks, for the purpose of exhibiting them in his plays, he withdrew from home, to which he never returned. Volcatius gives this account of his death. Said uta for se populo dedit comedias. Iter hic in asium facit. Navum cum semel. Consended, vices nunquam est sic vita vacat. When Afer had produced six plays for the entertainment of the people, he embarked for Asia, but from the time he went on board ship, he was never seen again. Thus he ended his life. Q. Consentious reports that he perished at sea on his voyage back from Greece, and that 108 plays, of which he had made a version from Menander 939, were lost with him. Others say that he died at Stymphalos, in Arcadia, or in Leucadia, during the consulship of C.N. Cornelius Dolabella and Marcus Fulvius Nobilier 940, worn out with a severe illness, and with grief and regret for the loss of his baggage, which he had sent forward in a ship that was wrecked, and contained the last new plays he had written. In person, Terence is reported to have been rather short and slender, with a dark complexion. He had an only daughter, who was afterwards married to a Roman knight. And he left also twenty acres of garden ground 941, on the Appian Way, at the Villa of Mars. I, therefore, wonder the more how Porcius could have written the verses. Nihil Publius. Scipio Profute, Nihil Etilalius, Nihil Furius. Trace per idem tempus ca agitabent nobiles facilime. Eurum mile opera any domum cadem habuit conductitium. Saltem uts et, quo referret obitum domini servulus.942. Afranius places him at the head of all the comic writers, declaring, in his Compitalia. Terentio non similem dices quempium. Terence's equal cannot soon be found. On the other hand, Volcatius reckons him inferior not only to Naevius, Plautus, and Cicilius, but also to Licinius. Cicero pays him this high compliment, in his limo. Tu quoque, casolus lecto sermon, Terenti. Conversum expressum latina voci menandrum. In medio populi sedatus vasibus offers. Quid quid cum locans, ac omnia dulcia dicens. You, only, Terence, translated into Latin, and clothed in choice language the plays of Menander, and brought them before the public, who, in crowded audiences, hung upon hushed applause. Grace marked each line, and every period charmed. So also Caius Caesar. Tu quoque tu in sum is, O demidiate Menander. Ponerus, eti marido, pori sermonis amadier. Lenibus et Udinum scriptus adjuncta for a vis. Comica, ut equato virtus polaret honore. Cum grisis. Nec in hoc despectus part jacers. Unum hoc maceror, id dolio tibi ds, Terenti. You, too, who divide your honours with Menander, will take your place among poets of the highest order, and justly too, such is the purity of your style. Would only that to your graceful diction was added more comic force, that your works might equal in merit the Greek masterpieces, and your inferiority in this particular should not expose you to censure. This is my only regret. In this, Terence, I grieve to say you are wanting. The Life of Juvenal D. Junius Juvenalis, who was either the son 943 of a wealthy freedman, or brought up by him, it is not known which, declaimed till the middle of life 944, more from the bent of his inclination. Than from any desire to prepare himself either for the schools or the forum. But having composed a short satire 945, which was clever enough, on Paris 946, the actor of pantomimes, and also on the poet of Claudius Nero, 
who was puffed up by having held some inferior military rank for six months only. He afterwards devoted himself with much zeal to that style of writing. For a while indeed, he had not the courage to read them even to a small circle of auditors, but it was not long before he recited his satires to crowded audiences, and with entire success. And this he did twice or thrice, inserting new lines among those which he had originally composed. Quat non dant proceres, dabit his trio, two camerinos. Eti berias, two nobilium magna atria curas. Prefectos pelopia facet, philomela tribunos. Behold an actor's patronage affords. A surer means of rising than a lord's. And wilt thou still the Camerino S947 court? Or to the halls of Beria's resort? When tribunes Pelopia can create. And Philomela prefects, who shall rule the state? 948. At that time the player was in high favor at court, and many of those who fawned upon him were daily raised to posts of honor. Juvenal therefore incurred the suspicion of having covertly satirized occurrences which were then passing, and, although eighty years old at that time 949, he was immediately removed from the city. Being sent into honorable banishment as prefect of a cohort, which was under orders to proceed to a station at the extreme frontier of Egypt 950. That sort of punishment was selected, as it appeared severe enough for an offense which was venial, and a mere piece of drollery. However, he died very soon afterwards, worn down by grief, and weary of his life. The Life of Perseus. Aulus Perseus Flaccus was born the day before the Nones of December, December 4, 951, in the consulship of Fabius Persicus and L. Vitellius. He died on the 8th of the Calends of December, November 24, 952 in the consulship of Rubrius Marius and Asinius Gallus. Though born at Volterra, in Etruria, he was a Roman knight, allied both by blood and marriage to persons of the highest rank 953. He ended his days at an estate he had at the eighth milestone on the Appian Way. His father, Flaccus, who died when he was barely six years old, left him under the care of guardians, and his mother, Fulvia Silena, who afterwards married Fusius, a Roman knight, buried him also in a very few years. Perseus Flaccus pursued his studies at Volterra till he was twelve years old, and then continued them at Rome, under Remius Polemon, the grammarian, and Virginius Flaccus, the rhetorician. Arriving at the age of twenty-one, he formed a friendship with Aeneas Cornutus 954, which lasted through life, and from him he learned the rudiments of philosophy. Among his earliest friends were Cesius Bassus 955, and Calpurnius Statura the latter of whom died while Perseus himself was yet in his youth. Servilius Numinus 956, he reverenced as a father. Through Cornutus he was introduced to Aeneas, as well as to Lucan, who was of his own age, and also a disciple of Cornutus. At that time Cornutus was a tragic writer, he belonged to the sect of the Stoics, and left behind him some philosophical works. Lucan was so delighted with the writings of Perseus Flaccus, that he could scarcely refrain from giving loud tokens of applause while the author was reciting them, and declared that they had the true spirit of poetry. It was late before Perseus made the acquaintance of Seneca, and then he was not much struck with his natural endowments. At the house of Cornutus he enjoyed the society of two very learned and excellent men, who were then zealously devoting themselves to philosophical inquiries, namely, Claudius Agaternus, a physician from Lacedaemon, and Petronius Aristocrates. Of Magnesia, men whom he held in the highest esteem, and with whom he vied in their studies, as they were of his own age, being younger than Cornutus. During nearly the last ten years of his life he was much beloved by Thrasias, so that he sometimes travelled abroad in his company, and his cousin Aria was married to him. Perseus was remarkable for gentle manners, for a modesty amounting to bashfulness, a handsome form, and an attachment to his mother, sister, and aunt, which was most exemplary. He was frugal and chaste. He left his mother and sister twenty thousand sesterces, requesting his mother, in a written codicil, to present to Cornutus, as some say, one hundred sesterces, or as others, twenty pounds of wrought silver 957, besides about seven hundred books. Which, indeed, included his whole library. 
Cornutus, however, would only take the books, and gave up the legacy to the sisters, whom his brother had constituted his heirs. He wrote 958 seldom, and not very fast, even the work we possess he left incomplete. Some verses are wanting at the end of the book 959, but Cornutus thoughtlessly recited it, as if it was finished, and on Cesius Bassus requesting to be allowed to publish it, he delivered it to him for that purpose. In his younger days, Perseus had written a play, as well as an itinerary, with several copies of verses on Thracia's father-in-law, and Aria's 960 mother, who had made away with herself before her husband. But Cornutus used his whole influence with the mother of Perseus to prevail upon her to destroy these compositions. As soon as his book of satires was published, all the world began to admire it, and were eager to buy it up. He died of a disease in the stomach, in the thirtieth year of his age 961. But no sooner had he left school and his masters, than he set to work with great vehemence to compose satires, from having read the tenth book of Lucilius. And made the beginning of that book his model, presently launching his invectives all around with so little scruple, that he did not spare contemporary poets and orators, and even lashed Nero himself, who was then the reigning prince. The verse ran as follows. Auricula's Asini Mita Rex Habit. King Midas has an ass's ears. But Cornutus altered it thus. Auricula's Asini Kas non hahe. Who has not an ass's ears? In order that it might not be supposed that it was meant to apply to Nero. The Life of Horace. Horatius Flaccus was a native of Venusium 962, his father having been, by his own account 963, a freedman and collector of taxes, but, as it is generally believed, a dealer in salted provisions. For someone with whom Horace had a quarrel, jeered him, by saying, How often have I seen your father wiping his nose with his fist? In the Battle of Philippi, he served as a military tribune 964, which post he filled at the instance of Marcus Brutus 965, the general, and having obtained a pardon, on the overthrow of his party, he purchased the office of scribe to a quester. Afterwards insinuating himself first, into the good graces of Macenus, and then of Augustus, he secured no small share in the regard of both. And first, how much Macenus loved him may be seen by the epigram in which he says. Nit viscerabus mice, horati. Plus jam diligo, tidium sodalum. Gino tu vidius strigosiorem. 966. But it was more strongly exhibited by Augustus, in a short sentence uttered in his last moments, Be as mindful of Horatius Flaccus as you are of me. Augustus offered to appoint him his secretary, signifying his wishes to Macenas in a letter to the following effect, Hitherto I have been able to write my own epistles to friends, but now I am too much occupied, and in an infirm state of health. I wish, therefore, to deprive you of our Horace, let him leave, therefore, your luxurious table and come to the palace, and he shall assist me in writing my letters. And upon his refusing to accept the office, he neither exhibited the smallest displeasure, nor ceased to heap upon him tokens of his regard. Letters of his are extant, from which I will make some short extracts to establish this, use your influence over me with the same freedom as you would do if we were living together as friends. In so doing you will be perfectly right, and guilty of no impropriety, for I could wish that our intercourse should be on that footing, if your health admitted of it. And again, how I hold you in memory you may learn from our friend Septimius 967, for I happened to mention you when he was present. And if you are so proud as to scorn my friendship, that is no reason why I should lightly esteem yours, in return. Besides this, among other drolleries, he often called him, his most immaculate penis, and, his charming little man, and loaded him from time to time with proofs of his munificence. He admired his works so much, and was so convinced of their enduring fame, that he directed him to compose the secular poem, as well as that on the victory of his stepsons Tiberius and Drusus over the Vindelici 968. And for this purpose urged him to add, after a long interval, a fourth book of odes to the former three. After reading his sermons, in which he found no mention of himself, he complained in these terms, You must know that I am very angry with you, because in most of your works of this description you do not choose to address yourself to me. 
Are you afraid that, in times to come, your reputation will suffer, in case it should appear that you lived on terms of intimate friendship with me? And he wrung from him the eulogy which begins with. Cum tot sistinius, edi tanta negotia solus. Residential atalas armis tutoris moribus orns. Legibus amens, in publica commoda peccum. Si longo sermon moror tua tempora, Caesar. Epist 2. I. While you alone sustain the important weight of Rome's affairs, so various and so great, while you the public wheel with arms defend, adorn with morals, and with laws amend, shall not the tedious letter prove a crime that steals one moment of our Caesar's time. Francis. In person, Horace was short and fat, as he is described by himself in his Satires 969, and by Augustus in the following letter, Dionysius has brought me your small volume, which, little as it is, not to blame you for that, I shall judge favorably. You seem to me, however, to be afraid lest your volume should be bigger than yourself. But if you are short in stature, you are corpulent enough. You may, therefore, if you will, write in a quart, when the size of your volume is as large round as your paunch. It is reported that he was immoderately addicted to veneery. For he is said to have had obscene pictures so disposed in a bedchamber lined with mirrors, that, whichever way he looked, lascivious images might present themselves to his view. 970 He lived for the most part in the retirement of his farm 971, on the confines of the Sabine and Tibertine territories, and his house is shown in the neighborhood of a little wood not far from Tiber. Some elegies ascribed to him, and a prose epistle apparently written to commend himself to Machinas, have been handed down to us, but I believe that neither of them are genuine works of his. For the elegies are commonplace, and the epistle is wanting in perspicuity, a fault which cannot be imputed to his style. He was born on the 6th of the Ides of December, December 27th, in the consulship of Lucius Cotta 972 and Lucius Torquatus. And died on the 5th of the Calends of December, November 27th, in the consulship of Caius Martius Censorinus and Caius Asinius Gallus 973, having completed his 59th year. He made a nuncupatory will, declaring Augustus his heir, not being able, from the violence of his disorder, to sign one in due form. He was interred and lies buried on the skirts of the Esquiline Hill, near the tomb of Machinus.974. M. Aeneas Lucanus, a native of Corduba 975, first tried the powers of his genius in an encomium on Nero, at the Quinquennial Games. He afterwards recited his poem on the civil war carried on between Pompey and Caesar. His vanity was so immense, and he gave such liberty to his tongue, that in some preface, comparing his age and his first efforts with those of Virgil, he had the assurance to say, and what now remains for me is to deal with a gnat. In his early youth, after being long informed of the sort of life his father led in the country, in consequence of an unhappy marriage 976, he was recalled from Athens by Nero, who admitted him into the circle of his friends. And even gave him the honor of the questorship. But he did not long remain in favor. Smarting at this, and having publicly stated that Nero had withdrawn, all of a sudden, without communicating with the Senate, and without any other motive than his own recreation. After this he did not cease to assail the emperor both with foul words and with acts which are still notorious. So that on one occasion, when easing his bowels in the common privy, there being a louder explosion than usual, he gave vent to the nemestic of Nero, one would suppose it was thundering underground. In the hearing of those who were sitting there for the same purpose, and who took to their heels in much consternation 977. In a poem also, which was in every one's hands, he severely lashed both the emperor and his most powerful adherents. At length, he became nearly the most active leader in Piso's Conspiracy 978. And while he dwelt without reserve in many quarters on the glory of those who dipped their hands in the blood of tyrants, he launched out into open threats of violence. And carried them so far as to boast that he would cast the emperor's head at the feet of his neighbors. When, however, the plot was discovered, he did not exhibit any firmness of mind. A confession was wrung from him without much difficulty. And, humbling himself to the most abject entreaties, 
he even named his innocent mother as one of the conspirators 979, hoping that his want of natural affection would give him favor in the eyes of a parasitical prince. Having obtained permission to choose his mode of death 980, he wrote notes to his father, containing corrections of some of his verses, and, having made a full meal, allowed a physician to open the veins in his arm 981. I have also heard it said that his poems were offered for sale, and commented upon, not only with care and diligence, but also in a trifling way. 982. The Life of Pliny Although this brief memoir of Pliny is inserted in all the editions of Suetonius, it was unquestionably not written by him. The author, whoever he was, has confounded the two Plinys, the uncle and nephew, into which error Suetonius could not have fallen, as he lived on intimate terms with the younger Pliny. Nor can it be supposed that he would have composed the memoir of his illustrious friend in so cursory a manner. Scaliger and other learned men consider that the life of Pliny, attributed to Suetonius, was composed more than four centuries after that historian's death. Plinius Secundus, a native of New Como 983, having served in the wars with strict attention to his duties, in the rank of a knight, distinguished himself, also. By the great integrity with which he administered the high functions of procurator for a long period in the several provinces entrusted to his charge. But still he devoted so much attention to literary pursuits, that it would not have been an easy matter for a person who enjoyed entire leisure to have written more than he did. He comprised, in twenty volumes, an account of all the various wars carried on in successive periods with the German tribes. Besides this, he wrote a natural history, which extended to seven books. He fell a victim to the calamitous event which occurred in Campania. For, having the command of the fleet at Misenum, when Vesuvius was throwing up a fiery eruption, he put to sea with his galleys for the purpose of exploring the causes of the phenomenon close on the spot 984. But being prevented by contrary winds from sailing back, he was suffocated in the dense cloud of dust and ashes. Some, however, think that he was killed by his slave, having implored him to put an end to his sufferings, when he was reduced to the last extremity by the fervent heat. 985. The End of Lives of the Poets.